Alfriston and Wilmington, Chapter Six of Field Paths and Green Lanes by Louis J. Jennings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alfriston and Wilmington. Echoes of War. The Nightingale. Happy England. The South Downs. Alfriston and the Star Inn. Another Restoration. An Ancient Vicarage. Content in a Cottage. Wanted a Minister. The Lone Man of Wilmington. The Priory and Church. An Old Grave and a New Tenant. A line from the Short and Simple Annals of the Poor. The South Downs beyond Wilmington where to find cowslips rumours of war had reached this quiet corner of the south downs when i was there on the last day of april i was watching a nightingale the first of the year which had just flown across the road and was perched on a hedge within a few yards of me presently it began to pour forth its wondrous song and although it did not finish it perhaps because it fancied it was a little too early in the season, yet the fragment with which it was pleased to favour its two listeners, namely a poor hedge-cutter and myself, fairly put to shame the thrushes and blackbirds which had been trying hard to sing each other down. While I was still waiting in the hope of hearing the rest, the hedge-cutter said, "'Excuse me asking you, sir, but can you tell me whether there is war?' "'There is.' between turkey and russia but are we in it not yet ah sir they will never come here england is safe and if they did come i reckon they would soon be glad to get away again we are too much for them all that was how the great eastern question presented itself to his mind confidence is an excellent thing especially when it is not pushed too far i see you a listening to the nightingale said the hedge cutter it be a good bird for singing like i heard one for the first time three days ago as you go up the road maybe you'll hear two or three with or without nightingales one might well be glad at any time to walk a few miles on such a road as this i had started from berwick station and turned my face straight towards the south downs that beautiful ridge of hills which to the eye of gilbert white seemed a majestic chain of mountains and which in good earnest appear much higher than they really are when you are upon them so vast is the sweep of the view they afford over land and sea beneath these noble hills there are still villages to be found which are almost as they were three or four hundred years ago and towards one of them i was bending my steps to Alfriston the Alariston of Doomsday Book, a parish in which there are more British and Roman barrows to be seen today than new houses. At every stage of the road there are abundant signs that you are travelling in an old country. The farmhouses and barns have never known the hand of the modern builder. And when, about two and a half miles from the station, you come to the village and see the ancient uphill street with the long sloping roofs of the houses, and the remains of the market cross which may have stood there five hundred years or more it is difficult to realize that one is living in commercial england in the midst of a driving and pushing age about half way up the street there is an inn which will gladden the heart of any man who takes an interest in the traces which are still allowed to exist of the old times in england this inn is called the star and it must have been standing here at least three hundred and fifty years with no great change inside or out at each side of the door and along the front of the house there are carved figures one of st julian the friend of travellers another of a priest a st george waging a gallant fight with the dragon two animals supporting a staff and other figures or devices which are more delightful to look upon than all the pictures in the royal academy put together 
at one corner of the house there is a rude figure of a lion leaning against the wall but this is only the figurehead of a vessel which was wrecked on the coast some time last century all the rest is old from the roof which is half sunken in with age to the bow windows with their small panes of glass and the narrow doorway guarded by st julian and as some suppose st giles Alfriston is believed to have been formerly a much larger place than it now is and mr lower thinks that the star inn was a house of call for pilgrims and the clergy who were wending their way to the tomb of st richard and the episcopal see so the house had a somewhat religious character and ornaments were adopted which appear at first sight rather incongruous with the objects of a roadside inn however this may be the figures are well worthy the notice of the modern pilgrim who will find few such ancient hostelries as this left in merry england although he will come in the way of plenty of abominable gin palaces and flaring bar-rooms while seated in the little parlour of the star at an enormous distance as it seemed from the world of the present day railroads telegraphs newspapers being all like some dim recollection of a disturbed dream i noticed a circular upon the wall with an engraving of the old church above it in this i read with great sinking of the heart that progress to a most alarming extent had been made with the work of restoring the church that wooden seats had been put in cut from the old large timbers of the south transept interior roof a new east window made and the chancel windows repaired this was sad news and when after diligent search i found the old woman who had the keys and we entered the church my worst anticipations were confirmed three parts of the edifice had been made to look spick and span new the other part remains in its old state simply because the funds have been exhausted the famous east window is new it all looks like a lecture hall just finished would it not have answered every good purpose to have mended the roof so as to keep out the wet and repair rather than restore the other parts of the building we like the old church best sir said the woman who was wheezing away dismally this don't seem to us as if it were the same church like see yonder is the old house where they say the vicars used to live i would come and show you but my chest gives out gives out a true americanism if there ever was one the old house at least was uninjured a simple timbered cottage or as one may read an ancient vicarage of post and panel a specimen of the lowly abodes with which our pre-reformation clergy often contented themselves as i stood looking at this house and thinking that old as it was i would rather have it than many a new one i had seen an old woman came to the door and i wished her good morning presently she asked me if i would please to step in and sit down it was a low-ceilinged room that parlour of hers with an immense fireplace in it in which she had got her armchair and footstool and other little comforts we ha no minister here now said she after we had talked a bit and of course we miss un a good deal i wish we had e'er a one to come and sit and read a little to a body three have died here the last few years how do you manage to kill them off so fast i asked oh said the old lady very seriously it ain't us as kills em off they are worn out when they do come that's the reason of it sir the last one as was here was a nice old gentleman but his breath was bad and so he could not get about much we want a young man if so be as we could get one and i should not care how poor he was the church warden told me she went on this very morning that he was going to write to the lord chancery or something and try to get us a minister and i hope he will for it is bad to be without one a gentleman comes over from eastbourne but i can't understand what he do say perhaps it is because i am old how old are you 
I am seventy-seven, sir. And live here all alone? Oh, yes. I have only two children myself, but how many they have I really do not know. I have the rheumatism very bad, all down my side. No, sir, it is not this old house as gives it to me, and I could not bear to leave it now. I have lived in it a many years. I want for nothing, sir, for God is good to me. And so this is the house where the minister used to live in old times. Yes, sir, I have heard say that the popes of Rome did used to live here. What on earth could have put that notion in the old lady's head? It fairly took my breath away. I do wish, sir, she continued, that we could get a minister here, but no one seems to want to come. The place be too poor, I suppose. Oh, no, sir, I am not afraid to live here alone. God is good to me, sir, and I am very thankful. She repeated these words very earnestly. No doubt there are some who would have gone into that room and looked round and seen very little for anybody to be thankful for but it is not always those who have all the good things of this life who are the most grateful for what they get i am very glad you are comfortable said i as i turned to go away from what i can see in this world those who believe as you do seldom come to much harm they do not sir for if you trust in god he never deserts you sir no never the landscape was rather blurred to my eyes when i left that little room no doubt some profound philosopher who has discovered all the secrets of the universe could explain to this poor old woman that she was the victim of an exploded delusion and that in fact there is no god but matter and therefore nothing for any human being to trust in he might also propose to her several infallible tests prayer tests and the like by which she could ascertain for herself that matter was the be-all and the end-all but what if she took the test of her own daily experience and life and found that conclusive no doubt the philosopher would have to give her up as beyond the reach of reason one of those besotted lower classes for whom nothing can be done through the meadow at the side of the church and across the little bridge over the river cookmere a river about as wide as a lady's ribbon there is a footpath to wilmington under the very shadow of the downs or the visitor may turn to the downs at once and mount to furl's beacon and make his way over the top to lewis a distance of nine miles or so or he may go over the hills in the opposite direction to eastbourne but i went towards wilmington after a glance over the training stables which are at Alfriston, across that ancient street known as milton street where there are two or three of the oldest and quaintest cottages and barns in all sussex a stranger does not often find his way into this solitary yet beautiful region wandering on over the path which looks like a thread amid a vast field of young green wheat one's eye is caught by a colossal figure of a man on the side of the downs close by the father of giants with each hand closing on a huge staff a strange wild figure upwards of two hundred and forty feet in length how came it there it is thought that the monks of wilmington cut it in the chalk in the days when a priory existed here a priory which was founded in the reign of william rufus but the country folk hold that the fairies made it for the fairies are still believed to have their homes in these downs and many a large ring or hag track may be seen in lonely spots and strange figures cut out on the grass i have often stood before them wondering how they were made and who made them no one knows but certain it is that anybody who rambles about these lovely downs will see many strange things and hear strange sounds a wonderful old place is wilmington or winnelton as it was called before the normans came over here in the days when it was held by the great earl godwin king harold's father a village with part of its old priory gate still standing 
and a farmhouse made out of the monk's former home and a church so old that one gives up trying to find out the exact date of it it is primitive enough in construction for some of the windows and doors are cut out of the chalk on the west wall outside i saw a grotesque figure with its knees doubled up nearly to its chin carved in stone and inside there was a finely carved pulpit with a beautiful canopy over it and chalk walls and arches and ancient seats altogether one of the plainest oldest and least improved churches in england in the churchyard there is an enormous yew tree of great height for a yew as well as girth a tree said to be at least a thousand years old its companions are the dead and how many must have come to it since first it struck its roots in this soil as i walked into the churchyard from the fields i saw a white head appearing every now and then from an open grave and heard the dull thud of earth falling as it was thrown up by the spade it was the sexton digging a grave just beyond him was that solemn yew now about to be joined by still another companion and the venerable church and the solitary ruins and the weird figure on the hillside seeming to be watching all aid aid scarcely any name but this old sussex one of aid on the gravestones a large family and death has reaped them nearly all i wandered over to the open grave all was silent in this ancient and lonely churchyard save the beating of the mattock and the dull fall of the earth the sexton like all else around was old his hair was white and he had a white beard he worked very slowly and as he worked he threw human bones into the hill which was fast rising outside the grave it did not seem a real scene in any way i should not hope to persuade anybody that all was as i saw it there that day yet there was the old man in the grave and those were bones the bones of some man or woman which he was throwing up in every spadeful of earth there was a thigh bone and the smaller bones of the leg and many more and the earth near them had a tinge of brown like iron rust it was all very strange the words of hamlet rose up unbidden to the mind did these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at loggerts with them mine ache to think on't these are human bones said i to the old man yes sir and many a year they must have lain here for you see there is no sign of a coffin that must have rotted away long ago do you know whose grave it was oh no it is too long ago for that we ha not used this part of the churchyard much a very old grave sir and bad working in it he struck hard into it with a cruel-looking three-pronged tool and then began again with his spade and threw up more bones i tried to turn a little earth over them with my stick but they refused to be covered and so no one knows who was buried here why no sir how should they it was long ago for the ground is so dry that it must have taken a long time for a body to get like this the grave is very old some poor person i suppose no doubt sir but it makes no difference now this is what we must all come to sir and we don't know how soon the grave told the tale it needed no sermon from within it i have not much time to spare said the sexton for the funeral be at half past four it was then near three i shall not get home before milking time and who is to be buried here oh sir it be a poor woman as lived over yonder and very sad it be about them she had three children at a birth a month or so ago and she was very destitute her husband works on the line now although he was formerly a labourer the children all died 
and the poor mother lingered on till last friday shocking destitute as i believe sir poor thing she was fairly wore out very sorry i be for em all for the other five children as they have got are all young and the father is dazed like it be a great trouble for him and the mother is to be buried in an hour's time yes sir and she is better here perhaps but i be sorry for him and the children they live over there he pointed into the beautiful country beyond more beautiful than usual it seemed as i turned from that mournful earth and the ghastly relics of some fellow-creature who had once walked over these fields as lightly as the best now tossed into the sunlight as if in grim irony of existence to look out from the churchyard upon the endless landscape startles the mind that all seems so serene and immutable while we tis but a day we have before us to wander through these fast vanishing scenes a brief day well nigh over before we realize that it has begun and the end of it is a heedless labourer digging a hole in the ground and a few solemn pathetic words said over deaf ears and a vacant place left in perhaps one or two faithful hearts and a hillock covered with grass an end but too familiar to us all yet never familiar who can but think of that noble passage of carlyle loftiest of all modern teachers this little lifeboat of an earth with its noisy crew of a mankind and all their troubled history will one day have vanished faded like a cloud speck from the azure of the all what then is man what then is man he endures but for an hour and is crushed before the moth yet in the being and in the working of a faithful man is there already as all faith from the beginning gives assurance a something that pertains not to this wild death element of time that triumphs over time and is and will be when time shall be no more past the old church and the ruins of the priory there is a narrow cart track which leads straight to a chalk pit and close to that pit the long man stretches himself far up the hill i walked up to the spot and found that the outline was bricked in a work of recent times in horsefields sussex it is stated that the indentation is so very slight as not to be visible on the spot although it may occasionally be seen at the distance of two or three miles it is to be seen quite plainly now the bricks being clear of grass and laid too deep some people in the neighbourhood have taken this precaution to prevent the disappearance of their local giant there appears to be a large tumulus in the hill just below it from the long man a broad path runs round the brow of the hill and half england seems to be at your feet the downs at this height present as fine a field for walking as any one could desire but it is evident that few do desire it for a boy who was frightening crows from a newly sown field told me he had not seen a stranger there for three weeks he seemed to be having an uneasy time of it two or three large crows would alight at a far corner of the field which was on the hillside and as soon as he made pretence to go towards them some old stagers descended upon the ground from the other side and this game they kept up as long as i watched the scene it did not seem to be a pleasant way of passing the day the downs were in many places literally covered with the cowslip the freckled cowslip as shakespeare calls it the bed of the most lifelike of all fairies ariel in a cowslip's bell i lie there i couch when owls do cry on this particular day there were miles of cowslips lighting up the green hills i kept along the downs till i found myself nearly opposite polegate with its junction and then struck down towards it and soon reached the station thinking much of the yew tree and its silent companions and of yonder lonely grave 
and the sad group of children left motherless in a hard world end of alfriston and wilmington chapter six of field paths and green lanes by louis j jennings Yourson's Beyond Human Power by Lee Milton Hamilton, 1880 to 1972, from Drama Magazine, February 1914. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Plays by Jernstern Björson, The Gauntlet beyond our power the new system translated from the norwegian by edwin dorkman new york charles schreibner's sons in these days when we seem to see a return even in the life of every day to a consideration of those moral principles which in other times constituted the elements of vital religion and when the speculation of such scientists as sir oliver lodge are leading them to the verge of a new and mysterious faith it is particularly interesting to take up for study a play which a generation ago considered these questions with a larger philosophical grasp and literary vigor i refer to jorson's crowning contribution to dramatic literature or Ani, a title which may be roughly translated as beyond human power or beyond his strength to understand this play it will be necessary to study it in the light of bjorsen's own history the son of a clergyman of the lutheran state religion of norway bjorsen eighteen thirty two to nineteen ten inherited his father's rather liberal faith this he stoutly maintained into mature manhood vigorously defending a religious attitude which as middle life approached inclined toward the strictly apostolic national and cheerful christianity of the danish poet and seer grundtvig there followed however in the seventies another and final readjustment of his views in this respect although he was to hold out longer than any one among his eminent contemporaries in the north he no more than they was to be spared the formidable wrench and the distress of soul that comes from the losing of the faith of one's youth despite his struggles the ever-growing challenge of the experimental and historical sciences finally proved irresistible to a mind in which love of truth was no less firmly embedded than loyalty to traditions after protracted wrestling with himself he emerged practically an agnostic from now on positivism instead of christianity is his working hypothesis of life and he constitutes himself its high priest to be won over to a cause always meant for bjorsen to transform his new convictions unhesitatingly into action sure of his bearings through an intense study of theologic historic and scientific works he threw himself with all the force of his genius and the zeal of the convert into a campaign for the spreading of his views instituting a unique though not always well considered war on orthodox christianity especially on what he considered its excrescences the belief in a devil and the pains of hell a personal deity and the future life he scandalized his former friends among the conservatives by rendering accessible to his countrymen the essential arguments in Waits, Christian religion in the first two centuries. And after his visit to America in 1882, he even went so far as to translate, with an introduction, the articles of the infidel Ingersoll in the North American Review of 1881 on the Christian religion. George Brandes, the banner-bearer of the radical forces in Scandinavian literature, had raised the battle cry that it was the task of poetry to be useful and to discuss the problems of the times in other words that the poet was to be seer and prophet as well rebuking and forewarning as well as delighting 
the pedagogical element in bjorsen's genius hardly needed the stimulus of brandes influence to urge him to seize with eagerness the possibilities opened up by the modern conditions of life these specialists have scoffed at his knowledge of theology medicine sociology psychology it remains true however that at that time few of the delvers into the secrets of nature and the human mind saw the broader bearings of their own discoveries as keenly as did bjorsen thus bjorsen antedated them in the composition of quote, the modern play end quote. beginning with the editor eighteen seventy four three years before the pillars of society dealing with the ethics of journalism there followed a number of plays that fall like bombs into the camp of the conservatives a bankruptcy and the new system treating of business morality the king based on the opposed theories of the republic and monarchy and leonarda and a glove dealing with the question of sex morality next in point of time eighteen eighty three there comes the drama here translated bearing the title or Ane, beyond human power as the subtitle of the first part indicates this was to be the first of a series of plays independent of each other and each to deal with some aspect of what was or Ane in modern society only one other play bearing this title came to be written eighteen ninety five this was concerned with the struggle between capital and labor the force of the dano-norwegian idiom or ane is only incompletely rendered by beyond human power something is said to be or ane when it so far exceeds our strength potential and real as to be unobtainable or if attainable at all only by overreaching overstraining oneself again to live or ane is to live beyond one's means whether of resources or strength at the risk of ruin the subject of beyond human power is the problem of faith that is for us of christianity bjorsen's thesis is that both in its demands upon human power and human faith christianity is or ane that the consistent carrying out of christian theories would and does land us in the impossible and unnatural and that the essence of christianity lies in the words to faith all things are possible kierkegaard the great poet theologian of denmark who for a generation had helped the best spirits of young scandinavia at the parting of the ways whether to become sincerely christian or confirmed disbeliever says in one place that the miracle in the minds of the greeks was something abnormal stunted incomplete that we however by christianity have become or ought to have become used to regard the miracle as the something extraordinary which is higher than the normal the accustomed the general bjorsen like the greeks regards the miracle as something sickly uncanny a monstrosity just as deformities and monstrosities are miscarriages of nature in the physical sphere likewise miracles are a symptom of disordered mental nature they are in other words not normal but pathological indicating sick nerves and deranged minds from another point of view the miraculous certainly is destructive of the whole fabric of society setting a man at variance with his father and the daughter against the mother and so causing it that a man's foes shall be they of his own household for what is the essence of the miraculous what does it teach the drama is a case in point its essence is that whensoever a personal will may break through the lawful order of nature that will is bound to work havoc in all orderly thought and life all is bowled over by an inexplicable intercession men are tempted to think and to attempt to believe irrational things to ignore normal development and causation education becomes spasmodic social relations chaotic in this sense 
the miracle is explosive revolutionary in itself to ask for things or only and to expect them is dangerous once we go beyond the lawful order of things the unexpected the inexplicable may happen as the keen loving mind of rachel foresees the miracle is no blessing it is a thing terrifying it will kill us finally because it leads beyond the bounds of reality because as sang himself surmises it lifts things off their hinges it heightens man's powers for a brief time as fever frenzy at times gives men supernatural strength only to court a terrible relapse the poet's reference to medical works on nervous diseases at the end of the play which at first blush may seem pedantic thus assumes the aspect of a warning not to rouse the occult and sinister forces that slumber in the depths of human consciousness with a stroke of true genius bjorsen has made the miracle synonymous with the miraculous personality and powers of one man the eyes of all are devoutly fastened upon him in love admiration despair and on him the poet has lavished all the bright and beautiful traits in human character so as to make him even as a god among men he is perfect only and fatally he is not of this world he lacks a whole sense the sense of reality he is like as a child fit to enter into the kingdom of heaven in the remarkable long gallery of priests in scandinavian literature the frauds hypocrites cowards politicians breadwinners fanatics fools pastor sang shines like a bright cherub his motives are altogether beyond suspicion he is of one piece his devotion and belief are implicit not a vestige of doubt enters his soul his absolute certainty of being in harmony with the deity invest his personality with an irresistible hypnotic power over others by force of this quality he performs miracles he heals the sick and raises up the dead ay seems to extend his sway over inanimate nature as well yet he does not vaunt his power for he knows it is god-given and far from deriving advantage from it he gives away all he has to the good and the bad alike surely if anybody he deserves to be called a christian and to perfect the illusion this man of all men appears in a land bleak and fantastic and in its way as unusual as the holy land itself if the miracle is not here it does not exist to faith all things are possible this is sang's grand and fatal assumption raising himself beyond his strength he essays to break through the lawful order of things to heal his wife who is beyond his power and destroys both himself and her when it appears that his prayer really has subverted the laws of the universe and that the supposed crowning miracle with his wife is but a deadly nervous crisis which he himself has brought on he collapses utterly there is immense tragic force in his despairing cry of or else it marks the pinhole entrance of doubt with it has fled the faith which was the breath of his life just as a slight shock suffices to shatter the glass of a saint rupertus drop into atoms his heart breaks altogether once it is no longer whole in dry medical language he dies of a violent psychosis here again the reference to the works on la grande histoire is like the lifting of a warning finger besides saying all other characters of the drama sink into insignificance they are but a foil to his glory in all their actions and speeches we see but him reflected and yet what a wealth of magnificently visualized characters and how tenderly delineated there is the profoundly conceived union with his poor devoted wife the born skeptic with her unshakable faith in the supernatural powers of sang who is being crushed between the absolute demands of faith and the practical demands of life then there are the children torn between doubt and faith with half their father's half their mother's nature and with the loyalty of both 
also the touching figure of the pastor's widow like simeon departing from the temple in peace after seeing her salvation or like anna and finally brat the ardent and impatient skeptic yearning for a faith it is noteworthy that in this whole piece aimed as it is at the very vitals of christianity there is no professed free thinker the one who comes nearest to that description delicate irony a state church priest of the rationalist wing indeed so great is the poet's fair-mindedness that especially in the second act his sympathies and with him the readers seem to incline altogether to the side of faith or at least of those ampler natures who long for faith the ridicule falling rather on the official quasi-christians until they too are caught up into the mighty chorus of hallelujahs as to the poet's main thesis to be sure the miracle is not proved quite another matter it is whether or no the confutation of christianity necessarily follows from the miracle thus being shown to be beyond human power in the most favorable circumstances thinkable with cardinal newman the believer may seek refuge in the thought that miracles were indispensable only at the inception of the faith again many christians would hardly grant that christianity must stand or fall with the miracle just as conversely the miracle is no argument to one who is deliberately an agnostic the play ends tragically but as in a greek tragedy the spectator is not dismissed with horror and dismay but with the uplifting feeling that air being avoided man's is a blessed estate here in particular if no supernatural aid can be prayed down from the blue yet and precisely because of that man may hope to work out his salvation not beyond but in accordance with the laws of nature lee m hollander End of Beyond Human Power Character Sketch William Randolph Hearst by William Thomas Stead This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Character Sketch William Randolph Hearst this is the highest and most profitable knowledge truly to know and to despise ourselves to have no opinion of ourselves and to think always well and highly of others is great wisdom and perfection if thou shouldest see another sin openly or commit some grievous crime yet thou oughtest not to esteem thyself better because thou knowest not how long thou mayest be able to remain in a good state we are all frail but as to thee do not think they are more frail than thyself thomas a kempis Book One, Chapter One, One, an introductory homily. The hero of the month is unquestionably Mr. William Randolph Hearst. When Mr. Hearst was campaigning two years ago for the governorship of New York State in a village beyond Albany, Mr. Hearst's automobile met a coal wagon. The driver, a big burly fellow with his hands as black as his face, leaned over and gripped Mr. Hearst's fingers and shouted, "Good boy! To hell with the coal trust, Willie!" to hell with the trust swilly is a name that may yet become as famous in history as that of the famous praise god barebones of the english commonwealth for last month willie hurst has indeed to borrow the picturesque but profane vocabulary of the west been giving the trusts hell all around and not the trusts only the politicians who have blackmailed the trusts and the political leaders who became the hirelings of the trusts have all received their medicine Republican and Democrat alike have had it meted out to them fiery hot, while all the world has wondered, and not a few of its denizens have lifted up holy hands of unctuous righteousness, and have thanked God they were not sinners like other men, and especially not like these Republicans across the Atlantic. Now if the saints of all creeds may be believed, there is no sin so dangerous and deadly as self-righteousness. The harlot precedes the Pharisee into the kingdom of heaven, and therefore, before entering upon the description of Mr. Hurst's remarkable personality, let me administer to John Bull a little salutary physique, in order that he may attain to what Thomas A. Kempis calls, quote, the highest and most profitable knowledge, truly to know and to despise ourselves, 
End quote. By a providential good fortune, if we look at it from the point of view of Thomas A. Kempis, in the same week that Mr. Hearst began to explode his bombshells, in the headquarters of the Republicans and the Democrats of the United States, the Director of Public Prosecutions unfolded, in the Thames Police Court, a story of corruption, on a small scale, it is true, which in its way is quite as bad as anything Mr. Hearst has brought to light in America. As Poplar is to the United States, so is the dishonesty unveiled at the Thames Police Court to the revelations of Mr. Hearst. The case is not yet decided, and it is impossible to discuss the truth or falsehood of the charges against the individuals who have been placed in the dock, from which everyone hopes they may issue, quote, without a stain upon their characters, end quote. But the main outlines of the story, told by the chief offender, who has turned King's evidence, can be stated without offense. This man, a builder named Calcutt, accuses himself of having secured a series of contracts, chiefly for work done on the Blackwall Branch Asylum, covering the years 1903 to 1906, by the simple process of bribing eight members of the Board of Managers, who gave him a series of fat jobs, amounting in all to about three thousand pounds. The law requiring that all contracts exceeding fifty pounds should be let by public tender, was ingeniously evaded by splitting a contract for one building, into a series of separate contracts for each room. The official prosecutor said it was impossible to explain what this board did, in any other way than according to the story of Calcutt. It was a story of bribery and corruption, of gifts of clothes, coals, presents, drinks, and work. The case of Calcutt was but one of many others. When a tea contract was to be disposed of, one of the members exclaimed, quote, If he gets that contract, I want ten pounds. End quote. He got that ten pounds. When public money was spent on these lines, it is not surprising that the expenditure of this particular board went up by leaps and bounds. In 1901 it was 35,000 pounds a year. In 1906 it had risen to 62,000 pounds. A public outcry having been made, the expenditure has since been reduced by 10,000 pounds. It is, perhaps, not altogether without justification, if we take it that this single local board, elected from and by two local boards of guardians in one East End district, entailed upon the ratepayers an expenditure of 10,000 pounds a year, as a result of the methods of jobbery exposed at the Thames Police Court. If this board stood alone, we might think less of it. But does it stand alone? If a searching probe were applied to all our local governing bodies, as it has been applied in Poplar, how many would escape scatheless? Only a month or two ago, after a long and exhaustive trial, a batch of East End guardians were sent to jail as criminals for similar malpractices. Quote, Think ye that those upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell were sinners, above all the rest of the Galileans? I tell you nay. End quote. So I quote these instances of corruption in the East End, to point the moral and illustrate the warning of Thomas A. Kempis. Quote, if thou shouldest see another sin openly, or commit some grievous crime, yet thou oughtest not to esteem thyself better, because thou knowest not how long thou mayest be able to remain in a good state. End quote. It will be replied that the misdeeds of the East End may be set off against the misdeeds of Tammany Hall and the corrupt city governments of America. But the exposures made by Mr. Hurst are much more serious inasmuch as they impugn the honor of the leaders of the parties, to which are entrusted the government of the nation. Granted, but this compels me to point to another skeleton in our closet. The charges of Mr. Hurst, reduced to their essence, amount to this, that both parties, when elections came round, levied contributions from the trusts. He supplemented this by imputing specific acts of corruption in the purchase of individual members of the legislature, but these may be ignored for the present. The chief charge, the only one which indirectly affects Mr. Roosevelt, is the fact that the party managers, on the eve of an election, levied contributions for campaign funds from the great business combinations called trusts. In return for such contributions, they hoped to be insured against interference, or, in their own phrase, they were, quote, guaranteed a conservative administration, end quote. This, of course, is scandalous and worthy of all reprobation but those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. If we had a Mr. Hurst in this country, and our law of libel was as elastic as that of America, does anyone think that the world would not be scandalized by revelations as to corruption in high places in Westminster, as well as in Washington? 
the english variety of corruption differs from that which flourishes across the atlantic as a monarchy differs from a republic it has often been cynically declared that the one permanent advantage a monarchy possesses over a republic is that under one you can bribe respectability with honors whereas under the other you must pay down in hard cash i do not want to bring railing accusations against either of our political parties for both are equally guilty or equally innocent but if anyone imagines that the electoral expenses fund of either liberal or conservative party is not constantly replenished by what in blunt saxon may be called the sale of honors and titles he must be a very innocent it is all done on the sly no price list is exhibited in the windows of the government whip knighthoods cheap today guaranteed at five thousand pounds baronetcies from twenty five thousand pounds and upwards peerages fifty thousand pounds down because that would create a scandal but if any wealthy man wishes to secure a handle to his name he will soon discover that there is no surer and shorter road to the fount of honor than by a liberal subscription to the party funds if this not be so why should there be so insurmountable an objection on both sides to enacting that whenever any title or rank is conferred by the crown a message should be sent to parliament stating for what cause the king delighteth to honor these particular lieges those anxious to investigate this obscure subject will do well to make application to mr henniker heaton the incorruptible one who twice refused a baronetcy offered him in recognition of his services to the state on the ground that he did not care to accept the title which was usually bestowed in return for cash down all of which is a homily to my british readers not to think of themselves more highly than they ought to think and when reading the story of william randolph hearst and his revelations let them remember the parable of the moat and the beam and take to heart with all humility the warning let him who thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall two william randolph hearst when i returned from my last visit to america in nineteen o seven i wrote in the review of reviews for december quote, for the last ten years i have never varied in stating that from my own personal knowledge of the man insight into his character and knowledge of his capacity mr hurst has it in him to be the great personal power in america for the next twenty years he may wreck everything but on the other hand he may be in the future as he has already been in the past a force making for progress and for the diminution of many abuses mr hurst may be a good man or he may be a bad man that is a question of comparison as to which side the balance lies in a strangely complex character but that he is a great man and with a great strain of goodness in him i have no doubt whatever End quote. in a previous number of this magazine i expressed my conviction quote, that the character of mr hurst is the unknown x in the future of american politics the owner of the new york american and a half dozen other journals is for weal or for woe the factor which will exercise more influence on the history of the united states for the next twenty years than any other not even excepting mr roosevelt himself no mistake can be greater than to imagine that he is unquantity negligible not twelve months have passed since this was published and already every one is in amaze at the way in which mr hurst has in a single week succeeded in dominating the political situation in america on the eve of a presidential election who is this to hell with the trusts willie hurst the facts of his meteoric career are soon told he is the son of a great millionaire mine owner of california senator hurst whose wife phoebe still survives he was born in eighteen sixty four he was sent up to harvard by his parents and he was sent down from harvard by the university authorities after returning to san francisco he fell in love with a well-known and beautiful actress of a good californian family but his people regarding it as a misalliance prevented the marriage thereupon young hurst following the byronic example sought to find in many what he had failed to find in one and set about painting the town red in approved libertine fashion from that dates the period of his career which was brought to an end half a dozen years ago by his marriage in the midst of his scandalous debauchery he suddenly surprised his father by announcing a desire to go into journalism quote, don't be a mere tag on a money bag end quote, said a friend to the young hearst old senator hearst sniffed a bit at the idea of willie making out as an editor but he made over to him the san francisco examiner to the amazement of his parents and the dismay of his friends it was soon discovered that when they had started willie hearst in journalism they had let loose an earthquake on the pacific coast 
Mr. Sidney Brooks, who wrote a very well-informed article on The Significance of Mr. Hearst, in the fortnightly review last December, says, quote, He determined to be the Pulitzer of the Pacific Coast, and to conduct the examiner with the keyhole for a point of view, sensationalism for a policy, crime, scandal, and personalities for a specialty, all vested interests for a punching bag, cartoons, illustrations, and comic supplements for embellishments, and circulation for an object. He entirely succeeded. His father bore the initial expenses, and in return had the gratification of finding the examiner, turned loose among the businesses, characters, and private lives of his friends and associates. Hardly a prominent family escaped. The corporations were flayed, the plutocracy mercilessly ridiculed, and the social life of San Francisco, and especially of its wealthier citizens, was flooded with all the publicity that huge and flaming headlines and cohorts of repertorial eavesdroppers could give it. San Francisco was horrified, but it bought the examiner. Senator Hearst remonstrated with his son, and to the last never quite reconciled himself to the new journalism, but he did not withhold supplies, and in a very few years the enterprise was beyond need of his assistance and earning a handsome profit. End quote. When he was turned thirty, he conceived the idea of duplicating in New York the success he had achieved in San Francisco. Mr. Pulitzer, of the New York world, was in possession of the field. But Mr. Hearst had received a million sterling from his mother, to whom Senator Hearst had left his fortune, and he flung himself into the combat with the fine frenzy of a journalistic genius, who had money to burn and a whole continent as a battlefield. He bought up Pulitzer's best men, and when they did not stay bought, but went back to Pulitzer at increased salaries, Mr. Hearst bought them a second time, at prices with which even Mr. Pulitzer could not compete. In a very few years, by lavish expenditure, audacious enterprise, and unstinted sensationalism, he had secured for the New York Journal the first place in circulation in the United States. It was just when Mr. Hearst had succeeded in achieving his ambition to secure circulation that I made his acquaintance. It was in the fall of 1897. I had crossed the Atlantic with another remarkable product of American life, Richard Croker, of Tammany Hall, and I was most anxious to make the acquaintance of Mr. Hearst. I went down to his office shortly before midnight. I found the young millionaire in his shirt sleeves, busily engaged in preparing next day's paper. As soon as he was through the press of his work he sat down, and I had one of the most memorable conversations of my life. It takes rank with my interview with Cecil Rhodes, when he told me he wished to make me his heir, and my interview with Alexander the Third, when I discovered him to be the peacekeeper of Europe, as among those which are indelibly impressed on my memory. Mr. Hurst looked at me somewhat quizzically as he sat down, and bade me welcome. Plunging at once in media res, I said, quote, Mr. Hurst, I am very glad to see you. I have been very curious to see you for some time, ever since I saw how you were handling the journal. But do you know why I want to see you? End quote. Mr. Hurst smiled and said he thought it was a great compliment. Quote, not at all. I went on. I want to see you because I want to find out if you have got a soul. Listen to me, I said. I have long been on the lookout for a man to appear who will carry out my ideal of government by journalism. I am certain that such a man will come to the front some day, and I wonder if you are to be that man. You have many of the qualities such a man must possess. You have youth, energy, great journalistic flair, adequate capital, boundless ambition, yes you have all these but but i am not sure you have got a soul and if you have not a soul all the other things are as nothing End quote. Quote, what do you mean said mr hurst what do you mean by having a soul End quote. Quote, have you ever read lowell's biglow papers do you remember ever having read the prose preface to the pious editor's creed promise me i said that you will hunt out the book and read it before you go to bed this night. I read it before I was twenty, and it has dominated ever since my conception of journalism. Read it and you will see what I mean by asking whether you have got a soul. Lowell's Conception of Journalism end quote. Oh, said Mr. Hurst with a sneer, quote, journalism is only a business, like everything else. End quote. Quote, There's just where you make your mistake, I retorted vehemently. Journalism is not a business, just like everything else and it is because you think it is so, and act on your belief, that I doubted whether you had found your soul. Journalism, I went on, is the heir of all the theocracies, monarchies, 
aristocracies, hierarchies, and plutocracies. In a democracy, the journalist is the one man whose voice is heard day by day by all the people. He has all the opportunities, all the responsibilities. It is his mission, as Lowell said, to be the Moses of humanity, leading each generation across that wilderness of sin called the progress of civilization. End quote. Quote, It's all very well for you to talk like that, said Mr. Hurst, because you have made your mark, and you have a right to be heard. But if I were to start on to the profit business, why, people would say, who is this young fellow who's talking to us like that? Guess he's pretty considerable swell-headed. End quote. Quote, My dear Mr. Hurst, I answered, if I had waited till I had made my mark before starting in the profit business, I never should have made my mark. Do you know, I asked, what the New York Journal looks like to me every time I take it up? End quote. Quote, no, he replied, I'm rather interested to hear. End quote. Quote, this, said I, it seems to me exactly like a first-class Atlantic liner, fitted up with the latest improvements, with the best machinery, a first-class crew, a crowded complement of passengers, which, when it has got out of sight of land, is discovered to have neither pilot, nor chart, nor compass on board. So it goes, steaming ahead, now this way, now that, without a name, without an object, except only to show her speed. End quote. Quote, well, said Mr. Hurst, there is something in that, I admit. But what would you have me do with it? Where should I sail to? End quote. Quote, if you do not know yourself what is the best course to steer, then consult the best Americans who think about the public welfare. Cecil Rhodes used to say that there were not more men in England who were worth consulting about the empire than you could count on the fingers of two hands. That was too low an estimate. Suppose we say there are 25 such on average in every state of the Union. That gives you 1,000 men whose judgment is the best. Make it your business to know the whole 1,000 and condense from the total mass of their contributions what you find to be the common denominator of their ideas. Make that your message. Use your paper to give more power to the elbow of all the best and wisest citizens. Be their organ, their mouthpiece, make your paper their scepter. And if you do, there is no man living in the United States who will have such an influence for good for so many years as you will have. Presidents last eight years at the most, you will never go out of office. But it all depends, I said, whether you've got a soul, and that is why I've come here tonight to find out. End quote. Quote, it's very interesting what you say, replied Mr. Hurst. It never occurred to me in that light before. End quote. Quote, don't think it will be an easy road, I went on. It is not a path of roses by any means. It may land you in jail, or it may lead you to the scaffold, but a man with a soul within him counts these things as but trifles, compared with the opportunity of wielding such influence over millions of his fellow men. End quote. We had a good deal more talk, but the above was the gist of it. I left after midnight, marveling a little at the unwanton liberty of utterance, which had been given to me with this total stranger, and wondering not a little as to what impression my unceremonious discourse had made upon the mind of Mr. Hurst. After I returned home and was settling down to work, I was startled by receiving, every now and then, from Mr. Hurst, cablegrams addressed to his London correspondent, asking him to obtain and to telegraph what I thought upon what the journal was doing in this, that, or the other direction. I do not for a moment argue post hoc propter hoc, but it was almost immediately after that midnight talk that Mr. Hurst began to realize the ideal of a journalism that does things. He took up the question of municipal ownership. He engaged Arthur Brisbane, the son of Brisbane the Fourierist, to write editorials. He began the battle against the trusts. He made the Spanish-American War. For weal or for woe, Mr. Hurst had found his soul. For weal or for woe, he had discovered his chart and engaged his pilot. And from that day to this, he has steered a straight course, with no more tackings than were necessary to avoid the fury of the storm. Some years afterwards, I met Mr. Hurst in Paris. He recalled our first conversation and said, quote, I never had a talk with anyone who made so deep a dint in life. End quote. The acquaintance thus begun has continued unbroken down to the present time. I am afraid I incurred no small amount of odium by contributing to the journal in its early days, and last year when I was asked to describe the peace conference for the American, 
the journal was rechristened American after a few years. I was warned by my friends that nothing would so hopelessly discredit me as to figure in the pages of that yellow journal. Mr. Roosevelt's opinion of Hearst, as he delivered it to one of Mr. Hearst's own interviewers and repeated it to me, was quite unfit for publication. Anyhow, it was not published. But what was to be done? In 1899, when the first peace conference met at The Hague, it was Mr. Hearst and Mr. Hearst's syndicated papers, which alone were willing to pay for cabling 2,000 words every Sunday, of what had been done at The Hague the previous seven days. Last year they undertook to do the same, but as public interest waned, they did not continue their publication. I saw Mr. Hearst last year before I left New York, the day after he had published a scathing attack upon the Democratic Party organization, in which the curious will find a foreshadowing of the smashing blow, which last month drove Mr. Bryan to get rid of the treasurer of his party. We had quite a long talk. I have probably talked with as many varieties of notable men as any of my contemporaries. I put Mr. Hurst very high in my graded categories of remarkable men. A cooler hand and a steadier head few men have. He discussed with almost Olympian impartiality the probabilities of American politics, the characters of American public men. He seemed to be singularly free from bitterness. He said he thought the Republicans could not help carrying the next presidential election, even if they tried. Roosevelt's influence would be sufficient to carry any ticket. As to Mr. Bryan's chances, he spoke kindly of Mr. Bryan, but he utterly despaired of the Democratic Party machine, being capable of grappling with the trusts. It had chopped and changed too much to command the confidence of the country, and the personnel of its organization was utterly bad. I asked him why he had not adhered to the career which, ten years before, I had said would lead him to a position in the Republic, much more influential than that of President. Quote, oh, he replied, I was tired of telling people what they ought to do. I wanted to see if I could not do things myself. But that is over now. I am not going to stand again for presidency. End quote. Quote, but, I objected, you stood for the mayoralty of New York, and then for the governorship of the state. End quote. Quote, I did not want to stand for either, he replied. The boys fairly forced me into the mayoral contest. They said that it was no use my rallying them to the fight, if I would not do my share in the battle. I refused and refused, and it was only when it was quite clear that the whole party would be ruined, if I did not give in, that I consented to stand. End quote. Quote, and were not elected? End quote. Quote, oh, I was elected right enough. Legally and rightfully, I am mayor of New York at this moment. But they deliberately falsified the election returns. If we could have had an honest count of all the ballots cast, I should have been in the city hall at this moment. End quote. What about the governorship? Quote, oh, that was a corollary to the cheating that seated the candidate of the minority in the mayor's chair. Our fellows were mad at the scandalous swindle, and they nominated me for governor. End quote. Quote, out of which you were kept by Mr. Root's letter from Roosevelt. End quote. Quote, oh no, not at all. I don't think that letter materially affected the result. What did affect the election was the fact that as the Republicans had usurped the mayoralty, they were able to swing the whole of the civic employees' votes for Mr. Hughes. If they had not been in possession of the mayoralty, or if they had remained neutral, most of these employees would have voted for me, as they did when I stood for mayor. End quote. Mr. Hurst spoke without acrimony, with a good deal of philosophical cynicism. But it was quite clear to me that he could not be counted upon as a factor to secure the success of Mr. Bryan. My own impression of Mr. Hurst has never varied. He is one of the ablest men in America, the keenest and most capable journalist in the world. Whatever his past may have been, in the days when he was madcap Hal, he has put away the vices of his hot youth and is now, like Henry V, the very opposite of his former self. The danger, of course, is that there may be a taint, a certain moral deterioration born of the period of his libertine youth, which may deaden the moral instinct of the maturer man. As I used to say of Rhodes, that his ethical education had been neglected, I would say of Mr. Hurst, that his ethical perception may have been dulled by the riotous life of his earlier manhood. The fine sense that instinctively recoils from anything that is not chivalrous or noble, 
seldom survives a prolonged mud bath in which the man wallows together with the dragons of the primeval slime hence certain things in his journals which make his friends uneasy and cause his enemies to blaspheme there is a certain coarseness of invective more worthy of a bargee than of a gentleman in which mr hurst occasionally revels but when all deductions are made and all discounts allowed for mr hurst is to-day probably the most typical american of the new generation if you want to know what kind of man mr hurst is it is absurd to go ransacking roman history to find his prototype to some he is a reincarnation of the famous brothers gracchi to others he is the modern catiline it is much simpler and the ordinary reader will understand much better what he is if i say that he is alfred harmsworth and william thomas stead rolled into one and reincarnated in the body of an american of the pacific coast he has the qualities of both the readers of the daily mail and of the review of reviews although it is probable that the proportion of stead is less than the proportion of northcliffe but he is like me in being a propagandist and a hot gossipler which lord northcliffe is not and never can be it is not in him but he has all lord northcliffe's qualities his journalistic flair his skill in choosing willing slaves his insatiable ambition and his great business capacity his appearance has been recently described by two close observers mr arthur brisbane says quote, he is a big man he is more than six feet two in height very broad with big hands and big feet a strong neck that will stand up for a long time under a heavy load his hair is light in color and his eyes blue-gray with a singular capacity for concentration his dress of late has been the usual uniform of american statesmanship combining the long-tailed frock coat and the cowboy's soft slouch hat End quote. here is a companion picture by mr sidney brooks quote, in dress appearance and manner he is impeccably quiet measured and decorous he struck me as a man of power and a man of sense with a certain dry wit about him and a pleasantly detached and impersonal way of speaking he stands six feet two in height is broad-shouldered deep of chest huge-fisted deliberate but assured in all his movements but for an excess of paleness and smoothness in his skin one might take him for an athlete he does not look his forty-four years the face has indubitable strength the long and powerful jaw and the lines round his firmly clenched mouth tell of a capacity for long concentration and the eyes large steady and luminously blue emphasized by their directness the effect of resolution in more ways than his quiet voice and unhurried considering air mr hurst is somewhat of a surprise he neither smokes nor drinks he never speculates he sold the racehorses he inherited from his father and is never seen on a racetrack yachting dancing cards the newport life have not the smallest attraction for him for a multi-millionaire he has scarcely any friends among the rich and to society he is wholly indifferent he lives in an unpretentious house in an unfashionable quarter and outside his family his politics and his papers appears to have no interests whatever End quote. many people used to say that mr hurst was a cipher that he would be nothing without mr brisbane etc the fact is mr hurst is anything but a cipher in the expressive americanism it is mr hurst who is it and no one else but mr hurst he has not a resonant voice but he is an effective speaker he is as slashing a writer as any of those wielding a pen on the american press the question of questions that is asked me always about mr hurst is this is he sincere if i were put in the witness stand and made to answer that question on my oath i should say to the best of my knowledge and belief he is that he is absolutely free from self-seeking i do not for a moment contend he is no pharisee he is a man avid of success measured by increase of circulation and increase of influence an ambitious man as napoleon was ambitious and with something perhaps of the unscrupulosity of the great little corsican but in the inmost soul of him and he has a soul and has found it there is a desire to serve the common people he is a jeffersonian democrat a natural demagogue and a man who is proud of being the tribune of the people it may be said if hurst be so why then this and that mr hurst is a man of action a journalist engineer to whom nothing is sacred a man whose balance wheel of moral principle is not dominant a kind of american jesuit to whom the end justifies the means but this brings me to my next chapter three the hearst newspapers 
Mr. Hearst is the owner of nine distinct newspapers, published in five cities in the United States, and three widely circulated magazines, all of which pay. To quote Mr. Brisbane, quote, He has built his newspapers up to a daily circulation of two millions, and that circulation is increasing constantly. Every day Hearst is able to talk with two million American families, scattered everywhere in this country. His newspapers are published in Boston, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and they will soon be published in many other cities. His voice reaches farther than the voice of any other man in the country. There has never before been assembled in this world an audience such as that which Hearst commands, and therefore it is safe to say that there has never been a man possessing his peculiar influence and power for good. End quote. According to Mr. Krillman, Mr. Hearst, up to 1906, had invested two million four hundred thousand pounds in his newspaper business, and every year he spends three million pounds in producing his various publications. This daily outlay of eight thousand pounds purchases four hundred tons of white paper, which are converted into two million newspapers, varying from eight to thirty or forty pages, pays the wages of four thousand regular employees, and the lineage of fifteen thousand correspondents writing in space. He bought the New York Journal for thirty thousand pounds, and has now sunk one point six million pounds in that property. All of his papers are papers that appeal to the million. They are printed for the million, and are read by the million. They are sensational and abusive, but not, so far as I have been able to discover, obscene or filthy. Mr. Hurst, indeed, gibbeted James Gordon Bennett for publishing indecent advertisements in the Herald, and obtained a judgment against him. He was accused by President Roosevelt of having incited by his violent attacks the assassination of President McKinley, and there is no variety of abusive epithet that has not been heaped upon him in his paper. But it takes all sorts of people to make a world, and it takes all sorts of papers to minister to the tastes of all sorts of people. Full reports of murder cases are not always edifying reading, but with the memory of the lured murder and suicide still fresh in our memory, it does not do for English journalists to give themselves airs. That Mr. Hurst plays to his gallery is true, and he would not deny it, for it is by the support of his readers he lives. That he would, other things being equal, prefer to produce more respectable papers, I believe, but he caters to his public, as do many more Pharisaic journalists, who happen to have a less cosmopolitan public than that to which Mr. Hurst appeals. Mr. Hurst talked good sound peace talk when I was last in New York, and the editorials in the American would have delighted the heart of Dr. Darby of the Peace Society. But if any man made the war with Spain inevitable, it was Mr. Hurst, just as it was Lord Northcliffe, who largely contributed to bring about the war with the Boers. Appealing as he does largely to the Russian Jews of the ghetto, to the Germans, to the Irish, and to the non-English conglomerate, he is constantly under the temptation to twist the lion's tail. His late outburst in the Times exhibited him at his worst. I have a great belief in Mr. Hurst, and a great affection for him, but I am afraid, I must admit, that the influence of his papers would not tend towards peace and sweet reasonableness in the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. Mr. Brisbane boldly claims for Mr. Hurst that, quote, he has made dishonest wealth disreputable throughout the nation. He is the greatest awakener and director of public opinion and public anger against injustice that the country has seen for many years. Hearst has made innumerable fights in the interests of the people at his own expense, with great expenditure of money and of personal energy. Various trusts have been fought by him through the courts and up to the Supreme Court. He certainly has the honor of being hated more deeply by the public enemies of this country than any other man in it. A mere enumeration of the lawsuits that he has begun, and prosecuted on behalf of the public welfare, fills out a considerable pamphlet. End quote. A more impartial witness, writing in Collier's Weekly, says, quote, It is due to Mr. Hurst, more than to any other one man, that the Central and Union Pacific Railroads paid the twenty-four million pounds they owed the government. Mr. Hurst secured a model children's hospital for San Francisco, and he built the Greek theater of the University of California, one of the most successful classic reproductions in America. Eight years ago, and again this year, his energetic campaigns did a large part of the work of keeping the ice trust within the bounds of New York. His industrious law department put some fetters on the coal trust. He did much of the work of defeating the Ramapo plot, by which New York would have been saddled with a charge of forty million pounds for water. 
to the industry and pertinacity of his lawyers new yorkers owe their ability to get gas for eighty cents a thousand feet as the law directs instead of a dollar in maintaining a legal department which plunges into the limelight with injunctions and mandamuses when corporations are caught trying to sneak under or around a law he has rendered a service which has been worth millions of dollars to the public End quote. verily a newspaper man who uses his newspapers to do things one of the things which weigh most in mr hurst's favor is the extent to which he commands the devoted service of some of the ablest journalists in america it is true he pays them well mr brisbane receives ten thousand pounds the salary of the president of america the next best paid member of his staff receives eight thousand pounds the third six thousand pounds five assistants receive five thousand pounds each but no salary however high could command the unstinted enthusiasm with which mr brisbane serves mr hurst he declares quote, hurst represents unselfishness in public life in need of nothing personally he is not satisfied while others fail to thrive as they should in a country such as this he is ambitious without personal conceit he is extremely tenacious he is absolutely temperate free from fondness for dissipation of any kind End quote. the following are the names of the leading members of his staff as they were given by mr creelman two years ago quote, solomon solis carvalho general manager of all the hearst newspapers a highly trained journalist and shrewd businessman of portuguese descent arthur brisbane editor of the new york evening journal and writer of its remarkable editorials he is the son of albert brisbane disciple of fourier the french socialist samuel s chamberlain managing editor for the new york american and supervising editor of all the Hearst newspapers, was for many years the friend and secretary of James Gordon Bennett. Morrill Goddard, editor of the New York American Sunday Magazine. Max F. Imsen, Mr. Hearst's political manager, once a member of the New York Herald staff. Clarence Shern, Mr. Hearst's lawyer, and the thinker-out of his costly injunction suits and other litigations against corporations and oppressors of the common people. End quote. Mr. Hearst is a millionaire, a multimillionaire besides his newspapers he owns a million acres of land but as it was with Rhodes money is to him only a means to power he spends money like water in the political education of the people he was reputed to have spent two hundred thousand pounds on the gubernatorial election of 1906 but even if he only spent the fifty one thousand two hundred and seventy four pounds which he returned in compliance with the election law it was a large sum he does not need to bleed the standard oil for his campaign funds he bleeds himself when mr hurst was in london five years ago he was interviewed upon his conception of journalism he replied in terms which sound something like a faraway echo of the harangue i hurled at him six years before in his new york office quote, yellow journalism said mr hurst is active journalism it is the journalism which is not content with merely printing news not content with merely securing an audience but which seeks, rather, to educate and influence its audience, and through it, to accomplish something for the benefit of the community and the whole country. My particular form of yellow journalism attacks special privilege and class distinction, and all things that I believe to be undemocratic and un-American. A journalism which employs the power of its vast audience to accomplish beneficial results for all the people is the journalism of the future. Better still, I think it is the journalism of the present. I cannot imagine why anyone should want to print a newspaper except for that purpose. I myself don't find any satisfaction in sensational news, comic supplements, dress patterns, and other features of journalism, except as they serve to attract an audience to whom the editorials in my newspapers are addressed. You must first get your congregation, before you can preach to it, and educate it to an appreciation and practice of the higher ideals of life." End quote. There was some talk once of Mr. Hurst, after stringing newspapers across the western continent establishing a hearst organ in london he made soundings but he abandoned the project why i asked because he replied dryly with a humorous twinkle in his eye quote, i fear that the law of libel in the old country is too strict to allow legitimate scope for newspaper enterprise End quote. four his disclosures mr hearst at one time was a democrat who took to the stump for the Democratic Party. He was elected to Congress on the Democratic ticket, but made no mark in the legislature. He is a personal friend and has been a staunch supporter of Mr. Bryan, 
but he has just dealt him through his organization one of the hardest knocks at one time he believed that the democratic party could be used against the trusts he has always been opposed to the republicans for the cause succinctly stated by him in his early democratic days quote, i do sincerely believe that the republican party as a political institution is so much indebted to the trusts is under so many obligations to the trusts that it will never legislate against the trusts nor even enforce against them the laws which already exist the trusts have received so many privileges from the republican party and the republican party in return has received so many favors from the trusts that a bond has grown between them uniting them like the siamese twins and you cannot stick a pin in the trusts without hearing a shriek from the republican party and you cannot stick a pin in the republican party without hearing a roar from the trusts now you can't expect one siamese twin to turn against his siamese brother and you cannot expect the republican party to turn against the trusts the republicans may say they will they frequently do say they will but they never do it End quote. in his campaign two years ago for the governorship of new york state he made things hum by the aid of gramophones pyrotechnics picture posters and choral societies an observer describing the election said quote, all last week there were constant hearst processions with red fire skyrockets and illuminated banners in every town and village in the state thousands of phonographs were utilized in this campaign of vituperation and every town was fully supplied with machine-made oratory tens of thousands of copies of the hearst newspapers were distributed free nightly picturing mr hughes and other prominent republicans as rats and other loathsome animals the hearst posters showed babies poisoned by bad milk mothers freezing to death on christmas day at the door of a trust millionaire with dead children at their feet corporation magnates laughing with their heels in workingmen's faces and others murdering the common people with tram cars and motor cars the vicissitudes of the common people represented by a meek little dwarf and the antics of the steel ice coal railway and other trusts represented by men of unusual size have furnished much amusement in the east side slums where pictures are more valuable as vote winners than speeches End quote. his intervention in this presidential election reminds me somewhat of the sensation produced in london in eighteen eighty five by the publication by the pall mall gazette of the maiden tribute of modern babylon everyone knew that these horrors had existed but no one knew exactly how or by whom the hateful traffic was organized when the pall mall began its revelations there was for a time a sickening sense of terror among the more highly placed ruez for no one knew whose names might be revealed before the publication ceased the pall mall gazette however held its hand its object being to pass a new law and not to pillory individuals there was no need to mention names but mr hurst has mentioned names everyone knew that both parties blackmailed the trusts and were in turn subservient to them but to know that criminality exists is one thing to be able to pin it down to the counter is another mr hurst has nailed it down to the counter there is no need to enter into the disclosures in detail the main outlines are all that non-american readers care for what mr hurst did was to publish letters presumably stolen which in the opinion of the american public from mr roosevelt downwards proved that certain notable political chiefs had been tampered with by the trusts senator foraker was the chief republican victim he is a senator whose position in the republican party somewhat resembled that of mr chamberlain under mr gladstone that is to say he is a great political personality often insubordinate and sometimes hostile to the administration whom it was nevertheless very necessary to keep in line for the presidential campaign mr hurst published his incriminating letters and senator foraker dropped like a shot pheasant mr haskell governor of oklahoma mr bryan's friend and the trusted treasurer of the party was the chief democratic victim he made a show of fight but mr bryan had to fling him overboard like another jonah poor mr haskell the poet laureate of the anti-trust campaign had written campaign songs for his party breathing vengeance against the trusts and now like actian he was torn to pieces by his own dogs there were others of less note there is a letter from mr sibley advising the standard oil trust to invest two hundred pounds in a loan to a senator quote, who is one who could do anything in the world that is right for his friends if needed End quote. senator mclaurin a democrat is shown to have been in close business relations with the standard oil people and so forth but president roosevelt himself does not come off scot-free 
In 1904, it is alleged, Mr. Cornelius Bliss, treasurer of the Republican National Party, acting for Mr. Cortelyou, chairman of the Republican National Committee, levied a contribution of £20,000 upon Mr. Henry Rogers and Mr. John Archbold, representing the Standard Oil Company. In return, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Archbold, who have complained that President Roosevelt has been acting harshly towards the Standard Oil Company, were to receive what is called a, quote, conservative administration, end quote, which, being interpreted, means a government that will not make things unduly warm for the Standard Oil Company. On hearing of this, Mr. Roosevelt wrote a violent letter to Mr. Cordelieu, denouncing the Standard Oil Company and directing the return of the £20,000, but, and this is the most important, the contributors alleged that the money was not returned and not one cent was paid back. Not only was it not paid back, but a little later an additional sum of £50,000 was requested from the Standard Oil Company. Mr. Rogers declined to give any more money, and recalled the fact that the President's instructions to return the first contribution had not been complied with, and that Mr. Roosevelt must have known all along that the £20,000, which he repudiates, had not only been accepted, but used. In view of this fact, Mr. Rogers declined to accede to the request for a further £50,000, and denounced Mr. Roosevelt for seemingly trying, on the one hand, to secure contributions from the Standard Oil Company, and, on the other hand, to make political capital by denouncing the company. Senator DuPont of Delaware, who is head of the Powder Trust, had to resign from the chairmanship of the Speaker's Bureau of the Republican National Committee. How many more resignations there will be, no one knows. The Standard Oil Company, which Mr. Rockefeller regards with such unfeigned admiration, is not merely a gigantic trust. Mr. Rockefeller and his partners, the Standard Oil crowd, control capital many times larger than the national debt. According to Mr. Lewis Emery, who stood for governor in Pennsylvania, the Standard Oil Group, of which Mr. Rockefeller is the head and Mr. Rogers the right hand, hold a controlling interest in the following concerns. Insurance companies, £280 million. Railroads, £500 million. Industrial, £360 million. Traction and transportation, £32 million. Gas, electric, light, and power, 22 million pounds. Mining companies, 39 million pounds. Banks and trust companies, 36 million pounds. Telegraph and telephone, 36 million pounds. Navigation, 8 million pounds. Safe deposits, 120,000 pounds. Total, 1,313,120,000 pounds. Here there is an imperium in imperio, a power within the republic, which Mr. Hearst has now revealed as directly aiming at the control of the government of the republic by the use of the money power. End of character sketch. Darwin Among the Machines by Samuel Butler this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman To the Editor of the Press, Christchurch, New Zealand, 13 June, 1863 Sir, there are few things of which the present generation is more justly proud than of the wonderful improvements which are daily taking place in all sorts of mechanical appliances. And, indeed, it is matter for great congratulations on many grounds. It is unnecessary to mention these here, for they are sufficiently obvious. Our present business lies with considerations which may somewhat tend to humble our pride, and to make us think seriously of the future prospects of the human race. If we revert to the earliest primordial types of mechanical life, to the lever, the wedge, the inclined plane, the screw, and the pulley, or, for analogy would lead us one step further, to that one primordial type from which all the mechanical kingdom has been developed, we mean to the lever itself. And if we then examine the machinery of the Great Eastern, we find ourselves almost awestruck at the vast development of the mechanical world, at the gigantic strides with which it has advanced 
in comparison with the slow progress of the animal and vegetable kingdom. We shall find it impossible to refrain from asking ourselves what the end of this mighty movement is to be, in what direction is it tending, what will be its upshot. To give a few imperfect hints towards the solution of these questions is the object of the present letter. We have used the words mechanical life, the mechanical kingdom, the mechanical world, and so forth, and we have done so advisedly, for as the vegetable kingdom was slowly developed from the mineral, and as in like manner the animal supervened upon the vegetable, so now in these last few ages an entirely new kingdom has sprung up of which we as yet have only seen what will one day be considered the antediluvian prototypes of the race. We regret deeply that our knowledge both of natural history and of machinery is too small to enable us to undertake the gigantic task of classifying machines into the genre and subgenera, species, varieties, and subvarieties, and so forth of tracing the connecting links between machines of widely different characters, of pointing out how subservience to the use of man has played that part among machines which natural selection has performed in the animal and vegetable kingdom, of pointing out rudimentary organs, see note, which exist in some few machines, feebly developed and perfectly useless, yet serving to mark descent from some ancestral type, which has either perished or been modified into some new phase of mechanical existence. We can only point out this field for investigation. It must be followed by others whose education and talents have been of a much higher order than any which we can lay claim to. Some few hints we have determined to venture upon, though we do so with the profoundest diffidence. Firstly, we would remark that, as some of the lowest of the vertebrata attained a far greater size than has descended to their more highly organized living representatives, so a diminution in the size of machines has often attended their development and progress. Take the watch, for instance. Examine the beautiful structure of the little animal. Watch the intelligent play of the minute members which compose it. Yet this little creature is but a development of the cumbrous clocks of the thirteenth century. It is no deterioration from them. The day may come when clocks, which certainly at the present day are not diminishing in bulk, may be entirely superseded by the universal use of watches, in which case clocks will become extinct like the earlier saurians, while the watch, whose tendency has for some years been rather to decrease in size than the contrary, will remain the only existing type of an extinct race. The views of machinery which we are thus feebly indicating will suggest the solution of one of the greatest and most mysterious questions of the day. We refer to the question, what sort of creature man's next successor in the supremacy of the earth is likely to be. We have often heard this debated, but it appears to us that we are ourselves creating our own successors. We are daily adding to the beauty and delicacy of their physical organization. We are daily giving them greater power and supplying, by all sorts of ingenious contrivances, that self-regulating, self-acting power which will be to them what intellect has been to the human race. In the course of ages we shall find ourselves the inferior race, inferior in power, inferior in that moral quality of self-control. We shall look up to them as the acme of all that the best and wisest man can ever dare to aim at. No evil passions, no jealousy, no avarice, no impure desires will disturb the serene might of those glorious creatures. Sin, shame, and sorrow will have no place among them. Their minds will be in a state of perpetual calm. The contentment of a spirit that knows no wants is disturbed by no regrets. Ambition will never torture them. Ingratitude will never cause them the uneasiness of a moment. The guilty conscience, the hope deferred, 
the pains of exile, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. These will be entirely unknown to them. If they want feeding, by the use of which very word we betray our recognition of them as a living organism, they will be attended by patient slaves whose business and interest it will be to see that they shall want for nothing. If they are out of order, they will be promptly attended to by physicians who are thoroughly acquainted with their constitutions. If they die, for even these glorious animals will not be exempt from that necessary and universal consummation, they will immediately enter into a new phase of existence. For what machine dies entirely in every part at one and the same instant? We take it that when the state of things shall have arrived which we have been attempting to describe, man will have become to the machine what the horse and the dog are to man. He will continue to exist, nay, even to improve, and will be probably better off in his state of domestication under the beneficent rule of the machines than he is in his present wild state. We treat our horses, dogs, cattle, and sheep on the whole with great kindness. We give them whatever experience teaches us to be best for them, and there can be no doubt that our use of meat has added to the happiness of the lower animals far more than it has detracted from it. In like manner, it is reasonable to suppose that the machines will treat us kindly, for their existence is as dependent upon ours as ours is upon the lower animals. They cannot kill us and eat us as we do sheep. They will not only require our services in the parturition of their young, which branch of their economy will remain always in our hands, but also in feeding them, in setting them right if they are sick, and burying their dead or working up their corpses into new machines. It is obvious that if all the animals in Great Britain save man alone were to die, and if at the same time all intercourse with foreign countries were by some sudden catastrophe to be rendered perfectly impossible, it is obvious that under such circumstances the loss of human life would be something fearful to contemplate. In like manner, were mankind to cease, the machines would be as badly off, or even worse. The fact is that our interests are inseparable from theirs, and theirs from ours. Each race is dependent upon the other for innumerable benefits, and until the reproductive organs of the machines have been developed in a manner which we are hardly yet able to conceive, they are entirely dependent upon man for even the continuance of their species. It is true that these organs may be ultimately developed, inasmuch as man's interest lies in that direction. There is nothing which our infatuated race would desire more than to see a fertile union between two steam engines. It is true that machinery is even at this present time employed in begetting machinery, in becoming the parent of machines, often after its own kind. But the days of flirtation, courtship, and matrimony appear to be very remote, and indeed can hardly be realized by our feeble and imperfect imagination. Day by day, however, the machines are gaining ground upon us. Day by day we are becoming more subservient to them. More men are daily bound down as slaves to tend them. More men are daily devoting the energies of their whole lives to the development of mechanical life. The upshot is simply a question of time, but that the time will come when the machines will hold the real supremacy over the world and its inhabitants is what no person of a truly philosophic mind can for a moment question. Our opinion is that war to the death should be instantly proclaimed against them. Every machine of every sort should be destroyed by the well-wisher of his species. Let there be no exceptions made, no quarter shown. Let us at once go back to the primeval condition of the race. If it be urged that this is impossible under the present condition of human affairs, this at once proves that the mischief is already done, that our servitude has commenced in good earnest, 
that we have raised a race of beings whom it is beyond our power to destroy, and that we are not only enslaved, but are absolutely acquiescent in our bondage. For the present we shall leave the subject which we present gratis to the members of the Philosophical Society. Should they consent to avail themselves of the vast field which we have pointed out, we shall endeavour to labour in it ourselves at some future and indefinite period. I am, sir, etc., Salarius. Note. We were asked by a learned brother philosopher who saw this article in M.S. what we meant by alluding to rudimentary organs in machines. Could we, he asked, give any example of such organs? We pointed to the little protuberance at the bottom of the bowl of our tobacco pipe. This organ was originally designed for the same purpose as the rim at the bottom of a teacup, which is but another form of the same function. Its purpose was to keep the heat of the pipe from marking the table on which it rested. Originally, as we have seen in very early tobacco pipes, this protuberance was of a very different shape to what it is now. It was broad at the bottom and flat, so that while the pipe was being smoked, the bowl might rest upon the table. Use and disuse have here come into play, and served to reduce the function to its present rudimentary condition. That these rudimentary organs are rarer in machinery than in animal life is owing to the more prompt action of the human selection, as compared with the slower but even surer operation of natural selection. Man may make mistakes. In the long run, nature never does so. We have only given an imperfect example, but the intelligent reader will supply himself with illustrations. End of Darwin Among the Machines by Samuel Butler Recorded by Peter Eastman The Future of Journalism by William Thomas Stead. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. The Future of Journalism. The future of journalism is a large subject. It is but a thing of yesterday, but already it overshadows the world. The rustle of its myriad sheets, unfolded afresh every morning and folded forever at night, supplies a realistic fulfillment of one part of the old Norse saga of the ash tree Yggdrasil, whose roots were watered by the Norns, and on whose leaves were written the scenes of the life of man. It has part of the necessary garniture of the civilized man. The North Country Pitman said, quote, He felt quite naked-like without his dog. End quote. A man without a newspaper is half-clad, and imperfectly furnished for the battle of life. From being persecuted and then contemptuously tolerated, it has become the rival of organized governments. Will it become their superior? The future of journalism depends entirely upon the journalist. All that can be said is that it offers opportunities and possibilities of which a capable man can take advantage, superior to that of any other institution or profession known among men. But everything depends upon the individual, the person. Impersonal journalism is a feat. To influence men, you must be a man, not a mock-uttering oracle. The democracy is under no awe of the mystic we. Who is we, they ask, and they are right. For all power should be associated with responsibility, and a leader of the people, if a journalist, needs a neck capable of being stretched, quite as much as if he is a prime minister. For the proper development of a newspaper, the personal element is indispensable. There must be loyalty to the chief, far beyond the precincts of the editorial sanctum. Besides, as I shall presently explain, the personality of the editor is the essential center-point of my whole idea of the true journalism of the governing and guiding order, as distinguished from journalism of the mere critical or paragraph-quilting species. Where there is a combination of the two elements, the distinct personality of a competent editor, and the varied interests and influences of an ably conducted paper, it is not difficult to see that such an editor might, if he wished it, become the far most permanently influential Englishman in the empire. He would not govern the empire, but his voice would be the most potent among all those whose counsels guide the holders of our imperial scepter. He might not, quote, 
wield the will, the fierce democratic, end quote, but he would be the most authoritative interpreter of its wishes, and his influence, both upon the governed and the governors, would be incomparably greater than that of any other living man. And how would he attain this dizzy preeminence? He would be more powerful than any, simply because, better than any other, he would know his facts. Even now, with his imperfect knowledge of the facts, the journalist wields enormous influence. What would he be if he had so perfected the mechanism of his craft as to be master of the facts, especially of the dominant fact of all, the state of public opinion? At present, the journalistic assumption of uttering the opinion of the public is, in most cases, a hollow fraud. In the case of most London editors, absolutely no attempt is made to ascertain what Demos really thinks. Opinions are exchanged in the office, in the club, or in the drawing-room, but any systematic attempt to gauge the opinion, even of those whom he meets, there is none. As for the opinion of Londoners, outside the limited range of their personal acquaintance, that remains to them, as to everyone else, an inscrutable mystery. Outside London, everything of course is shrouded in even denser darkness. How many London editors, I wonder, ever look half a dozen times in the year, into the sheets of their provincial contemporaries? Yet not one of them will not undertake to pronounce offhand that public opinion will not tolerate this, or that public opinion insists on that. And all the while, they know as much about public opinion as of the private opinion of the Grand Lama. It is about time that imposture should cease. I am not, for a moment, advocating the more accurate and scientific gauging of public opinion, in order that blind obedience should be paid to its decision, when ascertained. Far from it. The first duty of every true man, if he believes that public opinion is mistaken, is to set himself to change it. But whether we regard public opinion as the supreme authority in faith, morals, and politics, or whether we merely regard it as so much force to be directed or absolutely checked, it is obviously of the first importance to know what it is that we have either to obey or to transform. But at present, who is there who studies public opinion? I do not say scientifically, but even intelligently. Here and there a statesman, a few newspaper men and wire pullers, but that is all. Nothing was more startling in 1880, and again in 1885, than the utter miscalculations of the cognoscenti as to the way in which popular feeling was going. In 1880 nearly all the Tories, whether members or editors, and more than one half of the Liberals, were quite sure that the general election would result in a Tory majority. In 1885 every Liberal, and very nearly every Tory, was certain that the country would return an overwhelming Liberal majority over the coalition of Tories and Parnellites. In 1880 Lord Beaconsfield calculated confidently on a majority of 37. Just before the polls opened in 1885, I received a private expostulation from a well-known Liberal, intimate with the leaders of the party, and one who had proved himself in 1880 a correct and careful reader of the signs of the times. Quote, I cannot understand, he wrote how you can think that there is any doubt about our obtaining a majority. I am quite sure of a minimum of fifty, over Tories and Parnellites combined. It may be seventy, but would probably have been a hundred, if Mr. Chamberlain had taken a sea voyage instead of taking to the stump. End quote. Even the ablest provincial editors were utterly at fault. So were liberal candidates down to the very close of the poll. This would not signify much, where the constituency was so evenly divided that the transfer of a hundred votes would turn the scale. But when editors and candidates and wire-pullers were all alike unconscious, that their ground had shifted under the feet, to the extent of the transfer of several thousand votes to the Tory camp, there is reason indeed to say, that other people besides the peers can be, up in a balloon, when it is most important that they should have their feet firmly planted on solid earth. The first step, therefore, that must be taken is to require touch with the public, and this, fortunately, is by no means difficult, although it requires some painstaking, and the institution of a very simple but effective organization. But surely, when there is hardly a creek or inlet all over the world, where soundings are not taken with the utmost care, and the results accurately set down in admiralty charts, it ought not be impossible to take the political soundings, from time to time, in every part of the United Kingdom in order that the administration may know when it is floating on a full tide of popularity, or when there is barely sufficient water under the keel to keep her from stranding. What, then, 
should be the organization of a newspaper office from this point of view in trying to answer this question i am neither so presumptuous as to attempt to describe the ultimate ideal nor am i so mendacious as to pretend that anything approaching to such a system of inquiry exists either on my own paper or on that of anyone else i offered the outline merely as the sketch of the aim which any journalist with a sense of the responsibilities of his position might have in view and which in time with patience he might attain first then the editor of a newspaper should either be personally acquainted with or should be surrounded by trustworthy assistants who are personally acquainted with everyone whose opinion has any weight on any subject with which he has to deal nor should it be mere acquaintance there should exist such relations of confidence as to render it possible for the editor to be put in possession of the views of any personage whose opinion he desires to know this of course is a work of time and even after many years the most successful editor must be content to know many of the most important personages at second hand but it is better to be intimate with the confidant of a minister than to be merely on friendly terms with the minister himself there are some ministers who never tell anything when their journalistic acquaintances seek for information others profess to tell everything and mislead the inquirer in every direction those ministers are very rare who make a confidant of an editor and still rarer are those who do not make a thoroughgoing support the condition of such confidences these terms are of course absolutely impossible no consideration whatever in the shape of exclusive and official information can compensate for the loss of the right of individuality of independence and of criticism one minister who will tell you all he knows is worth a dozen ministers who dole out information as if it were diamonds and even then leave out some vital item all that i contend is for instance that on any given occasion it ought to be possible for an editor to ascertain authentically in twenty-four hours the views of all cabinet ministers and ex-cabinet ministers in town not of course for publication but for his own guidance and the avoidance of mistakes at present that is impossible first because ministers trained in the old school have not yet learned the necessities of the new system and secondly because journalists do not as a rule take the trouble to cultivate the acquaintance with ministers necessary to keep themselves informed and what is true of ministers is true to a greater or less degree of ambassadors judges generals and great financiers nevertheless the duty of an editor is absolute he ought to be able to get at or know someone who can get at everyone from the queen downwards in order to be able to ascertain what they are thinking about the topic of the day this is not interviewing interviewing is the public this is the private phase of what after all must always be the primary department of journalism that of interrogation the least confusing of the two the case of matter spoken in private as if it were material for an interview would be fatal if the editor cannot be trusted to keep a secret if he betrays confidence the whole edifice collapses personal confidence is the foundation of the system as with the cabinet so with every other department of the government in church and state it ought to be known in every newspaper office exactly who ought to be seen upon every subject that crops up and who is the best man to see him in that respect the american newspapers are far ahead of those in europe although in justice to the old world it ought to be added that american editorials are often as conspicuously weak as their sub-editing is conspicuously strong in this respect the opportunities of london journalism are unequalled as you can buy anything in london so you can find someone who can tell you the best and latest news about anything that happens anywhere if you only knew where to look for him but they are not sought for nor are they picked up even when they pass you on the street hungry would-be pressmen come to every newspaper office vending unsaleable wares asking for work and all london teeming with subjects for good merchantable copy if they would but get up live facts from first-hand sources and give us the opinions of men who know all about the topic of the hour instead of the musty platitudinizing of third-rate essayists every newspaper ought to have its own whip for parliamentary purposes and he also must of necessity be in the house of commons by whip i mean one who does what the party whips often but perfunctorily perform ascertain the views and opinions of members on every topic before the public nor should he confine himself to either side the odd idea which many people have of journalism was shown in the resentment occasioned in some quarters by a newspaper circular of inquiry 
which was issued lately to members on the subject of the late reform bill many high and mighty gentlemen seem to regard it as an offence rather than as a compliment when a newspaper editor asked his counsel as to the best course to be taken in dealing with franchise and redistribution there is it is true one difficulty in the way of eliciting opinions from members as to the best course of future policy so many have none to elicit after their leader speaks their opinion is simply ditto until he speaks they have none at all there are taking it roughly probably not more than fifty members of the house who have independent opinions of any value and although in selecting policies and deciding as to rival expediencies it is noses which are counted a very little experience shows that the majority of the noses follow the lead of one or the other of the fifty of much more importance than the cultivation of the house of commons for after all the m p is a loudly vocal creature and there is not much difficulty in ascertaining his views the editor should know personally so as to be able to correspond confidentially with every one be he consul ambassador governor resident high commissioner or viceroy whose word stands for england's before the world many and many a time such confidential relations had they existed might have saved the empire from disaster if only because our representative abroad by such an arrangement could have made sure that public opinion would be aroused to the importance of a subject which could not be neglected without danger at the same time the colonial office was receiving his report at present too often public opinion is asleep and the colonial secretary thinks it is no use quote, in the present state of public opinion end quote, attempting to carry out a governor's or an ambassador's recommendations whereas public opinion would have been awake enough and eager if only the public had had the warning which slumbered unheeded in the official pigeonholes and so it should all go down the official hierarchy naval officers are forbidden to write for the press and it is necessary to get their ideas so about soldiers the rules of the metropolitan police are absurdly strict in forbidding the imparting of information which in all provincial towns is freely tendered to the press as a rule all voluntary organizations are only too glad to allow the press to inspect everything they have to show there is nothing in this demand that in any way supersedes the authority of the official hierarchy it only gives the public an additional and independent security for the efficiency of the public services i need not refer to the development of this system abroad there is only one blowitz and he is confined to one capital if the times had a soul and an individual who carried that soul about within his own skin he might be and indeed ought to be on more or less intimate terms with every statesman and sovereign in europe and once every year he should make the tour of the capitals to keep himself in touch with the men whose wills rule europe unfortunately the direction of the times seems to be distributed among many bodies and all of them together hardly seem to be able to muster a soul among them the ideal of the journalist should be to be universally accessible to know everyone and to hear everything the old idea of a jealously shrouded impersonality has given way to its exact antithesis of course if the personality of the editor is such as to detract from the usefulness of his writings he had better stick to the old plan but if the editor is a real man who has convictions and capacity to give them utterance in conversation as well as in print the more people he sees at first hand the better always provided that he leaves his mind open enough in the crowd to turn round on its own ground all that i have said concerning the london editor applies mutatis mutandis to his provincial brother the provincial editor has one enormous advantage over the londoner one among many he can cover the whole of his field he can make the personal acquaintance of every leading public man and of all the local leaders in every department of human activity from the mayor to the bellman they are all within his compass and as a rule if he makes it his business they are approachable enough it is difficult of course when there is keen sensitiveness on the part of a functionary whom it has been necessary to scourge in your paper and also in places where the party line is broad and deep i never found any difficulty however in being on excellent terms with my tory contemporaries in the north although neither side was accustomed to give or seek quarter in print it is a very simple thing and may be pooh-poohed as a truism but how much all the papers would be improved how much more influential they would be if before venturing to express the opinion of their respective peddlingtons little or big 
their readers knew that the writers had at least taken the trouble to ascertain at first hand what any other peddlingtonians really did think on the subject and how much more powerful because how much better informed if in discussing the topics of the town the editor was always behind the scenes the natural confidant and ready helper of all those who were endeavoring to serve the community this however is the mere a b c of the subject it is so obvious that whoever aspires to lead and guide must take counsel with those who have the daily drudgery of administration to do that there is no need to labor the point what is much less generally recognized is that the newspaper ought to be in close and direct touch with either extremity of the social system and with all intermediate grades there is something inexpressibly pathetic in the dumbness of the masses of the people touch but a hair on the head of the well-to-do and forthwith you hear his indignant protest in the columns of the times but the million who have to suffer the rudest buffets of ill fortune the victims of official insolence and the brutality of the better off they are as dumb as the horse which you may scourge to death without its uttering a sound newspapers will never really justify their claims to be the tribunes of the people until every victim of injustice whether it be a harlot run in by a policeman greedy for blackmail or a ticket of leave man hunted down by shadowy detectives or paupers balked of their legal allowance of skilly sends in to the editorial sanctum their complaint of the injustice which they suffer when men cease to complain of injustice it is as if they sullenly confess that god was dead when they neglect to lay their wrongs before their fellows it is as if they had lost all faith in the reality of that collective conscience of society which milton finally calls god's secretary for every appeal to the public is a practical confession of faith that shuts out despair when there is prayer there is hope to give utterance to the inarticulate moan of the voiceless is to let light into a dark place it is almost equivalent to the enfranchisement of a class a newspaper in this sense is a daily apostle of fraternity a messenger who bringeth glad tidings of joy of a great light that has risen upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death i do not say that the editors of the times and the daily news should be on visiting terms with the thieves of the seven dials and the harlots of the new cut but they should know those who can tell them what the dialonians feel and what the outcasts in the new cut suffer the jewish legend which longfellow has versified tells how sandalphon the angel of glory sandalphon the angel of prayer stands at the portals of heaven listening to all the sounds ceaselessly from the crowded earth all these petitions he collects and they turn into flowers in his hands as he presents them before the throne of jehovah the editor is the sandalphon of humanity into his ear are poured the cries the protests the complaints of men who suffer wrong and it is his mission to present them daily before the conscience of mankind but to do that he or those about him must be quote, a nerve o'er which do creep the else unfelt oppressions of mankind end quote. and he or they must be familiar with the wants the wrongs the sorrows of the outcast residue of the human race all that it will be said is idealistic visionary utopian but it is something to have an inspiring ideal and it is well to be reminded of the responsibilities that attend upon the power which has come to the journalist as an unexpected heritage from the decay and disappearance of the elder authorities of the bishop and the noble to be both eye and ear for the community is a great privilege but power no less than noblesse oblige and much may be done to realize it if it recognize that the discharge of such responsibilities lie in the day's work of the journalist it is of course manifestly impossible for overworked editors and hard-pressed reporters to undertake new duties without being relieved of some of their functions but in the large papers much might be done by rearranging duties and the substitution of this kind of work for others of a less indispensable description but i have not yet lost faith in the possibility of some of our great newspaper proprietors who will content himself with a reasonable fortune and devote the surplus of his gigantic profits to the development of his newspaper as an engine of social reform and as a means of government and if it be impossible for those already in the purple to display such public spirit then it may be that the same spirit which led pious founders in medieval times to build cathedrals and establish colleges may lead some man or woman of fortune to devote half a million to found a newspaper for the service for the education and for the guidance of the people supposing such a newspaper to be founded what would be the first step necessary to enable its conductor to gauge and at the same time to influence the opinion of the nation the necessity for establishing personal relations between the chief of the political 
social, and religious leaders of the people in the immediate vicinity of the newspaper office has already been referred to. But that helps but little towards placing the newspaper in confidential relations with the whole people. What, then, is the best and most effectual means of enabling the editor at the center to keep touch with the people at the circumference? Mere circulation will not avail. There is no London newspaper more circulated among North Country radicals than the Daily News, but the only expression of opinion ever heard up north about the Daily News is a groan over its feebleness and lack of grit. Circulation is all very well, and the larger circulation any newspaper has the better for its proprietor, but influence depends not half so much upon quantity as upon the quality of its subscribers. Newspapers with only ten or fifteen thousand circulation have often ten times as much influence as papers with two hundred thousand, the difference being in the character of the readers of the paper. Hence, if the object is to influence the politics of a town, it is better to be read regularly by ten men of the right sort than to circulate a thousand a day among the ordinary newspaper buyers. Democracy has not diminished in the least the power of individuals. It has, indeed, increased their influence by giving them a freer field for the exercise of their power. The secret of influence is to get at the right individuals in every town and village and to attach them as closely as possible to the newspaper by establishing personal relations between them and the directing staff. How to attain this end is the great problem. It is an end that cannot be reached at a bound, but by steady, patient, constant growth. There are, however, two methods by which a newspaper can work towards that end. The first is by a system of major generals, and the second is by a system of journalistic travelers. First, the system of major generals. When Cromwell was driven to undertake the governing of England, he mapped out the towns into districts, and over each district he placed a man after his own heart, responsible to him for the peace and good government of the district under his care. That system mutatis mutandis might be adopted, with advantage by a newspaper that wished to keep in hand the affairs of the whole country. A competent, intelligent, sympathetic man or woman, as nearly as possible the alter ego of the editor, should be planted in each district and held responsible for keeping the editor informed of all that is going on within that area that needs attending to, either for encouragement or for repression, or merely for observation and report. That, it will be said, is but a development under a new name of the existing system of resident reporters and local correspondents. That is a great recommendation. But the development is immense, so immense, in fact, that there would be the greatest difficulty in securing persons competent for the discharge of the duties of the post. But by themselves they would be helpless. They need to be supplemented by two agencies, one local, the other central. There is, probably, in every constituency in the land, some man or woman, keenly in sympathy with the governing ideas of the newspaper in question. That may be said concerning any newspaper which has a soul and a creed, and a man at the head of it who is not afraid to say, in clear accents of unmistakable sincerity, quote, This is the way, walk ye in it. End quote. In the newspaper whose organization I am sketching, there would be so many points of contact with the average Briton, that there would be no doubt at all that there would be many persons sufficiently in sympathy with the direction to feel honored by being asked to cooperate as voluntary unpaid associates with the editor. It would be the duty of the major general to select with the utmost care in each important center in his district one such associate who would undertake to cooperate with the central office in ascertaining facts in focusing opinion and generally in assisting the editor to ascertain the direct views of his countrymen there would be endless varieties among those who would act as associates it might be a squire or it might be a cobbler it might be the clergyman's daughter or a secularist news agent or a methodist reporter the one thing indispensable is that they are intelligent keenly interested in the general policy of the paper, and willing to take some trouble to contribute to its efficiency and to extend its power. To each of these associates there would be posted copies of the paper in recognition of their position and services, and in order to keep them in touch with the editorial mind. That is to say, from 600 to 1,000 persons scattered all over the United Kingdom would be placed on the free list, on condition they were willing to perform certain simple but very important duties. The first of these is to reply at once, when inquiry is made from the head office, first as to their own opinion upon any disputed point, and secondly, what they believe to be the general opinion of their neighbors. For instance, 
suppose that this system was in full working order in every newspaper office during the general election before last and mr chamberlain after the liberal reverses in the boroughs made a speech at leicester in which he said in effect that it was all mr gladstone's fault and that if the battle had been fought on his mr chamberlain's program there would have been a very different result next day a brief but conspicuously printed note would have appeared in a prominent position in the newspaper calling attention to this extraordinary expression of opinion and inquiring what well-informed persons throughout the country had to say as to the accuracy or otherwise of mr chamberlain's observation that day copies of that newspaper with the passage marked with a blue pencil would be posted in colored wrapper to every associate resident in the parliamentary borough within two days the editor would have on his desk replies from capable and intelligent observers in all parts of the kingdom verifying or correcting the statement of mr chamberlain each of these replies filled in for convenience or reference upon a printed form would state briefly somewhat as follows one in the borough of r if liberals had fought on radical program the tory majority would have been at least five hundred higher than it was about three hundred liberal churchmen would only vote for their candidate on condition he pledged himself not to vote for disestablishment the radical program as it was has cost hundreds of votes its official adoption would have been fatal the radicals voted all the same two that is the opinion of the liberal secretary the baptist ministers and generally of all those to whom i have spoken or the reply might not be so clear and precise one in the borough of l if the radical program had been adopted it would have put more fight into the radical ranks two have not had an opportunity of talking to many people on the subject the local papers attribute the defeat to the irish vote and the clergy all these replies would have to be carefully collated tabulated and entered up at the head office so that in three days at most the editor could lay his hand on trustworthy local information which would enable him to speak with authority and precision as to the facts in dealing with mr chamberlain's explanation of the liberal defeat or suppose that the famous three acres and a cow myth had to be cleared up a leaded notice stating clearly the nature of the charge brought against liberal candidates would be inserted and a request made to correspondents to state one whether in their locality they had heard any liberal candidate or liberal speaker make such a promise or any semblance of such a promise and if so when where and how and two had they heard anyone say that liberals in their district had been making such promises and if so what was the accusation this paragraph being marked the paper of that day would be sent to all associates in rural divisions in colored wrappers and before the end of the week complete returns would be available by which the grain of truth might be sifted out from the mass of fiction with which it was overlaid these instances alone will suffice as an illustration of the usefulness of establishing such a network of corresponding associates the expense would not be considerable there would be the free list and postages nothing more this however is but the first tentative approach to an exhaustive interrogation of public opinion in time when the associates become more familiar with their work and the competent and willing workers are ascertained to these might be entrusted the further and more delicate duty of collecting the opinions of those who form the public opinion of their locality each of these select associates would be expected to communicate directly or indirectly with representatives of all classes in the locality and to collect their opinion as exhaustively as the editor collects the opinions of the leading politicians in london in a provincial town for instance on a political question say whether or not a dissolution on the question of home rule would result for or against mr gladstone it would be necessary to ascertain the opinions of the local editors of the presidents secretaries and moving spirits in all the political associations of the leaders of trades unions friendly societies and working men's clubs of the sitting member of the candidate on the other side of the most active men in teetotal and other social propaganda of the leading ministers of all denominations and of the publicans whose taprooms are most frequented by local politicians besides these representatives of political forces it would be well to ascertain the opinions of the mayor the chairman of the board of guardians and of the school board of a leading magistrate of the largest employer of labor as well as that of cabmen policemen and a half a dozen persons selected at random in the lower social strata altogether in a large town it would be necessary on a large question like this 
to communicate with fifty persons in a smaller town about twenty suppose then that it was desired to forecast the possible consequences of such a dissolution the newspaper would publish an article clearly setting forth the importance to both parties of gauging as closely as possible the state of public opinion on the question and placing as fully as possible the pros and cons of the question before the reader as many copies of these would be sent down by train to each of the select associates as he had names on his list and by him the papers would be marked addressed and sent out with a circular calling attention to the inquiry and asking the recipient to fill in and return a brief form of reply to the questions asked which would be enclosed stamped and addressed of course at first most of those appealed to would take no notice of the request they would have to be approached personally through their friends and even then the response would be very imperfect but before long the practice would be recognized and people would answer freely enough in a fortnight the answers would be in they would be collated tabulated and sent to the central office the enormous importance of a system which enabled the editor of a london paper and of course on a smaller scale the editor of a provincial paper to know at a glance the opinions say even of the presidents and secretaries of the political associations throughout the land are too obvious to be dwelt upon by degrees as the returns became more complete the journalist would speak with an authority far superior to that possessed by any other person for he would have been the latest to interrogate the democracy he would have the last word of the leaders of the electors upon the question of the hour he would in fact for the first time be able to say with authority the opinion of the public on this subject is averse or favorable to the proposed scheme this is an extreme case involving the maximum of trouble and application to the greatest possible number of persons in most cases the number of such inquiries would be much smaller the select associate or deputy major general would have to keep himself well informed as to who were the best authorities on all subjects and apply to them accordingly sometimes there may be only two persons or one in a whole town whose opinion is wanted it will be his duty to send that one a newspaper marked and call upon him in due course by this cooperation between a newspaper and selected readers it will be possible to focus the information and experience latent among our people as it has never been done before and to take an immense stride towards the realization of the conscious government of all by all in the light of the wisdom of the best informed the mere fact that in every town a score of persons from the mayor to the bellman were certain to be called upon as a matter of course to express a deliberate opinion upon social or political problems before a leading journalist ventured to declare what was the public opinion of the nation would have an incalculable influence in vivifying our democracy in compelling thought and in quickening popular interest and public questions that however is by no means the only duty that would be required from the hands of the volunteer deputy major generals once or twice a year sometimes oftener sometimes not so often a crisis may arise in which it is urgently necessary that the cabinet and the house of commons should be presented with an unmistakable demonstration of what the opinion of the people really is such an occasion arose during the bulgarian crisis in eighteen seventy six and when the criminal law amendment bill was in danger july before last whenever such a time arrived it would be the duty of a deputy major general to take steps to secure public expression of the popular feeling he or it might be she might not be able to attend a public meeting much less speak at one but they could nevertheless set one going by setting the right people in motion a requisition to the mayor in all cases where opinion is tolerably unanimous the best method of procedure would secure a free and open expression of the general feeling information explaining the issues before the country could be obtained from the central office and the question could be freely and fully put before the democracy and an opportunity afforded it of expressing its convictions on the question of the hour the weakness of government by public meetings is that there is so often no one to give the thing a start in the first place and to keep interest up until the meeting is held in the second there is also the difficulty about the expenses which in all cases should be met by a public collection the meetings of the democracy should surely be self-supporting under the proposed scheme the local deputy would be the live coal which sets the place ablaze and he would be able to have at command exactly the kind of information needed for the locality just imagine the consequences under our present system of government of an arrangement by which a leading newspaper 
convinced that the government was pursuing a policy contrary to the general wishes of the community, was able to issue a three-line whip to its representatives, which would secure the holding of a public meeting in every town hall in the country, in order to express the popular view. For be it noted, that this is entirely different from the ordinary notion of getting up meetings by Birmingham wire pullers or provincial caucuses. The local deputy would have neither funds nor machinery at his disposal with which to force a semblance of popular opinion. He would merely take the indispensable first step to enable local opinion to express itself and see that those who wished for information had it supplied them freely. No more simple and effective method of educating the democracy in the functions of citizenship could be imagined, and yet how could it possibly be worked so cheaply and so efficiently as from the office of a great daily newspaper? Each of the major generals would have a general oversight of all the associates in his division, but the whole organization would be kept together, and the personal sense of a common interest kept up by the periodic visits of the journalistic traveler. What an irony there is in the care and expense which men go to when all that is involved is the accumulation of a little money, and the negligence and parsimony which they display when the matter at stake is the direction of the affairs of an empire. There is not a shabby little wholesale house that sells ribbons in the city which does not send out, at least every year, its traveller, to all the retail houses in the land. These travellers are the indispensable nexus between the manufacturer and the seller. Goods are made or left unmade according to their reports, for they feel the pulse of the buyer. But there is not a newspaper in the land which takes as much trouble to ascertain the social and political fashion in vogue in great centres like Nottingham and Glasgow that these poor bagmen take to ascertain the pattern and colours of ribbon favoured by the fishwives of colour coats or the factory lasses of Oldham. Not until we introduce something of commercial common sense and the practical method of business into the profession of journalism will we even have begun to fulfil our role as exponents of public opinion. The journal, then, which essays to enter into the dominion, open to the first comer, must engraft the traveller upon its system of organization. It must have at least two constantly on the road, each the perambulating alter ego, as far as is possible, of the editor at the centre, filled with his central fire, saturated with his ideas, and with a clear grasp of the system here sketched out. These peripatetic apostles of the new journalism would make it their duty to visit the associates in every town to infuse into each a sense of the importance of the common work, and to make every one feel that he or she is an important and indispensable part of the system. By this means, full and accurate knowledge would be secured of each associate, the indifferent could be dropped, suggestions could be interchanged, and, in short, the whole organization made alive, and instinct with a common interest and a common enthusiasm. If this was done, and of course this is merely the crudest and most imperfect outline of what would be necessary, the newspaper that was so worked would be much the most powerful and one of the most useful institutions in the country. No doubt, it will be replied, but it is all utopian. Where are you going to get your associates and your deputy volunteer major generals? Your major generals you may get, and your glorified bagmen, for you will pay for them, but the others. And without the others, where is your scheme? Now, I freely and fully admit that without the others my scheme is nowhere. But I do not for a moment admit that it is utopian, or impracticable, to expect the active intelligent voluntary cooperation of at least one capable man or woman, in each town, who will do all that I have stated I should require from the associates and the deputy major generals, and the reason for my confidence is that I believe it is quite possible to evoke, on the part of Englishmen and Englishwomen, at least one-tenth as much self-sacrificing zeal for the welfare of the commonwealth as is now called out as a matter of course in the service of a municipality or in the interest of a sect i believe that just as cromwell found the secret of his new model in enlisting in the parliamentary men who put a conscience to their work so it is possible for the editor to enlist in the service of the state a picked body of volunteers who will work as hard for england in the field of public and corrective action as others do in the service of their sects. It is a new field that is opened up, a new field, and a most tempting one, for it offers to the capable man or woman opportunities of public usefulness, at present beyond his utmost dreams, and while apparently making them the humble interrogators of democracy, in reality enrolls them as indispensable members of the greatest spiritual and educational and governing agency 
which england has yet seen such a newspaper would indeed be a great secular or civic church and democratic university and if wisely directed and energetically worked would come to be the very soul of our national unity and its great central idea would be that of the self-sacrifice of the individual for the salvation of the community the practical realization of the religious idea in national politics and social reform that we see realized in a thousand ways by the noble and devoted men and women who spend every hour of their leisure in volunteering to save the souls of their fellow men it is a vain hope now that democracy is fairly established amongst us and we are beginning to realize how much can be done by collective associated national efforts to assist the individual in toiling up that quote, infinite ascending spiral traced by the finger of god between the universe and the ideal end quote, that willing and intelligent workers will be found in every town and every village in the land who would be eager to devote themselves to the unpaid service the first beginnings of which i have endeavored perfectly to outline it may be that the time has not yet come although to my eager eye the field is ripe unto the harvest it may be that the editor is not yet born who is destined thus to organize the new journalism and take this vast new stride in the direction of intelligent and conscious self-government but unless our race is destined to decay both the editor and the occasion are certain to arrive parliament has attained its utmost development there is need of a new representative method not to supersede but to supplement that which exists a system which will be more elastic more simple more direct and more closely in contact with the mind of the people other than that the groundwork of which is already supplied by the press i see no system not even a suggestion of a system and when the time does arrive and the man and the money are both forthcoming government by journalism will no longer be a somewhat hyperbolic phrase but a solid fact it may not be the lot of the editor who establishes that system to fulfill lowell's remark about cromwell quote, who lived to make his simple oaken chair more grandly terrible than throne of england's king before or since End quote. but if he worthily fulfills the duty of his high office then nowhere on this planet will there be such a seat of far extended influence and world-shaping power as the chair from which that editor in directing the policy of his paper will influence the destinies of the english race William Thomas Stead End of The Future of Journalism Government by Journalism by William Thomas Stead This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Government by Journalism. Government by kings went out of fashion in this country when Charles Stuart lost his head. Government by the House of Lords perished with Gatton and Old Sarum. Is it possible that government by the House of Commons may equally become out of date? Without venturing into the dim and hazardous region of prophecy, it is enough to note that the trend of events is in that direction. Government tends ever downward nations become more and more impatient of intermediaries between themselves and the exercise of power the people are converting government by representatives to government by delegates if a deputy or a member votes against the wishes of his constituents he is denounced as a usurper even if he be not cashiered as a traitor side by side with this ever strengthening tendency may be observed a scientific development rendering possible the realization of the popular aspirations the world has perceptibly shrunk under the touch of stevenson and faraday of hoe and of edison if we like the germans had been in the habit of marking our milestones by time instead of distance this would be much more easily realized we are all next-door neighbors if anyone raise his voice it is audible from aberdeen to plymouth hence science has realized for us in the nineteenth century the ancient wit and nigamut of our early english ancestors our parliaments gradually developed out of the folksmoot of the german village in which every villager was free to speak and free to vote in theory at least in its early days every freeman could attend the national witten it was only as the territory widened over which citizens of the commonwealth were scattered and their numbers swelled to a multitude far beyond the area of earshot that the system of delegation sprang up which as its latest development has produced the recently elected house of commons 
in some of the more primitive swiss cantons the ancient custom still prevails and the whole adult democracy is summoned by sound of horn to debate and decide the affairs of the rustic commonwealth in england we seem to be reverting to the original type of english institutions the telegraph and the printing press have converted great britain into a vast agora or assembly of the whole community in which the discussion of the affairs of state is carried on from day to day in the hearing of the whole people the discussion is carried on daily but the new witten can only vote authoritatively once in six years as it usually votes alternately in opposite lobbies it is obvious that the house of commons is often out of harmony with the nation which it represents but the repeal of the septennial act is no longer a plank in the radical platform triennial parliaments are out of fashion a representative assembly that has ceased to represent its constituents has lost its raison d'etre. It is a usurpation based on fraud. It is endured, and the demand that once was energetically urged for more frequent elections has died away. The reason, probably, is that, although the authority of a house which has ceased to represent the people is a despotism, it is a despotism tempered by the press and the platform. That is to say, in other words, that the absolutism of the elected assembly is controlled and governed by the direct voice of the electors themselves. The press and the platform, of course, do not mean the printed words of a new sheet or the wooden planks of a platform. They are merely expressions used to indicate the organs by which the people give utterance to their will, and the growth of their power is indicative of the extent to which the nation is taking into its own hands the direct management and control of its own affairs the secret of the power of the press and of the platform over the house of commons is the secret by which the commons control the peers and the peers in their turn control the king they are nearer to the people they are the most immediate and most unmistakable exponents of the national mind their direct and living contact with the people is the source of their strength the house of commons elected once in six years may easily cease to be in touch with the people a representative may change his mind in one direction, his constituency may change its mind in another, and they may gradually lose all points of contact with each other, beyond the subscriptions, which fail not, until they have as little in common as Mr. Parnell and the citizens of London. The member immediately after his election leaves his constituency, and plunges into a new world with different atmosphere, moral, social, and political. But an editor, on the other hand, must live among the people, whose opinions he essays to express. It is true that some papers in the provinces are edited from London, and with what result? That, speaking broadly, the London edited news sheet is a mere news sheet, without weight, influence, or representative character. Of all driveling productions, commend us to the provincial leader written in Fleet Street. The editor must keep in touch with his readers. He must interest, or he ceases to be read. He must, therefore, often sorely against his will, write on topics about which he cares nothing, because if he does not, the public will desert him for his rival across the street. This, which in one sense is a degrading side of journalism, is in another a means of preservation and safety. A newspaper must palpitate with actuality, it must be a mirror reflecting all the ever-varying phases of life in the locality. Hence it represents a district as no member can, for, whereas he may be a stranger, selected at a crisis to say ditto to mr gladstone or to lord salisbury on some issue five years dead and gone the newspaper although as mr morley says it to-day is and to-morrow is cast into the oven is a page from the book of life of the town in which it appears a valuable transcript of yesterday's words thoughts and deeds it is constantly up to date the day before yesterday is as the date of the deluge editors alone of mortals live up to the apostolic injunction, and, forgetting the things that are behind, ever press forward to those which are before. The journalist is constantly an evidence. Constituencies sometimes forget they have a member. If they, even for one week, forgot they had a paper, that paper would cease to exist. The member speaks in the name of a community by virtue of a mandate conferred on poll days, when a majority of the electors, half of whom may have subsequently changed their minds, marked a cross opposite his name. The editor's mandate is renewed day by day, and his electors register their vote by a voluntary payment of the daily pence. There is no limitation of age or sex. Whosoever has a penny has a vote, 
nor is there any bribery or corruption possible in that extended constituency which cast its votes and its coppers every morning or every evening in the working days of the week nor must there be forgotten the reflex influence of the editor on his constituency for the purpose of moulding a constituency into his own way of thinking the editor has every advantage on his side an m p even if he be loquacious cannot make as many speeches in the session as the editor writes articles in a week and the editor prints every word and spreads it abroad before his vast congregation with quote, never a noddler among them all end quote, as mr lowell observes in his admirable preface to the pious editor's creed while the member addresses half-empty benches and his speech is mangled by unappreciative reporters for one-third of a year parliament is in recess the chamber of the press is never closed it is in perpetual session for parliament is merely a part of the machinery of government the newspaper is that and more besides it has become a necessity of life but the importance of the newspaper as a substitute for the house of commons is but partially due to the utterances of its editor its reports are often more valuable than its leaders lord salisbury proclaimed seven years ago that the special correspondent was superseding the editor chiefly because he was nearer to the things which people wished to see the press is at once the eye and the ear and the tongue of the people it is the visible speech if not the voice of the democracy it is the phonograph of the world on its columns are printed the spoken words of yesterday and it is constantly becoming more and more obvious that the importance of a spoken word depends chiefly upon the certainty of its getting itself printed mr gladstone's midlothian speeches of eighteen seventy nine to eighteen eighty would have fallen comparatively powerless if they had only been addressed to the people of pennycook and west calder a great speech is now delivered in the hearing of all the nation the orator ostensibly addresses a couple of thousand who cheer and hear he is in reality speaking to the millions who will read his speech the next morning at breakfast the growth of the power of the platform is largely the creation of the press if a statesman now wants to impress the nation the last place in the world where he will make his speech is in parliament because in no place will it be worse reported epoch making speeches are nowadays all delivered on the stump the public only cares for what it hears no one knows what goes on after twelve o'clock in parliament and no one cares why because the newspapers do not report late sittings debates between twelve and three might be conversations in a government department for anything that the country knows about them if questions were taken at the end of the sitting they would dwindle the house is chiefly useful because it secures the reporting of both sides of debates which otherwise would not be reported unless the debaters were men of front rank for the press has a closure of its own which it mercilessly enforces and few there be that can escape from it in one respect it must be obvious even to the most careless observer that the press has become to the commons what the commons were to the lords the press has become the chamber of initiative no measure ever gets itself into shape as a rule before being debated many times as a project in the columns of the newspapers all changes need to pass as a preliminary through this first tribunal of popular opinion not until it has been pretty well threshed out in the press does a proposal of reform come to be read a first time in the house of commons this power of initiation it has been secured by natural right for in its free and open halls the voice of the poorest and humblest can be heard if so be that a man can think a thought and frame that thought in intelligible english with sufficient brevity to escape the radamanthus in whose eyes excessive length is a vice going before to judgment justifying summary execution without benefit of clergy he can make himself heard if not in one paper then in another there is no such democratic debating place as the columns of the press provided of course the debater does not too rudely assail the great unwritten conventions which govern respectable journalism for journalism in the possession of superstitions also is not unlike parliament there are of course papers and papers there are papers of business papers of advertisement papers of sport papers of opinion and papers of power it takes all sorts to make up a world and there is as much diversity in journalists as in members of parliament but all of them go together to make the fourth estate which is becoming more powerful than all the other estates of the realm great is the power of the printed word 
This, as Victor Hugo's hero says in Notre Dame, pointing first to the printed page, and then to the soaring towers of the great cathedral, quote, this will destroy that, end quote. Notre Dame has survived Caxton for many centuries, and Parliament will continue to meet in the midst of a newspaper age, but it will be subordinate. The wielders of real power will be those who are nearest to the people. Statesmanship among Parliament men is becoming every day more and more what Mr. Matthew Arnold described eighteen years ago as the mere cult of the jumping cat. Even the duty of twisting the tail of that influential dictator of our destinies is regarded as superfluous. Leadership, in the sense of the science of leading, is reduced to a mere striking of the average. Mr. Gladstone, who might have been a leader in the better sense, has laid it down as a political maxim that, quote, the most important duty of a leader is to ascertain the average opinions of his party and largely to give effect to them, end quote. That is opportunism reduced to a system in which the leaders are the led and the rulers the servants of the ruled. It is the new and unexpected rendering of the old text, quote, if anyone would be chief among you, let him be the servant of all, end quote. But how will the cat jump? That is a problem inscrutable as the decrees of fate. If the British householder only knew his own mind, the task might be possible, but when the wielder of that scepter is himself befogged, how then? Then the Parliament man, straining his eyes through the murky darkness, anxiously interrogating the vague forms which loom through the mist, turns eagerly to the journalists for light and guidance. They are often but blind guides. To them, also the oracles are often dumb, but they are at least nearer the Delphic cave, whence issue of fateful words of fortune or of doom, and none but those behind the scenes can realize the weight which newspapers sometimes possess in deciding issues of vital import. To the devout worshipper of opinion, a newspaper article is often accepted as decisive, as was the flight of birds at an auspicious moment by an ancient augur. But it must be at that auspicious moment. The same article, or a hundred such, a week earlier or a week later, would pass unheeded. The importance which the press possesses as a gauge of public opinion might be enormously increased. But even now it is immense. Mr. Trevelyan's description of the British stationmaster as a being who feared nothing under the heavens save the daily press may be applied literally to some of our most prominent and self-opinionated statesmen. It is a guide to their path and a lamp to their feet, and some who profess the greatest contempt for its utterances cower most abjectly under its lash. This springs from the position in which they are placed. What is there to guide a prudent politician as to the depth of water under his keel? By elections, if there are enough of them, and if they are studied comparatively, with due regard to the antecedents of the constituency, are undoubtedly the best help in taking political soundings. Some day, if Parliament regains its authority, so far as to make the democracy anxious to keep it in tune with the constituencies, a series of periodical by-elections will be arranged for, at stated intervals, in order to enable representatives to test the rising or the falling of political feeling in the country. But by-elections at present only occur at haphazard, and members perversely refuse to die just when a few elections would be most useful. Private letters from constituents are a most untrustworthy test. Those who need them the most are least likely to receive them, and members have often pointed to their empty letter bag as a proof that there was no feeling on the subject. Within a few weeks of such manifestation of the reality of the feeling on the subject as to deprive them of their seats. It was so in the Publican Revolt of 1874, and with the Anti-Turkish Revolt in 1876 to 1880, and it was so at the late election, on the questions of fair trade and disestablishment. Public meetings, it will be said, are superior even to newspapers as exponents of public feeling. It is true, because a public meeting is the direct utterance of the voice of Demos without any intermediary. There is nothing in England so powerful as a series of public meetings. But public meetings cannot always be sitting. Their effect, although enormous and immediate, is evanescent. It is only when the popular mind is very excited that spontaneous meetings can be held, and hitherto the attempt to get up meetings by wire pullers at Birmingham and elsewhere has not been a conspicuous success. Equally untrustworthy is the caucus as a test of the opinion of the constituency. The caucus represents, as a rule, the fighting men-at-arms of the party. 
it is probably elected by a fraction of its own party and it is always of necessity more political and more partisan than the body in whose name it speaks hence members anxious to know how public feeling is going are driven back upon the newspapers but what newspapers that depends upon the member each chooses his own oracle as a rule the liberals look to the provincial the conservatives to the metropolitan press but the odd thing is that while members are frequently swayed from side to side by the utterances of the provincial press it is a rare exception for any of them to study that press intelligently they are dependent for the most part upon the more or less fragmentary excerpts from the rural oracles which the london papers dignify with the title of epitome of opinion the swing of the ministerial pendulum has been frequently decided by those extracts which in times of crisis are much more influential with both parties but especially with the liberals than any london editorials yet although politicians will lavish thousands in order to carry a single seat the comparative study of the signs on which a dozen seats may depend is left to haphazard or the arbitrary selection of a vehement opponent of the ministerial policy another curious thing is the way in which prominent men are encouraged or depressed by seeing in print praise or abuse of schemes which they have in hand a minister who has some little social reform which he wants to push gets a friend to buttonhole a few journalists and to induce them to insert paragraphs or articles in favor of his proposal if he succeeds and the notice appears the minister will pick up new courage and renew his efforts to pass the bill declaring in all honesty that he is encouraged to do so by the fact that quote, public opinion has spoken in its favor end quote. all the while he is perfectly well aware that the so-called public opinion was nothing but the printed reproduction of his own words transmitted through a friend to an obliging human phonograph the echo of human voice imparted a confidence nothing else was able to secure i remember on one occasion being confidently approached by a permanent official who holds a high place in an important department he was a personal friend and he spoke freely he wanted me to write an article praising a certain act connected with his department against which some interested clamor was being raised why just now i asked quote, to stiffen the back of my chief he replied he does not want to surrender but he needs backing up and if you could see your way to publish a rouser he would pluck up courage enough to put his foot down end quote. as i wanted him to put his foot down i wrote the rouser and soon afterwards had the satisfaction of knowing that it had had the desired effect the minister knew nothing of the communication that had been made to me but without that communication and the action which followed he would have given way and mischief which he regarded even more seriously than i did would have ensued specially affecting the department for which he was answerable every newspaper man of any standing will probably be able to cap this story by others of the same kind in which a newspaper has as it were the casting vote in the decision of state business although ministers fear the press and obey the press even when they most abuse it it has hardly dawned upon the ministerial intelligence that it is worth while to tune the organ to whose piping they have so often to dance queen elizabeth wiser in her day and generation took care to tune her pulpits instead of denouncing a temporizing press statesmen would find it more convenient to take its conductors into their confidence so far at least as the imparting of confidential information necessary to enable them to criticize intelligently a policy which without such guidance they might on the facts open to them believe they were bound to oppose they are constantly telling us that without public opinion they can do nothing but they forget that public opinion is the product of public education and that the first duty of a statesman is not to wait on public opinion but to make it it is not only that there is no communication but that often the information given is absolutely misleading and ministerial journalists painfully persist in advocating policies and putting forward hypotheses which are utterly incompatible with the line which ministers have determined to take without going so far as to maintain that the prime minister who has to communicate every day what passes in parliament to her majesty should be equally communicative to those who wield a power in the state immeasurably greater than that which still clings round the phantom of monarchy it would from the point of view of self-interest be good policy for a minister in an important crisis when public speech is impossible to see to it that public opinion is not led astray 
from sheer lack of knowledge of the vital facts which govern the situation. Of course, there are journals which sometimes receive information more or less surreptitiously, and these communications are sometimes regarded as bribes. Item, so many tips, per contra, so much support. The average ministerial conception of the service which organs of public opinion should render to their party is the exact antithesis to the service which a newspaper can render. The soundly liberal newspaper that merits ministerial favor is held to be the newspaper which most servilely says ditto to every ministerial dictum. The minister utters the word. Great in his opinion should be the company of those who publish it. The result is that some journalists, reputed to have brains and the reflective and critical appendages thereof, never exercise them, except on matters concerning which ministers have made no ex cathedra deliverance, and their comments, everyone knows beforehand, will be nothing more than a long, drawn-out note of admiration and approval. That is party journalism in its most dangerous and most worthless sense. The Swiss peasant, who at selected spots in alpine valleys, sounds a lusty note upon his alpine horn, with a keen eye to the copper of some passing tourist, wakes the echoes of his native hills in much the same fashion that Mr. Gladstone, or Lord Salisbury, rouses the responses of these obedient editors, from Land's End to John O'Groats. But the shepherd of the hills knows that the reverberation which rolls from crag to crag, and leaps from peak to peak, is but the prolonged echo of his own blast. It is reserved for English statesmen to palm off upon themselves, and upon the public, the journalistic echoes of their own voice, sent back by the party clack, as the utterances of an independent judgment happily coinciding with their own. A fatal nemesis attends this subservient journalism. Its anxiety to fawn deprives its idol of the advantage of friendly but independent criticism, and a minister presiding over a divided cabinet sees with dismay, that over-anxious loyalty to himself often leads his zealous sycophants to exalt into a stereotyped article of party faith, a compromise to which he had most reluctantly consented, to tide over a temporary crisis in the hope of speedily reverting to a truer path. Great as is the power of journalism in its present undeveloped and rudimentary stage, it may yet become a much greater power in the state. Whether it will take advantage of its opportunities or not cannot at present be seen. The future of journalism depends almost entirely upon the journalist, and at present the outlook is not very hopeful. The very conception of journalism as an instrument of government is foreign to the mind of most journalists. Yet, if they could but think of it, the editorial pen is a scepter of power, comparable with which the scepter of many a monarch is but a gilded lath. In a democratic age, in the midst of a population which is able to read, no position is comparable for permanent influence and far-reaching power to that of an editor who understands his vocation. In him are vested almost all the attributes of real sovereignty. He has almost exclusive rights of initiative, he retains a permanent right of direction, and, above all, he better than any man is able to generate that steam, known as public opinion, which is the greatest force of politics. In the realm of political dynamics he has only one rival. The platform is more powerful than the press, partly because by its reports the press is a great sounding board for the platform, and also because more men with faith, which after all is the only real force, go upon the platform than upon the press. Over the platform, the press has great and arbitrary powers. It is within the uncontrolled discretion of every editor, whether any speech delivered in the previous twenty-four hours shall or shall not come to the knowledge of his readers. No censor in France under the Empire, or in Russia today, exercises more absolute authority than English journalists. They decide what their readers shall know, or what they shall not know. This power of closure is enormous. One man is a favorite with the press, and his speeches are reported in the first person. Another man has offended the reporters or the editor, and his remarks are cut down to a paragraph. Sometimes considerations of discipline are held to justify this boycotting, at other times, not. I am glad to say, to any considerable extent, it is decreed on grounds of personal spite or party vindictiveness. Every editor is familiar with the efforts made to induce him to give speakers or meetings good reports, and the degree of importance attached to it, by those who wish to be reported, is a fair measure of the power wielded by the editorial procrustes. But a journalist can not only exercise an almost absolute power of closure, both upon individuals and upon causes, he has also the power of declaring urgency for subjects on which he is interested. 
he can excite interest or allay it he can provoke public impatience or convince people that no one need worry themselves about the matter every day he can administer either a stimulant or a narcotic to the minds of his readers and if he is up to his work and is sufficiently earnest himself he can force questions to the front which but for his timely aid would have lain dormant for many a year of course no journalist is omnipotent and even the most powerful journalist cannot influence those who do not read his paper but within the range of his circulation and readers of course are much more numerous than subscribers he may be more potent than any other man the damnable iteration day after day of earnest conviction wears like the dropping of water upon the stone no other voice sounds daily in their ears quote, this is the way walk thee in it end quote. and it is not in one man's ears but in his neighbors and his neighbors until the whisper of the printed word seems to fill the very air even though they dissent they have to reckon with it they know the man in the train or on the omnibus or in the restaurant has been listening to that unspoken voice the very arguments which you reject and the illustrations which seem to you misleading are a bond of union between you and him so much common ground upon which you meet even though you meet to differ not only can he generate driving force to force measures and force them through obstacles otherwise insuperable the journalist can also decide upon the priority of those measures the editorial hercules is always besought by so many mud-stuck wagoners to help them out of the slough of official opposition and public indifference that he has abundant opportunity of selection of course there are some causes dead as queen anne which all the king's horses and all the king's men could not bring to life again but other things being equal or nearly equal it is the voice of the press which usually decides which should be taken first i am not sure that this prerogative is one of the most important attributes of the journalistic power although it is one which is perhaps least appreciated among journalists themselves as a profession our ideal is deplorably low everyone is familiar with thackeray's famous picture of the multifarious activities of a great newspaper one of whose emissaries is pricing cabbages in covent garden while another is interviewing sovereigns at foreign capitals the pricing of cabbages is a useful and indispensable although humble department of journalistic activity but judging from the editorials of many newspapers the man who prices the cabbage seems to have been employed to direct the policy of the state in every profession to which has been entrusted the spiritual guidance of mankind there have ever been some mutton-loving shepherds who cared for the fleece in the flesh rather than the welfare of the flock which they tended but a church must indeed have gone rotten before its leading ministers publicly avowed so degrading an ideal of their high vocation yet journalists who frankly avow what is called the bread-and-butter theory of their craft are unfortunately but too common and from such a course nothing can be expected water cannot rise beyond its own level and the highest journalism is never above the high water mark of the faith and intellect of the individual journalist it has been openly asserted not long ago that a journalist is neither a missionary nor an apostle knowing as i do that it is given to journalists to write the only printed matter on which the eyes of the majority of englishmen ever rest from monday morning till saturday night i cannot accept any such belittling limitation of the duties of a journalist we have to write afresh from day to day the only bible which millions read poor and inadequate though our printed pages may be they are for the mass of men the only substitute that the progress of civilization has provided for the morning and evening service with which a believing age began and ended the labors of the day the newspaper too often the newspaper alone lifts the minds of men wearied with daily toil and dulled by carking care into a higher sphere of thought and action than the routine of the yardstick or the slavery of the plowshare the journalist may regard himself as but the keeper of a peep show through which men may catch glimpses of the great drama of contemporary life and history but he is more than that or rather there are before him possibilities of much higher things than that if as sometimes happens the editor is one who lives not merely in the past and present but also in the future to whom nothing is so real or so vivid or so constantly present in his mind as the high ideal of quote, an earth unwithered by the foot of wrong a race revering its own soul sublime end quote. then upon him surely there is compulsion laid to speak of that in whose presence he dwells and ever and anon 
in the midst of the whirl of politics and the crash of war, to give his readers those golden glimpses of to be, which in every age have revived the failing energies and cheered the fainting hearts of mortal men. If that is being a missionary and an apostle, then a journalist must sometimes be both missionary and apostle, although to my thinking his vocation is more analogous to that of those ancient prophets, whose leaders, on the current politics of Judea and Samaria three millenniums ago, are still appointed to be read in our churches. It is to be feared too often to but little purpose. But it is not of the prophetic aspect of journalism that I would speak at present, not of the journalist as the preacher, so much as of the journalist as ruler. To rule, the very idea begets derision from those whose one idea of their high office is to grind out so much copy, to be only paid for according to quantity, like sausages or rope yarn. Bunyan's man with the muckrake has many a prototype on the press. To dress contemporary controversy day by day in the jacket of party, to serve up with fresh sauce of current events the hackneyed commonplaces of politics, that in their eyes is journalism. But to rule, yet an editor is the uncrowned king of an educated democracy. The range of his power is limited only by the extent of his knowledge, the quality rather than the quantity of his circulation, and the faculty and force which he can bring to the work of government. I am but a comparatively young journalist, but I have seen cabinets upset, ministers driven into retirement, laws repealed, great social reforms initiated, bills transformed, estimates remodeled, programs modified, acts passed, generals nominated, governors appointed, armies sent hither and thither, war proclaimed and war averted, by the agency of newspapers. There were, of course, other agencies at work, but the dominant impulse, the original initiative, and the directing spirit in all these cases must be sought in the editorial sanctum, rather than in Downing Street. Quote, Take care of that Pall Mall Gazette, end quote, said Mr. Gladstone in 1874, jokingly, to a conservative minister. Quote, it upset me. Take care lest it does not upset you. End quote. And what Mr. Gladstone said in joke of the influence wielded by Mr. Greenwood, other ministers have said in bitter earnest of other editors. Of course, one great secret of the power of the press is that it brings its influence to bear upon divided cabinets and distracted ministers. When a cabinet is all at six and sevens, without seeing any way of harmonizing the antagonistic sections, a clear and decided stand taken by a powerful journal outside is often able to turn the balance in its own direction. The journalist who is able, thus, to throw the sword of Brennus into the scale, necessarily exercises more real influence than anyone outside the cabinet, and oftener than many a minister inside that mystic circle. So well is this recognized, that occasions are not rare in which cabinet ministers have, more or less, openly allied themselves with an editor, relying upon the accession of force thus gained outside the cabinet, to enable them to operate with greater power within. Only those who have been within that mystic circle know how little opportunity is afforded any cabinet minister, except the premier and one or two more, of expressing any opinion on subjects outside his own department. On any question of the first magnitude, every minister, of course, has a voice, even if he has nothing more, but upon any other question he has hardly even that. Any man with the instinct of government in him, and a wide general interest in all departments of the state, will find, unless of course he can rise to be prime minister, or next to the prime minister, much more scope for his ambition in the chair of a first-class journal than at the desk of a second- or third-rate cabinet minister. And even, as compared with the office that is highest of all, that of prime minister, such an editor would have to think twice, and even thrice, before changing places with its occupant. He has two great advantages over the premier. He does not go out of power every five years, and he is free from all the troublesome trumpery of state routine, and of subordinate patronage, which constitute such a tax upon the time and patience of the minister. He is less concerned with the serving of tables, and can devote himself more exclusively to those social and political questions for the solution of which governments exist. Whatever may be thought of the comparison between an editor and a minister of the crown, there can be no doubt that the influence of the press upon the decision of cabinets is much greater than that wielded by the House of Commons. The House of Commons holds in its hands the power of life or death. But the House of Commons authority is always exercised after the event. When a policy is in the making, the House is dumb. 
Cabinets regard parliaments as judges who may condemn them to capital punishment, but not as guides to direct their steps. At a time when a debate might be useful it is gagged, because no papers can be laid before it, and when the papers are produced, it is told that it is no use crying over spilt milk. In questions of peace or war, Parliament reserves little, save the power of cashiering after the event, those who made a dishonorable peace or plunged into a criminal war. Far otherwise is it with the press. It is never so busy or so influential as when a policy is in the making. It is most active when Parliament is most inert. Its criticism is not postponed until after the fateful decision has been taken, and the critics are wise to the wisdom that comes after the event. The discussion in the cabinet goes on Paris passu with an editorial polemic, and is therefore of necessity more influenced by it than by the ex post facto judgments which are delivered six weeks after by the House of Commons. The enormous advantage of being up to date, of discussing subjects that are, in the slang phrase, quote, on the nail, end quote, is undoubtedly the chief source of the inferiority of the influence of Parliament to that of newspapers. But the press has many other advantages. It has freer access to experts. Let any question, say, the annexation of Burma, come up, and within a week an energetic editor can have sucked the brains of every living authority in England, or in Europe, and printed their opinions in his columns. Parliament can listen to no expert unless he is a British subject in the first place. In the second place, he must have persuaded a majority of householders in some constituency to send him to St. Stephen's, and in the third place, the subject must be brought in on some debate, in which he can catch the speaker's eye. Failing any one of these essentials, the expert's voice is dumb so far as Parliament is concerned, and of course, as for five months of the year, when the question has come up for settlement, Parliament itself is not sitting, he cannot be heard. The Parliament of the press has no such arbitrary limitations. It has no recess, but is ever open, a public forum in which everyone who is qualified to speak is freely heard. For the discussing of details, for the exhaustive hammering out of a subject, for the fashioning of clauses and the shaping of bills, Parliament no doubt has the advantage of the press. That may be freely admitted, but that is largely departmental work, for which no one has ever claimed any special fitness in the press. Newspapers must deal with principles, with general programs, with plans of campaigns. They cannot undertake to superintend the wording of a provisional order, the drafting of a bill, or the drill of a regimental company. It is easy, say some, for journalists in their armchairs to lay down, doctrinaire fashion, cut and dried programs as to what ought to be done. It is the getting of it done that tests the governor, as if the getting of it done does not necessarily follow, and even govern, the decision as to what ought to be done. A journalist who is purely a doctrinaire may be an invaluable benefactor to the human race. He will not be a ruler. The journalist who makes his journal an instrument of government must consider the ways and means as carefully as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, must calculate the strength of opposing forces as diligently as a whip, and study the line of least resistance like any opportunist, for his, after all, is the same craft as that of the monarch or the minister, the governance and guidance of the people, the only difference being that while with the craftsman expediency is apt to become supreme, the press, as the heir of a large section of the spiritual power wielded in earlier times by the clergy, must ever keep principle to the front. It represents, imperfectly no doubt, but still better than any existing order, the priesthood of Comte. Its range is as wide as the wants of man, and the editorial we, is among many millions the only authoritative utterance. An extraordinary idea seems to prevail with the eunuchs of the craft, that leadership, guidance, governance, are alien to the calling of a journalist. These conceptions of what is a journalist's duty, if indeed they recognize that imperious word as having any bearing upon their profession, is hid in mystery. If it may be inferred from their practice, their ideal is to grind out a column of more or less well-balanced sentences, capable of grammatical construction, conflicting with no social conventionality or party prejudice, which fills up so much space in the paper, and then utterly, swiftly, and forever vanishes from mortal mind. How can they help to make up other people's minds when they have never made up their own? The cant, that it is not for journalists to do this, that, or the other, is inconsistent with any theory of civic responsibility. 
Before I was an editor and a journalist, I was a citizen and a man. As a member of a self-governing community, I owe a duty to my country, of which the sole measure is my capacity and opportunity to serve her. How can anyone, who has the power in his hands of averting a great evil, justify himself if he allows it to overwhelm his country, on the pretext that, being a journalist, it was not his duty to avert evils from the commonwealth, his duty being apparently to twaddle about chrysanthemums and spin rigmaroles, about the dresses at the last drawing-room or the fashions at Goodwood. A man's responsibility is as his might, and his might depends largely upon his insight and his foresight. The duty of a journalist is the duty of a watchman. Quote, if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. End quote. A man's duty is to do all the good he can and to prevent all the evil, and on him who seeth to do good and doeth it not, lies a heavier condemnation than it is prudent to face. A knowledge of the facts, that is the first and most indispensable of all things. Lord Beaconsfield once said that power belonged to him who was best informed, and, like many of his remarks, this contains much truth. Of course a head of a department, or an MP, has, or ought to have, more opportunities of learning the facts than any journalist, and on many subjects, no doubt, especially those concerning which the Foreign Office keeps the public resolutely in the dark, the minister, although not the member, has an enormous advantage over the journalist. But this is minimized to a certain extent by the confidential communications constantly made, by those in the swim, to journalists in their confidence, and compensated for by the absurd conventionality which often acts as a barrier, between those who know the facts and the responsible depositaries of power. Hobart Pasha, before he was restored to the Navy list, could not be consulted as to the plan of campaign projected in the Black Sea last spring, and the scheme was almost projected, before the man who knew more about campaigning in the Black Sea than any other sailor in Europe could be consulted, although the plan was to have been carried out, if possible, in conjunction with the fleet under Admiral Hobart's command. Another case quite as remarkable, followed by consequences more deplorable, was the neglect of the War Office to seek General Gordon's advice, as to the defense of Khartoum and the defense of the Sudan, before Hicks marched to his doom in the waterless deserts of Kordofan. General Gordon had commanded in the Sudan. He knew better how to defend Khartoum than any living man. But although he was in the country, he was never asked a question as to what should be done. He did not care to obtrude with his advice unasked, and he was allowed to leave the country without a single consultation on the affairs of the Sudan. Had he been consulted then, the need for his subsequent expedition would never have arisen, and that, although the necessity for sending someone was admitted, never seemed to occur to the government until it was forced upon their attention by a newspaper interviewer. But this is all of a piece with the actions of administrations everywhere. The last men with whom ministers consult in framing Irish measures are the most trusted representatives of the Irish people, and Scotland Yard recently only followed the traditions of Downing Street in sending a detective on a journey of nearly a thousand miles to fail in discovering what could have been learnt at once by a simple question at Northumberland Street. Quote, the last man whom they want to see at the colonial office, end quote, said a leading South African bitterly, quote, is a colonist, end quote. And what is true of colonists appears even more forcibly in the case of distinguished foreigners and others who lie outside the routine of officialism. A journalist is, or ought to be, a perpetual note of interrogation, which he affixes without ceremony to all sorts and all conditions of men. No one is too exalted to be interviewed, no one too humble. From the king to the hangman, and I have interviewed both, they need no introduction to the sanctum, provided only that they speak of facts at first hand, bearing directly upon some topic of the day. That universal accessibility, that eagerness to learn everything that can be told him by anyone who knows the facts, gives the editor one great advantage, and another, perhaps as great, is the compulsion that is laid upon him to serve up the knowledge he acquired, in a shape that can be read and remembered by all men. There is no such compulsion on the minister. Contrast the newspaper precise of some important negotiation, and the blue book, there is the difference at a glance. Often the precise is execrably done, apparently being handed over at the last moment to the odd man of the office, who does police paragraphs and such like, 
but there is at least an attempt to construct an intelligible narrative. In the Blue Book there is none. It is a huge and undigested mass of material, which not one in a hundred thousand ever reads, and not one in a million ever masters. To paraphrase Robert Hall saying, the officials put so many dispatches on the top of their head, they crush out their brains. I am claiming no superiority per se, in the journalist over the minister. Put two men mentally as identical as the two Dromios, one in the foreign office, and the other in Printing House Square or Shoe Lane, and the exigencies of their respective offices will drive the latter to be more acquisitive of latest information from all sources than the former for the self-interest and the conditions of the business are constant forces whose operations drive the editor on while the minister is tempted to confine himself within the smooth groove of official routine another limitation on the efficiency of parliament as contrasted with the greater liberty of the press is the tendency of members to confine their attention to those who vote to do nothing for nothing, to care for nobody who cannot pay for attention received in votes at the ballot box, is one of the most odious features of modern parliaments. But voters, even under household suffrage, are but a seventh part of the inhabitants of these islands, and barely a hundredth part of the subjects of the Queen. The constituency of the newspaper is wider. Everything that is of human interest is of interest to the press. A newspaper, to put it brutally, must have good copy and good copy is oftener found among the outcast and the disinherited of the earth than among the fat and well-fed citizens. Hence selfishness makes the editor more concerned about the vagabond, the landless man, and the deserted child than the member. He has his Achilles' heel in the advertisements, and he must not carry his allegiance to outcast humanity too far. If he wishes to plead to those whom society has ostracized, not so much because they are wicked as because they are improper, then self-interest pleads the other way. Mrs. Grundy tolerates crime, but not impropriety, and it is safer to defend a murderer than a Magdalene, unless of course she belongs to the privileged orders, and is either an actress or a plaything of a prince, and even then, while it is permitted to excite any amount of curiosity about her, the moral aspect of the case must be strictly tabooed. So rigidly is this carried out that it is doubtful whether, if an edict were to be issued, condemning every woman to the lock hospital to be vivisected at the medical schools for purposes of demonstration the more decorous of our journals would deem the wrong scandalous enough to justify the insertion of a protest against so monstrous a violation of human rights the medical journals of course would enthusiastically support it the saturday review would empty vials of its sourest ink over the indecent menads and shrieking sisters who publicly denounce such an outrage on humanity and womanhood and the great majority of the papers would avoid the subject as much as possible, in the interests of public morality and public decency. In reading some of our public journals, we begin to understand how it was that slaves were crucified nightly outside the walls of ancient Rome, without even a protest from the philosopher, or a tear from the women of the empire. Not so long ago, when the contagious disease acts were in the height of their popularity, it seemed probable enough that even crucifixion in a garrison town would have been regarded as a service done to humanity and morality by those who, in the interests of hygiene, have materialized the Inquisition, and naturalized the familiars of the Home Office as police spies in English towns. It is the fashion, among those who decry the power of the more advanced journalism of the day, to sneer at each fresh development of its power as mere sensationalism. This convenient phrase covers a wonderful lack of thinking. For, after all, is it not a simple fact that it is solely by sensations experienced by the optic nerve that we see, and that without a continual stream of ever-renewed sensations we should neither hear, nor see, nor feel, nor think? Our life, our thought, our existence, are built up by a never-ending series of sensations, and when people object to sensations they object to the very material of life. What they mean, however, is not to object to sensations per se, but the sensations in unexpected quarters. It is the novel, the startling, the unexpected, that they denounce, the presentation of facts with such vividness and graphic force as to make a distinct, even though temporary, impact upon the mind. Quote, you must not pump spring water unawares upon a gracious public full of nerves, end quote, is the canon of the anti-sensationalist, and if you do, it is held by some to be so grave an offense as to justify them in saying anything, even if they deny that the water was cold which roused them into a state of indignant clamor. 
Now, I have not a word to say in favor of any method of journalism that can fairly be called exaggerated or untrue. Mere froth-whipping or piling up in agony, solely for purposes of harrowing the feelings of the reader, and nothing more, may be defended as ghost stories are defended, but I have nothing to say for that kind of work. That is not the sensationalism which I am prepared to defend. The sensationalism which is indispensable is sensationalism which is justifiable. Sensationalism in journalism is justifiable, up to the point that it is necessary to arrest the eye of the public, and compel them to admit the necessity of action. When the public is short-sighted, and on many subjects it is a blear-eyed public, short-sighted to the point of blindness, you need to print in all capitals. If you print in ordinary type, it is as if you had never printed at all. If you speak to a deaf man in a whisper, you might as well have spared your breath. If his house is on fire, you are justified in roaring the fact into his ear until he hears, and it is just the same in journalism. The myriad murmurs of multitudinous tongues, all busy with, quote, the rustic cackle of the Borg, end quote, render it practically impossible for anyone to obtain a hearing for the most important of truths, unless he raises his voice above the din. And that is sensationalism, so-called. Mere shouting in itself is one of the most vulgar and least attractive of human exercises. A cheap jack has the lungs of a stentor, but who listens to him? It is the thing you shout that will command attention after you have first aroused it, but you must arouse it first, and therein lies the necessity of presenting it in such a fashion as to strike the eye and compel the public at least to ask, what is it all about? Quote, but if this be so, and we all take to shouting, we shall merely have increased the general hubbub without rendering ourselves any more articulate. End quote. In that case, should that improbable possibility be realized, the best way to attract attention would be to speak in whispers. Everyone remembers the familiar story that comes to us from the Congress of Vienna. Quote, Who is that personage? He has not a single decoration. He must be very distinguished. End quote. And as it is with stars and decorations in the mob of kings and diplomatists, so it will be with a multitude of pseudo-sensationalists. For sensationalism is solely a means to an end. It is never an end in itself. When it ceases to serve its turn, it must be exchanged for some other and more effectual mood of rousing the sluggish mind of the general public into at least a momentary activity. The amateur casual, whose hunk of bread is still preserved under a glass shade at Northumberland Street as a trophy of that early triumph, was a piece of sensationalism of the best kind. Mr. James Greenwood himself went through the experiences which he described. His narrative was carefully written up, and no pain spared to make every detail stand out in as lifelike and real a fashion as was possible, and the object of its publication was the attainment of a definite improvement in the treatment of the poorest of the poor. It secured, as it deserved, a brilliant success, both social and journalistic. The man and dog fight at Hanley, which the same journalist contributed to the Daily Telegraph, was as perfect a specimen of bad sensationalism as his first venture was of good. It was a more or less unauthentic horror, immensely exaggerated, even if it ever occurred, and its publication could not serve, and was not intended to serve, any other end beyond the exhibition of brutality. It failed, as it deserved to fail. But the contrast between the two specimens of the handiwork of the same noted journalist is sufficient to illustrate the absurdity of imagining that the last word has been said when a newspaper or an article is dismissed as sensational. It would not be difficult to maintain that nothing can ever get itself accomplished nowadays without sensationalism. Mr. Spurgeon built up a solid church by as painstaking labor as ever man put forth, but no man was ever more soundly abused as a mere sensation monger than the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. In politics, in social reform, it is indispensable. Without going so far back as the sensationalism of Uncle Tom, or of the still earlier literature which abolished slavery, it was sensationalism of the most sensational kind which enabled Mr. Plimsoll, by sheer force of will, to dab a disc of paint upon the side of every merchantman that hoists the English flag. It was the sensationalism of the bitter cry of outcast London, emphasized by a journalistic sounding board, that led to the appointment of the Royal Commission on the Housing of the Poor. And it was sensationalism that passed the Criminal Law Amendment Act. Sensationalism, in fact, is not unlike the famous chapel bell whose peal Mr. Gladstone heard, and obeyed, in the case of the explosion that shattered Clerkenwell. 
or, if I may vary the metaphor, I may compare sensationalism to the bladder full of dry peas, with which it was the custom to rouse the sages of Laputa from reverie, to attend the urgent claims of life and business. The British public is not Laputan, but it often takes a deal of rousing. Even when its object lessons have been written in characters of blood and flame, it has too often ignored their significance. For the great public, the journalist must print in great capitals, or his warning is unheard. Possibly it has always been so. Every phase of sensationalism seems to have been practiced by the Hebrew prophets, who, however, stand altogether condemned by the canons of our superfine age. As an instrument of culture, taking culture in Mr. Arnold's sense, as familiarity with the best thoughts expressed in the best terms by the ablest men, the press has many and glaring faults, but for the common people it has no rival. There is often an intolerable amount of the jargon of the two great gambling hells of modern England, the stock exchange and the race course, for a mere apeth of suggestive thought or luminous facts, but the apeth is there, and without the newspaper there would not even be that. The craze to have everything served up in snippets, the desire to be fed on seasoned or sweetened tidbits, may be deplored, but although mincemeat may not be wholesome as a staple diet, it is better than nothing. If, as Carlyle said, the real university is the silent library, the most potent educator is the newspaper. The teacher is the ultimate governor. But I am more concerned with the direct governing functions of the press. And foremost among them, unquestionably, is the argus-eyed power of inspection which it possesses, and which, on the whole, it exercises with great prudence and good sense. I remember hearing Mr. Gladstone tell a foreign visitor that he believed that the free, unfettered press of this country had done more to reform its government and purify its administration than all the parliaments, reformed or unreformed, that had ever existed. Whenever you shut off any department from the supervision of the press, there you find abuses which would speedily perish in the light of day. The net effect of Mr. Gladstone's exordium was, that if he were called upon to prescribe any single English institution in use to improve the government, say, of an empire like that of Russia, he would say that a free press would do more good than a representative assembly. The newspaper has become what the House of Commons used to be, and still is in theory, for it is the great court in which all grievances are heard, and all abuses brought to the light of open criticism. But it is much more than this. It is the great inspector, with a myriad eyes, who never sleeps, and whose daily reports are submitted, not to a functionary or a department, but to the whole people. The sphere of this inspection needs to be enlarged, so as to include such official establishments as lunatic asylums, prisons, workhouses, and the like. An editor of a daily paper, or his representative, should be ex officio vested with all the right of inspection, enjoyed by a visiting justice or a home office inspector. If the right were to be conferred only upon one newspaper at a time, but allowed to all in rotation, an honorable emulation would be set up, and a sense of responsibility stimulated for the discovery of abuses and the suggestion of reforms. It ought not to be necessary for a journalist to have to personate a tramp to expose a casual ward, to get himself locked up as disorderly, to see how the charges are treated at a police station, or to commit a misdemeanor, to be able to say whether the skilly of prisoners is edible, or whether the reception cells are sufficiently warmed. It is not enough that in order to visit public establishments on a specified day, should be given to a journalist. To be effective, inspection should ever be unforeseen. It is at such an hour, as they think not that the inspector, who is really dreaded, makes his call. And as a corollary to this, it should be added, that the law of libel should be so modified, as to permit a newspaper much greater liberty to publish the truth than the press at present possesses. A bona fide report of a visit of inspection might subject the newspaper to an action for libel. The greater the truth, the greater the libel, is a maxim to which there ought to be large exceptions, not dependent upon the caprice or the leniency of a jury. A bona fide report of an inspection ought to be at least as privileged as a bona fide report of proceedings in a police court. But the necessity for liberating the press from the disabilities which impose penalties for speaking the truth is a wide subject, which cannot be dealt with here. Even as it is now, with all its disabilities and all its limitations, the press is almost the most effective instrument for discharging many of the functions of government now left us. It has been, as Mr. Gladstone remarked, and still is, 
the most potent engine for the reform of abuses that we possess, and it has succeeded to many of the functions formerly monopolized by the House of Commons. But all that it has been is but a shadow going before of the substance which it may yet possess, when all our people have learned to read, and the press is directed by men with the instinct and capacity of government. William Thomas Stead End of Government by Journalism Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey Professor Bakewell writes as follows in an open letter to me in this journal concerning immediate empiricism. My difficulty, in short, is simply this. Either everything experienced is real exactly as, and no further than, it is then and there experienced, and then there is no occasion to speak of correcting or rectifying experience, or there is in every experience a self-transcendency, which points beyond that thing as experienced for its own reality. And then goodbye to immediatism. And in a footnote he says that my view is atomistic chopping reels off from one another, and that if this consequence is avoided by making the earlier experience contain implicitly the latter to which it leads, immediatism gives way to a doctrine of mediation. There was once a botanist who suggested that instead of deducing botany from the concept of plants and from certain allied concepts, the proper method was to study plants to see what each was in itself whereupon an opponent replied that such a doctrine destroyed botany. Take the case of a seed, he argued. Either you mean that this seed, just as it is now and no further, is real, and then growth is impossible, or else there is in the seed a self-transforming somewhat which changes it, first into a sprouting plant and then, finally, into a mature plant with seeds of its own, and then goodbye to the idea that the reality of the seed is to be sought in just what the seed now and no further is. Moreover, he continued, since each plant in itself is something different from every other, the doctrine makes relation of plants to one another, and hence generalization, and hence science impossible. Whereupon the first mentioned botanist replied that either a given seed is alive and capable of growth, or dead and incapable of becoming a plant, and that the actual state of affairs in this respect is precisely one of the things to be determined by a study of the particular seed, that it is of the very essence of the method that the question of further or no further should be settled by reference not to general notions, but by reference to the determinate character of the particular seed. Moreover, it was just by a study of each plant in itself that one would find out whether it was something unrelated, atomistic, or something genetically and responsibly connected with other plants, relationship being precisely an affair of the determinate character of the seed. In other words, while I expressly state in my article, one, that a thing which is rectified in a subsequent cognitive experience contains within itself, that is, as a part of its own concrete determinate thinghood, the elements of the transformation of its own content, and two, expressly disclaim the possibility of deriving any conclusions whatever from the concept of immediate experience. Professor Bakewell expressly assumes, one, that the very concept of immediate experience carries with it some necessary implication regarding the character or nature of what is experienced, and two, that it precludes any continuity of experienced things. As an immediate empiricist, I can only reply that it is two things as experienced that I go for instruction as to the continuity, transformation, and mediation, and that it is just because I find things immediately experienced as continuous and as self-rectifying that I believe in continuity and self-rectification. Compare the distinction of cognitive and cognized in the former article 
and the reference to the importance of the drift occasion and contexture of things distinctions which are inherent and not external to the things does the transcendentalist believe that things as experienced are continuous if yes why should he charge an empiricist with ex officio denial of this empirical fact but if he holds that a transcendental principle or function is required to give continuity to what as experienced is chopped off then he would seem to be the one denying an actual empirical continuity i am always wishing that some transcendentalist would expound and expose his own positive doctrine about the problems which he accuses the empiricist of maltreating instead of assuming that the transcendental position is self-evident or at least thoroughly understood perhaps professor bakewell will help in this illumination bearing in mind that an important motive in developing the newer philosophy has been the conviction that mediation continuity reconstruction and growth are facts which transcendentalism has failed consistently to define and account for i do not understand the notion that because things of immediate experience are real mediation cannot be real i am quite sure that the logic of immediate empiricism would include mediation along with the categories subjective objective physical mental psychic etc see volume two page three ninety nine and say if you wish to find out what it means go to experience and see what it is experienced as i find difficulty in realizing the difficulty which one has with immediately experiencing something as mediate i don't see any way of experiencing the mediate any more than of experiencing a cat or a dog except that of immediately experiencing it as what it is viz mediate if i were to make a guess as to the origin of the difficulty i should refer it to a mental habit of employing a conceptual instead of an empirical philosophy footnote lest i be charged with intimating that concepts are unreal and unempirical i say forthwith that i believe meanings may be and are immediately experienced as conceptual End footnote a habit so inveterate as to display itself even when one is attempting to appreciate the position of an empiricist i conclude with a question and a remark does professor bakewell mean to deny one that all philosophic conceptions must somehow enter into experience or two that all experience is as existence immediate the remark is that i quite meant my earlier statement volume two page three ninety nine that from the postulate i gave not a single philosophical proposition could be deduced that its significance was that of affording a method of philosophical analysis End of Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey The Issue Between Idealism and Immediate Empiricism by Charles M. Bakewell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Issue Between Idealism and Immediate Empiricism by Charles M. Bakewell There are, I am sure, many students of philosophy who are in sympathy with much that the newer movement is accomplishing, and in particular with its insistence upon greater respect for experience, greater sobriety of philosophical construction, greater freedom of play for the individual, a fuller recognition of the thoroughgoing primacy of the practical, who are in sympathy with its humanism and anti-absolutism, not to speak of the life that it is injecting into the dry veins of epistemology, and yet who find themselves unable to follow its radicalism in a good portion of what it denies, or to accept its definition of what is left now it seems quite evident that we would come to a better mutual understanding if we should stop long enough over our fundamental conceptions and postulates and points of departure to clear away all initial ambiguities it was with this end in view that i addressed my letter to professor dewey footnote an open letter to professor dewey concerning immediate empiricism this journal volume two number nineteen end footnote his reply 
footnote immediate empiricism this journal volume two number twenty two and footnote seems to me to preserve the ambiguities of his first statement footnote the postulate of immediate empiricism this journal volume two number one and footnote and to further confuse the issue footnote as an illustration of the ambiguity referred to take the following i do not understand the notion that because things of immediate experience are real mediation cannot be real page five ninety nine i do not either and i wonder who does but if one first identifies reality the things of immediate experience with the immediate experience as the immediatist explicitly does see professor dewey's original article then it is hard to see how in that sense mediation can be real and still be mediation End footnote. it is with the purpose of sharpening the issue between idealism and immediate empiricism that i continue the discussion the very term immediatism which professor dewey suggests to describe the newer philosophy promises to bring into relief the precise issue created by the radicals and if we are to make any progress in our discussion the issue should not be obscured by irrelevant cross-firing we can at least be clear at the outset as to what the issue is not it is certainly not an issue between immediatism and the sort of a thing reached by professor dewey's entertaining parable of the botanist such comments only divert attention from the point in dispute by firing at a man of straw at least in my reading of philosophy i am unable to find any idealist who can fairly be charged with anything like the attempt to spin a botany out of concepts although it must be admitted every one philosopher and scientist alike is more or less chargeable with the human frailty of giving his well-grounded conceptions a larger scope than their actual grounding warrants and once for all the immediatist should recognize the fact that the idealist does not hold that there is a world of pure delight where categories immortal reign far aloof from the world of experience they live in experience and give it its meaning and one cannot evade the idealist criticisms by tossing the critic up into the cold circumambient ether the antithesis is not between a philosophy grounded in experience and a philosophy manufactured in a den of abstractions for the idealist also holds that his philosophy is grounded in experience from experience it starts to experience it ever returns but the difference comes out in the interpretation of the nature of experience experience is a treacherously ambiguous word for the idealist experience is always a complex of the immediately perceived and the immediately conceived and that no matter how far one goes down the scale for his starting point and therefore immediatism of itself can supply neither starting point nor method the very conception of immediatism as furnishing starting point and method seems therefore to draw sharply the lines of the issue but unfortunately the old ambiguity about experience forthwith creeps into professor dewey's account of immediatism that conception seems to mean two very distinct things one meaning seems formally in accord with radical empiricism but deprives of meaning the quest after truth the other restores the meaning of that quest but only at the cost of abandoning the standpoint of radical empiricism the question is how strictly are we to interpret the word immediate the illustration of the zollner line seemed to leave no doubt as to the meaning intended there immediate experience is taken as the direct unmediated here and now experience when further the real thing in question is postulated as one with the immediate experience so taken and the thing is regarded as precisely what it is immediately experienced as then in place of speaking of solving problems and correcting experience would it not be a more accurate description of the situation to say in the process of evolution one immediate experience reality gives place to another immediate experience reality now it does not at all fit the case to declare johnsonian wise as professor dewey does but there are real problems and we do go to experience to solve them of course 
But it is not true that the problem in each case is a real problem only because the real thing in question is viewed as not just what it is by me immediately experienced as. Footnote. Professor Dewey insists that from the postulate of immediatism not a single philosophical conclusion can be drawn, and accuses me of assuming from the very notion what the character of experience shall be. I have assumed nothing whatever about the character of experience, except that if immediatism is to give us a new method, we must be able to find our starting point in immediacy. Experience does not give us such a starting point. End footnote. But, at this juncture, and to make the postulate tally with the facts, does not Professor Dewey substitute another and quite different interpretation of immediate? It now appears that the immediate experience which shall be equivalent to the reality of the seed, for example, is what I at present immediately experience it as, plus all that I have or shall experience it as, all that I might experience it as were my power sharper, all that my fellow men experience or might experience it as, plus, furthermore, all its thought relations, all its linkages to other things, past and present, all the principles of such linkages. Over all these is thrown the blanket of immediacy. For we are informed that besides immediately experiencing the immediate, one immediately experiences mediation, one immediately experiences categories, concepts, continuity, and these things also really are just what they are immediately experienced as, and that further the immediate experience which shall be one with the reality of the thing experienced includes the possible as well as the actual immediate experiences of these several kinds, seems clearly implied in the illustration given, for in the case of the seed one certainly conceives of its continuity of development and its mediation with other experience as real beyond the actual immediate experience of any or all observers. But to call the object as conceived in its inmost structure and placed in its total setting the object as immediately experienced is a confusing use of terms. This shifting of the meaning of immediate is given plausibility by the fact that thoughts also, like things and immediate experiences, actual or imagined, are together warm in the unity of one's own experience. The ik dunka, however interpreted, is continuously present in all one's speculations. Concepts are not out in the cold. But when one identifies the reality of the thing with the immediate experience taken in this comprehensive and pregnant sense, is this not equivalent to saying that the real thing is the thing as it might be immediately experienced by a universal thinker or experiencer viewing all things totem simul after the manner of the Roycean absolute? This is not what immediate means when we refer to our own experience as immediate. For then the here and the now and the negative prefix are of the essence of the conception. And, taking immediacy in this enlarged and general sense, as noting that aspect of direct ownership, of personal appropriation, which is always found in concepts and principles of mediation, so far as these are given any definite meaning, quite as much as it is present in percepts, this is a fact fully taken into consideration by idealism, as well as the fact that conceptions enter into experience. What the idealist denies is that any single actual experience as existent or as known is immediate and simply immediate. Not that he denies immediacy, but that he affirms mediation to be equally fundamental. Nowhere in experience does he find sheer immediacy. Further, the principles of mediation cannot be analyzed into immediate experiences without losing their unique meaning. He cannot see any hope of success in the method of immediatism, since he can find no fact in experience of such a kind as facts must be if immediatism is ever to get a fair start. The facts of experience are, one and all, and from first to last, tainted with mediation. One calls upon the experienced philosopher to give us a method which recognizes this obvious fact. Otherwise, immediatism, as a method, seems as artificial, abstract, untrue to experience as any barren conceptualism that can be imagined. Footnote. The immediatist is fond of tautology. I don't see any way of experiencing the mediate, writes Professor Dewey, except that of immediately experiencing it as what it is. Having previously declared experience to mean immediate experience, 
This is idle declamation. The question is whether the principles of mediation, causality, for example, as we actually think them, and as we employ them in getting any definite experience, as well as in further defining and interpreting experience, can be adequately described wholly in terms of immediacy. End footnote. The question, in short, is, precisely what does immediate mean in the latest formulation of the new philosophy? How strictly is it taken? If taken strictly, how does immediatism escape the fate of Hume? If loosely taken, how does immediatism differ from idealism after all? What we need is the immediatist account of the categories, the a priori, the principle of mediation, by whatever name, in terms of immediacy strictly taken. End of The Issue Between Idealism and Immediate Empiricism by Charles M. Bakewell John Adams, Inaugural Address by John Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. John Adams, Inaugural Address in the City of Philadelphia, Saturday, March 4, 1797. When it was first perceived, in early time, that no middle course for America remained between unlimited submission to a foreign legislature and a total independence of its claims, men of reflection were less apprehensive of danger from the formidable powers of fleets and armies they must determine to resist than from those contests and dissensions which would certainly arise concerning the forms of government to be instituted over the whole and over the parts of this extensive country relying however on the purity of their intentions the justice of their cause and the integrity and intelligence of the people under an overruling providence which had so signally protected this country from the first the representatives of this nation then consisting of little more than half of its present number not only broke to pieces the chains which were forging and the rod of iron that was lifted up, but frankly cut asunder the ties which had bound them and launched into an ocean of uncertainty. The zeal and ardor of the people during the Revolutionary War, supplying the place of government, commanded a degree of order sufficient at least for the temporary preservation of society. The Confederation, which was early felt to be necessary, was prepared from the models of the Batavian and Helvetic Confederacies, the only examples which remain with any detail and precision in history and certainly the only ones which the people at large had ever considered but reflecting on the striking differences in so many particulars between this country and those where a courier may go from the seat of government to the frontier in a single day it was then certainly foreseen by some who assisted in congress at the formation of it that it could not be durable negligence of its regulations inattention to its recommendations if not disobedience to its authority not only in individuals but in states soon appeared with their melancholy consequences universal languor jealousies and rivalries of states decline of navigation and commerce discouragement of necessary manufactures universal fall in the value of lands and their produce contempt of public and private faith loss of consideration and credit with foreign nations, and at length, in discontents, animosities, combinations, partial conventions, and insurrection, threatening some great national calamity. In this dangerous crisis, the people of America were not abandoned by their usual good sense, presence of mind, resolution, or integrity measures were pursued to concert a plan to form a more perfect union establish justice ensure domestic tranquillity provide for the common defense promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty the public disquisitions discussions and deliberations issued in the present happy constitution of government employed in the service of my country abroad during the whole course of these transactions I first saw the Constitution of the United States in a foreign country. 
Irritated by no literary altercation, animated by no public debate heated by no party animosity, I read it with great satisfaction, as the result of good heads prompted by good hearts, as an experiment better adapted to the genius, character, situation, and relations of this nation and country than any which had ever been proposed or suggested. In its general principles and great outlines, it was conformable to such a system of government as I had ever most esteemed, and in some states, my own native state in particular, had contributed to establish. Claiming a right of suffrage in common with my fellow citizens in the adoption or rejection of a constitution which was to rule me and my posterity as well as them and theirs, I did not hesitate to express my approbation of it on all occasions, in public and in private. It was not then, nor has been since, any objection to it in my mind that the executive and senate were not more permanent. Nor have I ever entertained a thought of promoting any alteration in it but such as the people themselves, in the course of their experience, should see and feel to be necessary or expedient, and by their representatives in Congress and the state legislatures, according to the Constitution itself, adopt and ordain. Returning to the bosom of my country, after a painful separation from it for ten years, I had the honor to be elected to a station under the new order of things, and I have repeatedly laid myself under the most serious obligations to support the Constitution. The operation of it has equaled the most sanguine expectations of its friends, and from an habitual attention to it, satisfaction in its administration, and delight in its effects upon the peace, order, prosperity, and happiness of the nation, I have acquired an habitual attachment to it and veneration for it. What other form of government, indeed, can so well deserve our esteem and love? There may be little solidity in an ancient idea that congregations of men into cities and nations are the most pleasing objects in the sight of superior intelligences. But this is very certain, that to a benevolent human mind there can be no spectacle presented by any nation more pleasing, more noble, majestic, or august than an assembly like that which has so often been seen in this and the other chamber of Congress, of a government in which the executive authority, as well as that of all the branches of the legislature, are exercised by citizens selected at regular periods by their neighbors to make and execute laws for the general good. Can anything essential, anything more than mere ornament and decoration, be added to this by robes and diamonds? Can authority be more amiable and respectable when it descends from accidents or institutions established in remote antiquity than when it springs fresh from the hearts and judgments of an honest and enlightened people? For it is the people only that are represented. It is their power and majesty that is reflected, and only for their good in every legitimate government under whatever form it may appear. The existence of such a government as ours for any length of time is a full proof of a general dissemination of knowledge and virtue throughout the whole body of the people. And what object or consideration more pleasing than this can be presented to the human mind? If national pride is ever justifiable or excusable, it is when it springs not from power or riches, grandeur or glory, but from conviction of national innocence, information, and benevolence. In the midst of these pleasing ideas, we should be unfaithful to ourselves if we should ever lose sight of the danger to our liberties, if anything partial or extraneous should infect the purity of our free, fair, virtuous, and independent elections. If an election is to be determined by a majority of a single vote, and that can be procured by a party through artifice or corruption. The government may be the choice of a party for its own ends, not of the nation for the national good. If that solitary suffrage can be obtained by foreign nations by flattery or menaces, by fraud or violence, by terror, intrigue, or venality, the government may not be the choice of the American people, 
but of foreign nations. It may be foreign nations who govern us, and not we, the people, who govern ourselves. And candid men will acknowledge that in such cases, choice would have little advantage to boast over lot or chance. Such is the amiable and interesting system of government, and such are some of the abuses to which it may be exposed which the people of America have exhibited to the admiration and anxiety of the wise and virtuous of all nations for eight years under the administration of a citizen who, by a long course of great actions, regulated by prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, conducting a people inspired with the same virtues and animated with the same ardent patriotism and love of liberty, to independence and peace, to increasing wealth and unexampled prosperity, has merited the gratitude of his fellow citizens, commanded the highest praises of foreign nations, and secured immortal glory with posterity. In that retirement, which is his voluntary choice, may he long live to enjoy the delicious recollection of his services, the gratitude of mankind, the happy fruits of them to himself and the world, which are daily increasing and that splendid prospect of the future fortunes of this country which is opening from year to year. His name may be still a rampart, and the knowledge that he lives a bulwark against all open or secret enemies of his country's peace. This example has been recommended to the imitation of his successors by both houses of Congress and by the voice of the legislatures and the people throughout the nation. On this subject, it might become me better to be silent or speak with diffidence. But as something may be expected, the occasion, I hope, will be admitted as an apology if I venture to say that, if a preference upon principle of a free republican government, formed upon long and serious reflection, after a diligent and impartial inquiry after truth, if an attachment to the Constitution of the United States and a conscientious determination to support it until it shall be altered by the judgments and wishes of the people expressed in the mode prescribed in it. If a respectful attention to the constitutions of the individual states, and a constant caution and delicacy toward the state governments, if an equal and impartial regard to the rights, interest, honor, and happiness of all the states in the Union, without preference or regard to a northern or southern an eastern or western position, their various political opinions on unessential points, or their personal attachments, if a love of virtuous men of all parties and denominations, if a love of science and letters, and a wish to patronize every rational effort to encourage schools, colleges, universities, academies, and every institution for propagating knowledge, virtue, and religion among all classes of the people, not only for their benign influence on the happiness of life in all its stages and classes, and of society in all its form, but as the only means of preserving our Constitution from its natural enemies, the spirit of sophistry, the spirit of party, the spirit of intrigue, the profligacy of corruption, and the pestilence of foreign influence, which is the angel of destruction to elective governments. If a love of equal laws, of justice and humanity in the interior administration, if an inclination to improve agriculture, commerce, and manufacturers for necessity, convenience, and defense, if a spirit of equity and humanity toward the aboriginal nations of America and a disposition to ameliorate their condition by inclining them to be more friendly to us and our citizens to be more friendly to them, if an inflexible determination to maintain peace and inviolable faith with all nations and that system of neutrality and impartiality among the belligerent powers of Europe, which has been adopted by this government, and so solemnly sanctioned by both houses of Congress, and applauded by the legislatures of the states, and the public opinion, until it shall be otherwise ordained by Congress, if a personal esteem for the French nation, formed in a residence of seven years chiefly among them, and a sincere desire to preserve the friendship, which has been so much for the honor and interest of both nations, if, while the conscious honor and integrity of the people of America and the internal sentiment of their own power and energies must be preserved, an earnest endeavor to investigate every just cause and remove every colorable pretense of complaint, if an intention to pursue, 
by amicable negotiation a reparation for the injuries that have been committed on the commerce of our fellow citizens by whatever nation and if success cannot be obtained to lay the facts before the legislature that they may consider what further measures the honor and interest of the government and its constituents demand if a resolution to do justice as far as may depend upon me at all times and to all nations and maintain peace friendship and benevolence with all the world if an unshaken confidence in the honor spirit and resources of the american people on which i have so often hazarded my all has never been deceived if elevated ideas of the high destinies of this country and of my own duties toward it founded on a knowledge of the moral principles and intellectual improvements of the people deeply engraven on my mind in early life and not obscured but exalted by age and experience and with humble reverence i feel it my duty to add if a veneration for the religion of a people who profess and call themselves christians and a fixed resolution to consider the decent respect for christianity among the best recommendations for the public service can enable me in any degree to comply with your wishes it shall be my strenuous endeavor that this sagacious injunction of the two houses shall not be without effect with this great example before me and with the sense and spirit the faith and honor the duty and interest of the same american people pledged to support the constitution of the united states i entertain no doubt of its continuance in all its energy and my mind is prepared without hesitation to lay myself under the most solemn obligations to support it to the utmost of my power and may that being who is supreme over all the patron of order the fountain of justice and the protector in all ages of the world of virtuous liberty continue his blessing upon this nation and its government and give it all possible success and duration consistent with the ends of his providence end of john adams inaugural address by john adams read by tip Brown. Lord Kelvin on the Metric System From Science, Volume 3, May 22, 1896 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Lord Kelvin on the Metric System the chief objection urged in the recent debates in congress against the adoption of the metric system in the united states was the fact that great britain with whom our commerce is the largest does not use the system it seems however certain that the adoption of the system by both nations is only a matter of time and as the question is now being considered both by the british parliament and our congress it would be highly desirable if an international commission could be arranged so that unity of action could be secured by the two nations the london times whose influence has been said to be as great as that of parliament has recently given much space to discussion of the metric system of the large number of letters addressed to the editor we quote the following from lord kelvin as of special interest in your very interesting leading article on the metric system in the times of yesterday you treat in what seems to me a thoroughly clear and fair manner the question at issue in respect to the demand for legislation on the subject while not ignoring the preference of merchants and manufacturers and scientific men for the metric system you rightly give prominence to consideration for the convenience of the poorer classes who have no great power to make their voices heard at least in such discussions as these if it were true that the adoption of the metric system would be hurtful or even seriously inconvenient to them that would be a strong reason against its being adopted in england but in this respect we have happily a very large experience and i believe it is quite certain that among the germans italians portuguese and other european peoples who have had the practical wisdom to follow the french in the metric system 
all classes are thoroughly contented with it and find it much more convenient for everyday use than the systems which they abandoned in adopting it you rightly brush aside the duodecimal system as an ingenious mathematical exercise but one whose figures must be read back into a decimal system before they can convey any meaning it seems to me however that you are quite right in maintaining that in ordinary everyday reckonings the shopkeeper and his customers must have halves and quarters but i cannot go so far with you as to say halves quarters and thirds was any poor child ever sent to buy a third of a pound of tea did any thirsty traveller other than a mathematician ever ask for a third of a quart of beer it may be taken as a practical result of natural selection permanent through thousands of years that halves and quarters of the ordinary unit for any class of measurement are natural and convenient in the metric system we find the kilogram half kilogram and quarter kilogram continually used in weighing there is no obligation to always call the half kilogram five hundred grams or the quarter kilogram two hundred fifty grams for smaller quantities the gram is a thoroughly convenient measure for distances travelled we have the kilometre half kilometre and quarter kilometre for measuring cloths ribbons and tapes in retail shops we have the meter and centimeter which are thoroughly convenient and popular for all ordinary use the centimeter about four tenths of an inch is a thoroughly convenient smallest unit for most practical purposes and for finer measurements the workman under the metric system has a great advantage in the millimetre and half or quarter millimetre over the british workman with his troublesome and fatiguing eighths sixteenths thirty seconds and sixty fourths of an inch the great advantage of the metric system is its uniform simplicity all measurements of length area volume and weight being founded primarily on the kilometre the kilometre is very convenient for measuring great distances on the earth's surface because a journey a quarter round the world is nearly enough ten thousand kilometres for almost all practical purposes if our travelling was habitually not on the earth's surface but along diameters through the centre there would be some practical value in the merit discovered for the british inch by sir john herschel that it is approximately one one hundredth millionth of a diameter of the earth the thousandth of the french ton is the kilogram and the cubic decimeter or the thousandth of the cubic meter is the litre which is the common popular unit for liquid measure so that any one who has correct weights can verify for himself his litres or other measurements for liquids this particular merit of the metric system which as far as i know has not been much if at all noticed by your correspondents is of very great importance in mechanics and engineering in virtue of it the weight of any quantity of material is found in tons or in kilograms or in grams simply by multiplying its volume in cubic meters or in cubic decimeters or in cubic centimeters by its specific gravity and thus a very great deal of labor which is entailed upon mechanical engineers civil engineers and surveyors in england under the present system will be done away with when the metric system comes into use but now considering the wants and the convenience of the whole population think of the vast contrast between the practically valuable simplicity of the metric system and the truly monstrous complexity of british measurements in miles furlongs chains poles yards feet inches square miles acres square yards square feet square inches cubic yards gallons quarts pints gills tons hundredweights quarters stones pounds avoir du poids seven thousand grains ounces avoir du poids four hundred thirty seven point five grains drams avoir du poids twenty seven point three four three seven five grains pounds troy five thousand seven hundred sixty grains ounces troy four hundred eighty grains 
drams apothecaries, sixty grains, etc. Looking at the question from all sides and considering all the circumstances, I believe it will be found that the thorough introduction of the metric system for general use in Great Britain will be beneficial to all classes, and that the benefit will, in the course of a few weeks, be found to more than compensate any trouble involved in making the change. End of Lord Kelvin on the Metric System from Science, Volume 3, May 22, 1896. Read by Avai in April 2014. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing on Love of Truth from Eine Duplik A Reply I know not whether it be a duty to offer up fortune and life to the truth. Certainly the courage and resolution necessary to such a sacrifice are not gifts which we can bestow upon ourselves. But I know it is a duty if one undertake to teach the truth, to teach the whole of it, or none at all, to teach it clearly and roundly, without enigmas or reserves, and with perfect confidence in its efficacy and utility, and the gifts required for such a decision are in our power. Whoever will not acquire these, or when acquired will not use them, shows that he has a very poor opinion of the human intellect, and he deserves to lose the confidence of his hearers, who, while he frees them from some gross errors, yet withholds the entire truth, and thinks to satisfy them by a compromise with falsehood. For the greater the error, the shorter and straighter the way to the truth. On the other hand, subtle air can prevent our recognition of its nature and forever blind us to the truth. Truth was not capitalized in any of the reading above, but is capitalized in the two sentences below. The man who is faithless to truth in threatening dangers may yet love her much, and truth forgives him his infidelity for the sake of his love. But whosoever thinks of prostituting truth under all sorts of masks and rouge may indeed be her pimp, but he has never been her lover. And now the truth is not capitalized below. Not the truth of which anyone is, or supposes himself to be possessed, but the upright endeavor he has made to arrive at truth makes the worth of the man. For not by the possession, but by the pursuit of truth, are his powers expanded, wherein alone his ever-growing perfection consists. Possession makes us easy, indolent, proud. If God held all truth shut in his right hand, and in his left nothing but the ever-restless search after truth, although with the condition of forever and ever erring, and should say to me, quote, Choose, end quote, I should bow humbly to his left hand and say, quote, Father, give. Pure truth is for thee alone. End, quote. end of On Love of Truth by Gothold Ephraim Lessing An Open Letter to Professor Dewey Concerning Immediate Empiricism by Charles M. Bakewell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Open Letter to Professor Dewey Concerning Immediate Empiricism on first reading your article entitled Immediate Empiricism, it seemed to bear out the promise of its title and to give us a statement of an empiricism at once radical and thoroughgoing. But on careful rereading it, the impression forces itself upon me that you have made the empiricism so thorough that it has overleaped itself. My difficulty is so obvious a one that I dare say you have a ready answer. Perhaps I have missed part of your meaning. 
but as I think that others of your readers may share this difficulty, I venture to lay it before you in the hope of eliciting an explicit reply. The name immediate empiricism, or immediatism, is intended, if I have caught your meaning, to emphasize two characteristics of the new philosophy now generally called pragmatism. One, things are what they are experienced as, which gives us the one postulate of immediate empiricism. And two, every experience is that experience which it is and no other. Or in other words, every experience is a determinate experience, which gives us the criterion of immediate empiricism. This determinateness, you write, is the only and is the adequate principle of control or objectivity. And elsewhere, if one wishes to describe anything truly, his task is to tell what it is experienced as being. Now, as you further explain the first of the above propositions, you make it mean sometimes no more than this. Every experience as experience is what it is experienced as. Or again, you interpret it as meaning simply that if one starts out to explain any fact of experience, he must stick in the most uncompromising fashion to that definite initial experience from which he set out as a real experience. With either interpretation, the first proposition becomes as simple, elementary, tautologous even, as the second. And both would be accepted at a glance, as a matter of course, precisely as one would assent without argument to the propositions A is A and A is not non-A. The obviousness of these propositions gives your general position its plausibility. But to get out of them any criterion or principle of objectivity, do you not then and without giving any logical defense substitute this highly questionable interpretation of your first proposition? Everything experienced is, and is no more than, it is then and there experienced as. Is this what immediatism means? I gather that it is, not only from the general drift of your discussion, but in particular from such expressions as the following, which you use as equivalent in describing a typical case of a corrected experience. The experience has changed. The thing experienced has changed. The concrete reality experienced has changed. And in speaking of the Zollner lines, you write, The lines of that experience, the initial uncorrected experience, are divergent, not merely seem so. I am aware that by a certain placing of the emphasis and by introducing qualifying and explanatory phrases, all of these expressions could be reduced to the tautological form. But they suggest the interpretation that the real thing aimed at in the original experience is gone, and that we are dealing with another, and maybe even a different, kind of a real thing. And some such interpretation seems to be required if immediatism is to furnish a key to the question of the objectivity of experience. In the corrected experience of the Zollner lines, you imply, the lines that then are at once seen as convergent and known as parallel are the lines of that particular experience, and not the real and self-same lines of the initial experience. But why should there be any problem at all if each experience is a new and different reality? Why must experience be corrected, and how can we speak of it as being corrected if it is in fact simply superseded? You write, it is in the concrete thing as experienced that all the grounds and clues to its own intellectual or logical rectification are contained. Here the phrase, its own, seems to bring back the reference to a permanent objective reality that is carried through the process of correcting, a view which immediatism aims to supplant. And when you speak of the initial experience, say of the zoner lines, as containing as experienced, all the grounds and clues to its correction. How can you make this out except by reading into that initial experience as part of its reality, that fuller meaning and larger context which only a later knowledge experience brings to light? This would, however, give us, as far as it goes, an idealism, and of a decidedly transcendental kind. My difficulty, in short, is simply this. 
either everything experienced is real exactly as and no further than it is then and there experienced and then there is no occasion to speak of correcting or rectifying experience or there is in every experience a self-transcendency which points beyond that thing as experienced for its own reality and then goodbye to immediatism even atomism footnote not to be sure the atomism of the earlier english psychology to which you refer in a footnote but immediatism seems to give us a kind of atomism differing from that only in greater complexity of the atoms the reals are chopped off from one another if on the one hand this consequence is avoided by making the earlier experience contain implicitly the later to which it leads immediatism gives way to a doctrine of mediation End footnote or transcendentalism and either view seems in your article to pass over very easily into its opposite in good old hegelian fashion is there another alternative which i have overlooked end of an open letter to professor dewey concerning immediate empiricism by charles m bakewell The Highest Good by Philemon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Philemon, though inferior to Menander, was a great favorite with the Athenians and often defeated his rival in the dramatic contests. Though born at Soli in Cilicia, he spent most of his life in Athens, where he had been admitted to citizenship. He began to exhibit plays about 330 B.C. and is said to have composed altogether 97, yet only a few fragments of them remain. His favorite subjects were love intrigues, as was usually the case in the new comedy which he inaugurated he is said to have died in the theatre during the performance of one of his own compositions the highest good philosophers consume much time and pains to seek the sovereign good nor is there one who yet hath struck upon it virtue some and prudence some contend for whilst the knot grows harder by their struggles to untie it i a mere clown in turning up the soil have dug the secret forth all gracious jove tis peace most lovely and of all beloved peace is the bounteous goddess who bestows weddings and holidays and joyous feasts relations friends health plenty social comforts and pleasures which alone make life a blessing end of the highest good by Philemon. The Postulate of Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Postulate of Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey. The criticisms made upon that vital but still unformed movement, variously termed radical empiricism, pragmatism, humanism, functionalism, according as one or another aspect of it is uppermost, have left me with a conviction that the fundamental difference is not so much in matters overtly discussed as in a presupposition that remains tacit, a presupposition as to what experience is and means. To do my little part in clearing up the confusion, I shall try to make my own presupposition explicit. The object of this paper is then to set forth what I understand to be the postulate and the criterion of immediate empiricism. Footnote. All labels are, of course, obnoxious and misleading. I hope, however, the term will be taken by the reader in the sense in which it is forthwith explained, and not in some more usual and familiar sense empiricism as herein used is as antipodal to sensationalistic empiricism as it is to transcendentalism and for the same reason both of these systems fall back on something 
which is defined in non-directly experienced terms in order to justify that which is directly experienced. Hence I have criticized such empiricism as essentially absolutistic in character, and also as an attempt to build up experience in terms of certain methodological checks and cues of attaining certainty. End footnote. Immediate empiricism postulates that things, anything, everything, in the ordinary or non-technical use of the term thing, are what they are experienced as. Hence, if one is to describe anything truly, his task is to tell what it is experienced as being. If it is a horse that is to be described, or the equus that is to be defined, then must the horse trader, or the jockey, or the timid family man who wants a safe driver, or the zoologist, or the paleontologist tell us what the horse is which is experienced? If these accounts turn out different in some respects, as well as congruent in others, this is no reason for assuming the content of one to be exclusively real and that of others to be phenomenal. For each account of what is experienced will manifest that it is the account of the horse dealer or of the zoologist, and hence will give the conditions requisite for understanding the differences as well as the agreements of the various accounts. And the principle varies not a whit if we bring in the psychologist horse, the logician's horse, or the metaphysician's horse. In each case, the nub of the question is what sort of experience is denoted or indicated? A concrete and determinate experience varying when it varies in specific real elements and agreeing when it agrees in specific real elements. So that we have a contrast not between a reality and various approximations to or phenomenal representations of reality but between different reals of experience. And the reader is begged to bear in mind that from this standpoint, when an experience or some sort of experience is referred to, some thing or some sort of thing is always meant. Now, this statement that things are what they are experienced to be is usually translated into the statement that things, or ultimately reality, being, are only and just what they are known to be or that things are, or reality is, what it is for a conscious knower, whether the knower be conceived primarily as a perceiver or as a thinker being a further and secondary question. This is the root paralogism of all idealisms, whether subjective or objective, psychological or epistemological. By our postulate, things are what they are experienced to be, and unless knowing is the sole and only genuine mode of experiencing, it is fallacious to say that reality is just and exclusively what it is or would be to an all-competent, all-knower. Or even that it is, relatively in piecemeal, what it is to a finite and partial knower. Or, put more positively, knowing is one mode of experiencing, and the primary philosophic demand from the standpoint of immediatism is to find out what sort of an experience knowing is or, concretely, how things are experienced when they are experienced as known things. Footnote. I hope the reader will not therefore assume that from the empiricist's standpoint, knowledge is of small worth or import. On the contrary, from the empiricist's standpoint, it has all the worth which it is concretely experienced as possessing, which is simply tremendous. But the exact nature of this worth is a thing to be found out in describing what we mean by experiencing objects as known, the actual differences made or found in experience. End footnote. By concretely is meant, obviously enough, among other things, such an account of the experience of things as known that will bring out the characteristic traits and distinctions they possess as things of a knowing experience, as compared with things experienced aesthetically or morally or economically or technologically. To assume that, because from the standpoint of the knowledge experience, things are what they are known to be, therefore, metaphysically, absolutely, without qualification, everything in its reality, as distinct from its appearance or phenomenal occurrence, is what a knower would find it to be, is from the immediatist standpoint, if not the root of all philosophical evil, at least one of its main roots. 
for this leaves out of account what the knowledge standpoint is itself experienced as. I start and am flustered by a noise heard. Empirically, that noise is fearsome. It really is. Not merely phenomenally or subjectively so. That is what it is experienced as being. But when I experience the noise as a known thing, I find it to be innocent of harm. It is the tapping of a shade against the window owing to movements of the wind. The experience has changed. That is, the thing experienced has changed. Not that an unreality is given place to a reality, nor that some transcendental, unexperienced reality has changed. Footnote. Since the non-empiricist believes in things in themselves, which he may term atoms, sensations, transcendental unities, a priori concepts, an absolute experience, or whatever, and since he finds that the empiricist makes much of change, as he must, since change is continuously experienced, he assumes that the empiricist means his own non-empirical realities are in continual flux, and he naturally shudders at having his divinities so violently treated. But once recognized that the empiricist doesn't have any such realities at all, and the entire problem of the relation of change to reality takes a very different aspect. End footnote. Not that truth has changed, but just and only the concrete reality experienced has changed. I now feel ashamed of my fright, and the noise as fearsome is changed to a noise as a wind curtain fact, and hence practically indifferent to my welfare. This is a change of experienced existence affected through the medium of cognition. The content of the latter experience cognitively regarded is doubtless truer than the content of the earlier, but it is in no sense more real. To call it truer, moreover, must from the empirical standpoint mean a concrete difference in actual things experienced. Footnote. It would lead us aside from the point to try to tell just what is the nature of the experience difference we call truth. Professor James's recent articles may well be consulted. The point to bear in mind here is just what sort of a thing the empiricist must mean by true, or truer, the noun truth is of course a generic name for all cases of truths. The adequacy of any particular account is not a matter to be settled by general reasoning but by finding out what sort of an experience the truth experience actually is. End footnote. Again, in many cases, only in retrospect is the prior experience cognitionally regarded at all. In such cases, it is only in regard to contrasted content in a subsequent experience that the determination truer has force. Perhaps some reader may now object that as matter of fact the entire experience is cognitive, but that the earlier parts of it are only imperfectly so, resulting in a phenomenon that is not real, while the latter part, being a more complete cognition, results in what is relatively at least more real. Footnote. I say relatively because the transcendentalist still holds that finally the cognition is imperfect, giving us only some symbol or phenomenon of reality, which is only in the absolute, or in some thing in itself. Otherwise, the curtain wind fact would have as much ontological reality as the existence of the absolute itself, a conclusion at which the non-empiricist perhoresses, for no reason obvious to me, save that it would put an end to his transcendentalism. End footnote. In short, a critic may say that, when I was frightened by the noise, I knew I was frightened, otherwise there would have been no experience at all. At this point, it is necessary to make a distinction so simple, and yet so all fundamental that I am afraid the reader will be inclined to poo-poo it away as a mere verbal distinction. But to see that to the empiricist the distinction is not verbal, but genuine, is the precondition of any understanding of him. The immediatist must, by his postulate, ask what is the fright experienced as. Is what is actually experienced, I know I am frightened? or I am frightened. I see absolutely no reason for claiming that the experience must be described by the former phrase. In all probability, and all the empiricist logically needs is just one case of this sort, the experience is simply and just of fright at the noise. Later, one may or may not have an experience described as I know I am or was, 
and improperly or properly frightened. But this is a different experience, that is, a different thing. And if the critic goes on to urge that the person really must have known that he was frightened, I can only point out that the critic is shifting the venue. He may be right, but, if so, it is only because the really is something not concretely experienced, whose nature, accordingly, is the critic's business. And this is to depart from the empiricist's point of view, to attribute to him a postulate he expressly repudiates. The material point may come out more clearly if I say that we must make a distinction between a thing as cognitive and one as cognized. Footnote. In general, I think the distinction between if and ed, one of the most fundamental of philosophic distinctions, and one of the most neglected. The same holds of shun and ing. End footnote. I should define a cognitive experience as one that has certain bearings or implications which induce, and fulfill themselves in, a subsequent experience in which the relevant thing is experienced as cognized, as a known object, and is therefore transformed or reorganized. The fright at the noise in the case cited is obviously cognitive in this sense. By description, it induces an investigation or inquiry in which both noise and fright are objectively stated or presented. The noise as a shade wind fact, the fright as an organic reaction to a sudden acoustic stimulus, a reaction that, under the given circumstances, was useless or even detrimental, a maladaption. Now, pretty much all of experience is of this sort. The is, meaning, of course, is experienced as. And the empiricist is false to his principle if he does not duly note this fact. Footnote. What is criticized now as geneticism, if I may coin the word, and now as pragmatism is, in truth, just the fact that the empiricist does take account of the experienced drift, occasion, and contexture of things experienced to use Hobbes's phrase, end footnote. But he is equally false to his principle if he permits himself to be confused as to the concrete differences in the two things experienced. There are two little words through explication of which the empiricist position may be brought out, as and that. We may express his presupposition by saying that things are what they are experienced as being or that to give a just account of anything is to tell what that thing is experienced to be. By these words, I want to indicate the absolute, final, irreducible, and inexpungible concrete quail which everything experienced not so much has as is. To grasp this aspect of empiricism is to see what the empiricist means by objectivity, by the element of control. Suppose we take, as a crucial case for the empiricist, an out-and-out -out illusion, say of Zollner's lines. These are experienced as convergent. They are truly parallel. If things are what they are experienced as being, how can the distinction be drawn between illusion and the true state of the case? There is no answer to this question except by sticking to the fact that the experience of the lines as divergent is a concrete qualitative thing or that. It is that experience which it is, and no other. And if the reader rebels at the iteration of such obvious tautology, I can only reiterate that the realization of the meaning of this tautology is the key to the whole question of the objectivity of experience, and that stands to the empiricist. The lines of that experience are divergent, not merely seem so. The question of truth is not as to whether being or non-being, reality or mere appearance, is experienced, but as to the worth of a certain concretely experienced thing. The only way of passing upon this question is by sticking in the most uncompromising fashion to that experience as real. That experience is that two lines with certain cross-hatchings are apprehended as convergent. Only by taking that experience as real and as fully real is there any basis for, or way of going to, an experienced knowledge that the lines are parallel. It is in the concrete thing as experience that all the grounds and clues to its own intellectual or logical rectification are contained. It is because this thing, afterwards adjudged false, is a concrete that, 
that it develops into a corrected experience that is experience of a corrected thing we reform things just as we reform ourselves or a bad boy whose full content is not a whit more real but which is true or truer footnote perhaps the point would be clearer if expressed in this way except as subsequent estimates of worth are introduced real means only existent the eulogistic connotation that makes the term reality equivalent to true or genuine being has great pragmatic significance and its confusion with reality as existence is the point aimed at in the above paragraph End footnote if any experience then a determinate experience and this determinateness is the only and is the adequate principle of control or objectivity the experience may be of the vaguest sort i may not see anything which i can identify as a familiar object a table a chair etc it may be dark i may have only the vaguest impression that there is something which looks like a table or i may be completely befogged and confused as when one rises quickly from sleep in a pitch-dark room but this vagueness this doubtfulness this confusion is the thing experienced and qua real is as good a reality as the self-luminous vision of an absolute it is not just vagueness doubtfulness confusion at large or in general it is this vagueness and no other absolutely unique absolutely what it is footnote one does not so easily escape medieval realism as one thinks either every experienced thing has its own determinateness its own unsubstitutable unredeemable reality or else generals are separate existences after all End footnote whatever gain in clearness in fullness in trueness of content is experienced must grow out of some element in the experience of this experienced as what it is to return to the illusion if the experience of the lines as convergent is illusory it is because of some elements in the thing as experienced not because of something defined in terms of externality to this particular experience if the illusoriness can be detected it is because the thing experienced is real having within its experienced reality elements whose own mutual tension affects its reconstruction taken concretely the experience of convergent lines contains within itself the elements of the transformation of its own content it is this thing and not some separate truth that clamors for its own reform there is then from the empiricist point of view no need to search for some aboriginal that to which all successive experiences are attached and which is somehow thereby undergoing continuous change experience is always of that's and the most comprehensive and inclusive experience of the universe that the philosopher himself can obtain is the experience of a characteristic that from the empiricist point of view this is as true of the exhaustive and complete insight of a hypothetical all-knower as of the vague blind experience of the awakened sleeper as reals they stand on the same level as true the latter has by definition the better of it but if this insight is in any way the truth of the blind awakening it is because the latter has in its own determinate quail elements of real continuity with the former it is ex hypothesi transformable through a series of experienced reals without break of continuity into the absolute thought experience there is no need of logical manipulation to effect the transformation nor could any logical consideration affect it if affected at all it is just by immediate experiences each of which is just as real no more no less as either of the two terms between which they lie such at least is the meaning of the empiricist contention so when he talks of experience he does not mean some grandiose remote affair that is cast like a net around a succession of fleeting experiences he does not mean an indefinite total comprehensive experience which somehow engirdles an endless flux he means that things are what they are experienced to be and that every experience is some thing 
From the postulate of empiricism, then, or what is the same thing, from a general consideration of the concept of experience, nothing can be deduced, not a single philosophical proposition. Footnote. Except, of course, some negative ones. One could say that certain views are certainly not true, because, by hypothesis, they refer to non-entities, i.e. non-empiricals. But even here the empiricist must go slowly. From his own standpoint, even the most professedly transcendental statements are, after all, real as experiences, and hence negotiate some transaction with facts. For this reason, he cannot, in theory, reject them in toto, but has to show concretely how they arose and how they are to be corrected. In a word, his logical relationship to statements that profess to relate to things in themselves, unknowables, inexperienced substances, etc., is precisely that of the psychologist to the Zollner lines. End footnote. The reader may hence conclude that all this just comes to the truism that experience is experience, or is what it is. If one attempts to draw conclusions from the bare concept of experience, the reader is quite right. But the real significance of the principle is that of a method of philosophical analysis, a method identical in kind, but differing in problem and hence in operation, with that of the scientist. If you wish to find out what subjective, objective, physical, mental, cosmic, psychic, cause, substance, purpose, activity, evil, being, quality, any philosophic term in short, means, go to experience and see what the thing is experienced as. Such a method is not spectacular. It permits of no offhand demonstrations of God, freedom, immortality, nor of the exclusive reality of matter, or ideas, or consciousness, etc. But it supplies a way of telling what all these terms mean. It may seem insignificant or chillingly disappointing, but only upon condition that it be not worked. Philosophic conceptions have, I believe, outlived their usefulness considered as stimulants to emotion, or as a species of sanctions, and a larger, more fruitful, and more valued career awaits them considered as specifically experienced meanings. Note. The reception of this essay proved that I was unreasonably sanguine in thinking that the footnote of warning appended to the title would forfend radical misapprehension. I see now that it was unreasonable to expect that the word immediate in a philosophic writing could be generally understood to apply to anything except knowledge, even though the body of the essay is a protest against such limitation. But I venture to repeat that the essay is not a denial of the necessity of mediation or reflection in knowledge, but is an assertion that the inferential factor must exist, or must occur, and that all existence is direct and vital so that philosophy can pass upon its nature, as upon the nature of all of the rest of its subject matter, only by first ascertaining what it exists or occurs as. I venture to repeat also another statement of the text. I do not mean by immediate experience any aboriginal stuff out of which things are evolved, but I use the term to indicate the necessity of employing in philosophy the direct descriptive method that has now made its way in all the natural sciences, with such modifications, of course, as the subject itself entails. There is nothing in the text to imply that things exist in experience atomically or in isolation. When it is said that a thing as cognized is different from an earlier non-cognitionally experienced thing, the saying no more implies lack of continuity between the things than the obvious remark that a seed is different from a flower or a leaf denies their continuity. The amount and kind of continuity or discreteness that exists is to be discovered by recurring to what actually occurs in experience. Finally, there is nothing in the text that denies the existence of things temporally prior to human experiencing of them. Indeed, I should think it fairly obvious that we experience most things as temporally prior to our experiencing of them. The import of the article is to the effect that we are not entitled to draw philosophic as distinct from scientific conclusions as to the meaning of prior temporal existence till we have ascertained what it is to experience a thing as past. 
these four disclaimers cover, I think, all the misapprehensions disclosed in the four or five controversial articles noted above that the original essay evoked. One of these articles, that of Professor Woodbridge, raised a point of fact, holding that cognitional experience tells us, without alteration, just what the things of other types of experience are, and in that sense transcends other experiences. This is too fundamental an issue to discuss in a note, and I contend myself with remarking that with respect to it, the bearing of the article is that the issue must be settled by a careful descriptive survey of things as experienced, to see whether modifications do not occur in existences when they are experienced as known, i.e. as true or false in character. The reader interested in following up this discussion is referred to the following articles. Volume 2 of the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Method, two articles by Bakewell, page 520 and page 687, one by Bode, page 658, one by Woodbridge, page 573, volume 3 of the same journal, by Leighton, page 174. End of The Postulate of Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey The Unknown Soldier by Frank M. O'Brien. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That which takes place today at the National Cemetery in Arlington is a symbol, a mystery, and a tribute. It is an entombment only in the physical sense. It is rather the enthronement of duty and honor. This man who died for his country is the symbol of these qualities, a far more perfect symbol than any man could be whose name and deeds we knew. He represents more, really, than the unidentified dead, for we cannot separate them spiritually from the war heroes whose names are written on their gravestones. He this spirit whom we honor stands for the unselfishness of all this of all monuments to the dead is lasting and immutable so long as men revere the finer things of life the tomb of the nameless hero will remain a shrine nor with the shifts of time and mind can there be a changing of values no historian shall rise to modify the virtues or the faults of the soldier he has an immunity for which kings might pray. The years may bring erosion to the granite, but not to the memory of the unknown. It is a common weakness of humanity to ask the questions that can never be answered in this life. Probably none to whom the drama of the unknown soldier has appealed has not wondered who, in the sunshine of earth, was the protagonist of today's ceremony. A logger from the Penobscot? an orchardist from the pacific coast a well driller from texas a machinist from connecticut a lad who left his hoe to rust among the missouri corn a longshoreman from hell's kitchen perhaps some youth from the tobacco fields resting again in his own virginia all that the army tells us of him is that he died in battle all that the heart tells us is that some woman loved him more than that no man shall learn in this mystery as in the riddle of the universe the wise wonder but they would not know what were his dreams his ambitions likely he shared those common to the millions a life of peace and honest struggle with such small success as comes to most who try and at the end the place on the hillside among his fathers Today, to do honor at his last resting place come the greatest soldiers of the age, famous statesmen from other continents, the president, the high judges, and the legislators of his own country, and many men who, like himself, fought for the flag. At his bier will gather the most remarkable group that America has seen and the tomb which fate reserved for him is instead of the narrow cell on the village hillside 
one as lasting as that of Ramses and as inspiring as Napoleon's. It is a great religious ceremony, this burial today. The exaltation of the nameless bones would not be possible except for belief. Where were duty and honor, the wellsprings of victory, if mankind feared that death drew a black curtain beyond which lay nothing but the dark? So all in whom the spark of hope has not died can well believe that we, to whom the soldier is a mystery, are not a mystery to him. They can believe that the watchers at Arlington today are not merely a few thousands of the living, but the countless battalions of the departed though he were dead yet shall he live there is the promise to which men hold when everything of this earth has slipped away all the impressive ritual of today would be a mockery if we did not believe that out in an infinity which astronomers cannot chart or mathematicians bound the unknown soldier and all the glorious dead whom we honor in his dust are looking down upon this little spinning ball conscious of our reverence and when noon strikes signal for the moment of silent prayer few of those who stand with bared head will lack conviction that the rites at arlington are viewed by other than mortal eyes only in that spirit may we honor the unknown soldier and those who like him died for this republic unknown but not unknowing End of the Unknown Soldier by Frank M. O'Brien A Very Short Life of Kierkegaard by Charles K. Bellinger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Soren Kierkegaard was born in 1813 in Copenhagen, Denmark, as the seventh child of a wealthy businessman. His father was a self-educated man who had a brooding, deeply religious spirit. The father's pietism and philosophical interests had a great impact on his last son, Soren, who went on to become one of the most important figures in modern Christian thought. Kierkegaard was a bright student, and he received a high-quality private school education. By the time he was seventeen, he could read Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, and French, as well as his native Danish. He entered the university where his father hoped that he would study to become a pastor. Kierkegaard was more interested in studying literature and philosophy. However, he adopted the carefree, expensive lifestyle of a prodigal son. He wrestled deeply with religious ideas. However, at the age of 25, he had a profound conversion experience. He was reconciled with his father shortly before the latter's death, and he dedicated himself to the cause of Christian faith for the rest of his life. The Kierkegaard family was deeply touched by tragedy. By the time Soren was twenty-five, five of his six siblings had died, as well as his mother and father. Soren himself did not expect to live past the age of thirty. As it was, he died at the age of forty-two in 1855. He went on to complete the prerequisites for ordination in the Lutheran Church but he never did become ordained. Through his writings, he became a kind of pastor at large to the country of Denmark. In 1841, he earned a doctoral degree in philosophy with a dissertation on the concept of irony with constant references to Socrates. At the age of 27, he became engaged to Regina Olson, for the next year he agonized within himself as to whether or not he had made a mistake. He broke off the engagement, believing that a marriage between them would not be viable due to his personal eccentricities and his intense preoccupation with becoming an author. 
this engagement in its dissolution became one of the main inspirations for his subsequent authorship since he had inherited a large sum of money from his father's estate he was able to embark on a career as an independent author between the years of eighteen forty three and eighteen fifty one he published a stream of books which are remarkable in their number literary complexity philosophical perception and theological profundity since he wrote in danish he was only noticed at first by a handful of danish intellectuals it was not until the twentieth century that he became a well-known and widely read figure on the western intellectual scene his authorship can be divided into two time periods and six writing styles the first time period is referred to as his first authorship from eighteen forty three to 1846. The second period consists of works written between 1847 and 1855, which are known as his second authorship. The first authorship consists primarily of pseudonymous books, which were published under pen names such as Victor Eremita, Judge Wilhelm, Hilarius Bookbinder, and Johannes Climacus these pen names were attached to imaginary authors whose viewpoints did not necessarily coincide with kierkegaard's own viewpoint a novelist writes a novel by imagining characters and placing them in a setting and a plot kierkegaard imagined characters and had these characters write books an understanding of this point is crucial for the project of interpreting his writings in his own voice kierkegaard said if it should occur to anyone to want to quote a particular passage from the books it is my wish my prayer that he will do me the kindness of citing the respective pseudonym's author's name not mine concluding unscientific postscript page six twenty seven after publishing his work concluding unscientific postscript Kierkegaard intended to end his career as an author, hence the word concluding in the title. But at that time a satirical newspaper called The Corsair began to lampoon him at Kierkegaard's own request. As a result, Kierkegaard became a laughingstock in Danish society, and this incident spurred him on to continue writing the books he wrote subsequently have become known as his second authorship they are mainly religious works published under his own name kierkegaard's authorship can also be divided into six writing styles or genres or thematic subdivisions the six categories are as follows with a listing of the titles which fit into them one criticism early polemical writings circa 1838 the concept of irony 1841 two ages 1846 the book on adler circa 1847 the crisis and a crisis in the life of an actress 1848 two fiction either or 1843 repetition 1843 fear and trembling 1843 prefaces 1844 stages on life's way 1845 three philosophy of religion the concept of anxiety 1844 philosophical fragments 1844 concluding unscientific postscript eighteen forty six four pastoral theology eighteen upbuilding discourses eighteen forty three through eighteen forty four three discourses on imagined occasions eighteen forty five upbuilding discourses in various spirits eighteen forty seven 
works of love eighteen forty seven christian discourses eighteen forty eight miscellaneous later discourses eighteen forty nine through eighteen fifty five eighty eight discourses total five polemical theology sickness unto death eighteen forty nine practice in christianity eighteen fifty for self-examination eighteen fifty one judge for yourself circa eighteen fifty one two miscellaneous later writings i e kierkegaard's attack upon christendom for the moment eighteen fifty five six autobiographical works the point of view for my work as an author circa eighteen forty eight journals and papers eighteen twenty nine through fifty five the first category contains works of literary philosophical cultural and religious criticism the second category contains works which are novelistic in character they focus on the boundaries between different spheres of existence such as the ascetic and the ethical and the ethical and the religious they often focus on the subject of marriage they can be traced back to kierkegaard's relationship with regina the third category consists of pseudonymous works of a highly philosophical character they address the themes of original sin the incarnation and christian existence the fourth category includes kierkegaard's religious upbuilding discourses they are in effect sermons but they are meant to be read in published form rather than preached in church they are addressed to a general audience and they speak in a pastoral and comforting yet challenging tone the fifth category contains late works in which kierkegaard analyzes and speaks out prophetically against what he sees as the spiritual bankruptcy of western christendom the sixth category is made up of his remarkable autobiographical work the point of view for my work as an author and of his voluminous journals in which he carries on a running commentary on his life and times and the inner workings of his writing career these various writing styles can be understood as growing out of kierkegaard's relationships with the various kinds of people he knew his fiction was addressed to the literary intellectuals of his day but it also grew out of his engagement to regina his philosophy of religion was directed at the philosophers and theologians of his time who were largely under the sway of hegelianism his pastoral theology was intended for a general audience his polemical theology was directed to the leaders of the state church bishops minster and martinson there is also a sense in which everything he wrote was addressed to god thus his authorship reveals the intricate nexus of relationships in which he lived this nexus of relationships is well illustrated in the volume encounters with kierkegaard edited by bruce kermsey which contains all of the extant accounts of kierkegaard by those who knew him during the last months of his life kierkegaard carried out a relentless verbal attack on the state church in denmark which he judged as having departed from the path of genuine new testament christianity he finally collapsed one day in the street was carried to a hospital and died about a month later his older brother peter the only other surviving member of the family went on later to become a bishop in that same state church note i am sometimes asked if i want to read something by kierkegaard where should i begin i consider the sickness unto death to be his most important book 
in my opinion it has no equal in the modern world as a work of philosophical anthropology its companion work practice in christianity is also very important generally speaking the works in the pastoral theology category are very accessible to lay persons and they express kierkegaard's own viewpoint most clearly and directly a good place to start is with works of love or upbuilding discourses in various spirits the first part of this latter work has previously been published in english under the title purity of heart is to will one thing its translator douglas streer said this as a devotional classic the nineteenth century produced almost nothing in either catholic or protestant circles that can compare seriously with purity of heart relatively short accessible works about kierkegaard include the following c stephen evans soren kierkegaard's christian psychology Walter Laurie, A Short Life of Kierkegaard, Gregor Melanchuk, Kierkegaard's Way to Truth. End of A Very Short Life of Kierkegaard by Charles K. Bellinger. A Voyage to San Francisco from Memoirs of General W. T. Sherman by William T. Sherman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage to San Francisco by William T. Sherman During the stay of my family in New Orleans, we enjoyed the society of the families of General Twiggs, Colonel Myers, and Colonel Bliss, as also of many citizens, among whom was the wife of Mr. Day, sister to my brother-in-law, Judge Bartley. General Twiggs was then one of the oldest officers of the Army. His history extended back to the War of 1812, and he had served in early days with General Jackson in Florida and in the Creek campaigns. He had fine powers of description, and often entertained us at his office with accounts of his experiences in the earlier settlements of the Southwest. Colonel Bliss had been General Taylor's adjutant in the Mexican War, and was universally regarded as one of the most finished and accomplished scholars in the Army, and his wife was a most agreeable and accomplished lady. Late in February, I dispatched my family up to Ohio in the steamboat Tecumseh, Captain Pierce, disposed of my house and furniture, turned over to Major Reynolds the funds, property, and records of the office, and took passage in a small steamer for Nicaragua, en route to California. We embarked early in March, and in seven days reached Greytown, where we united with the passengers from New York, and proceeded by the Nicaragua River and Lake for the Pacific Ocean. The river was low, and the little steam canal boats, four in number, grounded often so that the passengers had to get into the water to help them over the bar. In all, there were about 600 passengers, of whom about 60 were women and children. In four days we reached Castillo, where there is a decided fall, passed by a short railway, and above this fall we were transferred to a larger boat, which carried us up the rest of the river and across the beautiful Lake Nicaragua, studded with volcanic islands. Landing at Virgin Bay, we rode on mules across to San Juan del Sur, where lay at anchor the propeller S.S. Lewis, Captain Partridge, I think. Passengers were carried through the surf by natives to small boats and rowed off to the Lewis. The weather was very hot, and quite a scramble followed for staterooms, especially for those on deck. I succeeded in reaching the purser's office, got my ticket for a berth in one of the best staterooms on deck, and just as I was uh, turning from the window, a lady, who was a fellow passenger from New Orleans, a Mrs. D., called to me to secure her and her lady friend berths on deck, saying that those below were unendurable. I spoke to the purser, who at that moment, perplexed by the crowd and clamor, answered, 
I must put their names down for the other two berths in your stateroom, but as soon as the confusion is over I will make some change whereby you shall not suffer." As soon as these two women were assigned to a stateroom they took possession, and I was left out. Their names were recorded as, quote, Captain Sherman and ladies, quote. As soon as things were quieted down, I remonstrated with the purser, who at last gave me a lower berth in another and larger stateroom on deck with five others, so that my two ladies had the stateroom all to themselves. At every meal, the steward would come to me and say, Captain Sherman, will you bring your ladies to the table? And we had the best seats in the ship. This continued throughout the voyage, and I assert that my ladies were of the most modest and best behaved in the ship. But some time after we had reached San Francisco, one of our fellow passengers came to me and inquired if I personally knew Mrs. D., with flaxen tresses, who sang so sweetly for us, and who had come out under my especial escort. I replied I did not, more than uh, the chance acquaintance of the voyage, and what she herself had told me, viz., that she expected to meet her husband, who lived about McCollumney Hill. He then informed me that she was a woman of the town. Society in California was then decidedly mixed. In due season the steamship Lewis got under way. She was a wooden ship, long and narrow, bark-rigged, and a propeller, very slow, moving not over eight miles an hour. We stopped at Acapulco, and in eighteen days passed in sight of Point Pinoa at Monterey, and at the speed we were traveling expected to reach San Francisco at four a.m. the next day. The cabin passengers, as was usual, bought of the steward some champagne and cigars, and we had a sort of ovation for the captain, purser, and surgeon of the ship, who were all very clever fellows, though they had a slow and poor ship. Late at night all the passengers went to bed, expecting to enter the port at daylight. I did not undress, as I thought the captain could and would run in at night, and I lay down with my clothes on. About four a.m. I was awakened by a bump and sort of grating of the vessel, which I thought was our arrival at the wharf in San Francisco. But instantly the ship struck heavily, the engines stopped, and the running to and fro on deck showed that something was wrong. In a moment I was out of my stateroom at the bulwark holding fast to a stanchion, and looked over the side at the white and seething water caused by her sudden and violent stoppage. The sea was comparatively smooth, the night pitch dark, and the fog deep and impenetrable. The ship would rise with the swell and would come down with a bump and quiver that was decidedly unpleasant. Soon the passengers were out of their rooms, undressed, calling for help, and praying as though the ship were going to sink immediately. Of course she could not sink, being already on the bottom, and the only question was as to the strength of hull to stand the bumping and straining. Great confusion for a time prevailed, but soon I realized that the captain had taken all proper precautions to secure his boats, of which there were six at the Devitts. These are the first things that steerage passengers make for in case of shipwreck, and right over my head I heard the captain's voice say in a low tone, but quite decided, let go that falls, or damn you, I'll blow your head off. This seemingly harsh language gave me great comfort at the time, and on saying so to the captain afterward, he explained that it was addressed to a passenger who attempted to lower one of the boats. Guards, composed of the crew, were soon posted to prevent any interference with the boats, and the officers circulated among the passengers the report that there was no immediate danger, that fortunately the sea was smooth, and we were simply aground, and must quietly await daylight. They advised the passengers to keep quiet and the ladies and children to dress and sit at the doors of their staterooms, there to await the advice and action of the officers of the ship, who were perfectly cool and self-possessed. Meantime the ship was working over a reef. For a time I feared she would break in two, but as the water gradually rose inside to a level with the sea outside, 
the ship swung broadside to the swell, and all her keel seemed to rest on the rock or sand. At no time did the sea break over the deck, but the water below drove all the people up to the main deck and to the promenade deck, and thus we remained for about three hours, when daylight came but there was a fog so thick that nothing but water could be seen. The captain caused a boat to be carefully lowered, put in her a trustworthy officer with a boat compass, and we saw her depart into the fog. During her absence the ship's bell was kept tolling. Then the fires were all out, the ship full of water, and gradually breaking up, wriggling with every swell like a willow basket the sea all round us full of the floating fragments of her sheeting, twisted and torn into a spongy condition. In less than an hour the boat returned, saying that the beach was quite near, not more than a mile away, and had a good place for landing. All the boats were then carefully lowered and manned by crews belonging to the ship. A piece of the gangway on the leeward side was cut away, and all the women and a few of the worst scared men were lowered into the boats which pulled for shore. In a comparatively short time the boats returned, took new loads, and the debarkation was afterward carried on quietly and systematically. No baggage was allowed to go on shore except bags or parcels carried in the hands of passengers. At times the fog lifted so that we could see from the wreck the tops of the hills, and the outline of the shore, and I remember sitting on the upper or hurricane deck with the captain, who had his maps and compass before him, and was trying to make out where the ship was. I thought I recognized the outline of the hills below the mission of Dolores, and so stated to him, but he called my attention to the fact that the general line of hills bore northwest, whereas the coast south of San Francisco bears due north and south. He therefore concluded that the ship had overrun her reckoning and was then to the north of San Francisco. He also explained that the passage up being longer than usual, viz. eighteen days, the coal was short, that at the time the firemen were using some cut-up spars along with the slack of coal, and that this fuel had made more than usual steam, so that the ship must have glided along faster than reckoned. This proved to be the actual case for, in fact, the steamship Lewis was wrecked on April 9, 1853, on Duckworth Reef, Bolinas Bay, about 18 miles above the entrance to San Francisco. The captain had sent ashore the purser in the first boat with orders to work his way to the city as soon as possible to report the loss of his vessel and to bring back help. I remained on the wreck till among the last of the passengers, managing to get a can of crackers and some sardines out of the submerged pantry, a thing the rest of the passengers did not have, and then I went quickly ashore in one of the boats. The passengers were all on the beach under a steep bluff, had built fires to dry their clothes, but had seen no human being, and had no idea where they were. Taking along with me a fellow passenger, a young chap about eighteen years old, I scrambled up the bluff and walked back toward the hills in hopes to get a good view of some known object. It was then the month of April, and the hills were covered with the beautiful grasses and flowers of that season of the year. We soon found horse paths and tracks, and following them we came upon a drove of horses grazing at large, some of which had saddle marks. At about two miles from the beach we found a corral, and thence, following one of the strongest marked paths, in about a mile more we descended into a valley and, on turning a sharp point, reached a board shanty with a horse picketed nearby. Four men were inside eating a meal. I inquired if any of the Lewis's people had been there. They did not seem to understand what I meant when I explained to them that about three miles from them and beyond the old corral, the steamer Lewis was wrecked, and her passengers were on the beach. I inquired where we were, and they answered, at Bolinas Creek, that they were employed uh, at a sawmill just above and were engaged in shipping lumber to San Francisco, that a schooner loaded with lumber was then about two miles down the creek, 
waiting for the tide to get out, and doubtless if we would walk down they would take us on board. I wrote a few words back to the captain, telling him where he was, and that I would hurry to the city to send him help. My companion and I then went on down the creek, and soon descried the schooner anchored out in the stream. On being hailed, a small boat came in and took us on board. The captain willingly agreed for a small sum to carry us down to San Francisco, and as the whole crew consisted of a small boy about twelve years old, we helped him to get up his anchor and pole the schooner down the creek and out over the bar on a high tide. This must have been about 2 p.m. Once over the bar, the sails were hoisted, and we glided along rapidly with a strong, fair northwest wind. The fog had lifted, so we could see the shores plainly, and the entrance to the bay. In a couple of hours we were entering the bay, and running wing and wing. Outside the wind was simply the usual strong breeze, but as it passes through the head of the Golden Gate, it increases, and there, too, we met a strong ebb tide. The schooner was loaded with lumber, much of which was on deck, lashed down to ring bolts with rawhide thongs. The captain was steering, and I was reclining on the lumber, looking at the familiar shores as we approached Fort Point, when I heard a sort of cry and felt the schooner going over. As we got into the throat of the heads, the force of the wind meeting a strong ebb tide drove the nose of the schooner under water. She dove like a duck, went over on her side, and began to drift out with the tide. I found myself in the water, mixed up with pieces of plank and ropes, struck out and swam around to the stern, got on the keel and clambered up on the side. Satisfied that she could not sink by reason of her cargo, I was not in the least alarmed, but thought two shipwrecks in one day not a good beginning for a new peaceful career. Nobody was drowned, however. The captain and crew were busy in securing such articles as were liable to float off, and I looked out for some passing boat or vessel to pick us up. We were drifting steadily out to sea, while I was signaling to a boat about uh, three miles off toward Sausalito, and saw her tack and stand toward us. I was busy watching this sailboat when I heard a Yankee's voice close behind saying, This is a nice mess you've got yourselves into. And looking about, I saw a man in a small boat, who had seen us upset, and had rowed out to us from a schooner anchored close under the fort. Some explanations were made, and when the sailboat coming from Sausalito was near enough to be spoken to, and the captain had engaged her to help his schooner, we bade him good-bye, and got the man in the small boat to carry us ashore, and land us at the foot of the bluff just below the fort. Once there, I was at home, and we footed it up to the Presidio. Of the Sentinel, I inquired who was in command of the post, and was answered, Major Merchant. He was not in then, but his adjutant, Lieutenant Gardner, was. I sent my card to him. He came out and was much surprised to find me covered with sand and dripping with water, a good specimen of a shipwrecked mariner. A few words of explanation sufficed. Horses were provided, and we rode hastily into the city, reaching the office of the Nicaragua Steamship Company, C.K. Garrison, agent, about dark, just as the purser had arrived by a totally different route. It was too late to send relief that night, but by daylight next morning two steamers were en route for and reached the place of the wreck in time to relieve the passengers and bring them and most of their baggage. I lost my carpet bag, but saved my trunk. The Lewis went to pieces the night after we got off, and had there been an average sea during the night of our shipwreck, none of us probably would have escaped. End of A Voyage to San Francisco by William T. Sherman What Says the Fire Marshal? by Soren Kierkegaard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
that a man who in some fashion or other has what one calls a cause something he seriously proposes to accomplish and there are other persons who make it their business to counteract and antagonize and hurt him that he must take measures against these enemies this will be evident to every one but that there is a well-intentioned kindness by far more dangerous perhaps and one that seems calculated to prevent the serious accomplishment of his mission this will not at once be clear to every one when a person suddenly falls ill kindly intentioned folk will straightway rush to his help and one will suggest this another that and if all these about him had a chance to have their way it would certainly result in the sick man's death seeing that even one person's well-meaning advice may be dangerous enough and even if nothing is done and the advice of neither the assembled and well-meaning crowd nor of any one person is taken yet their busy and flurried presence may be harmful nevertheless inasmuch as they are in the way of the physician likewise at a fire scarcely has the alarm of fire been sounded but a great crowd of people will rush to the spot good and kindly and sympathetic helpful people the one with a bucket the other with a basin still another with a hand squirt all of them goodly kindly sympathetic helpful persons who want to do all they can to extinguish the fire but what says the fire marshal the fire marshal he says well at other times the fire marshal is a very pleasant and refined man but at a fire he does use coarse language he says or rather he roars out oh go to hell with your buckets and hand squirts and then when these well-meaning people feel insulted perhaps and think it highly improper to be treated in this fashion and would like at least to be treated respectfully what says the fire marshal then well at other times the fire marshal is a very pleasant and refined gentleman who will show every one the respect due him but at a fire he is somewhat different he says where the devil is the police and when the policemen arrive he says to them rid me of these damn people with their buckets and hand squirts and if they won't clear out then club them on their heads so that we get rid of them and can get at the fire that is to say in the case of a fire the whole way of looking at things is a very different one from that of quiet everyday life the qualities which in quiet everyday life render one well liked viz good nature and kindly well-meaning all this is repaid in the case of a fire with abusive language and finally with a crack on the head and this is just as it should be for a conflagration is a serious business and wherever we have to deal with a serious business this well-intentioned kindness won't do at all indeed any serious business enforces a very different mode of behavior which is either or either you are able really to do something and really have something to do here or else if that be not the case then the serious business demands precisely that you take yourself away and if you will not comprehend that the fire marshal proposes to have the police hammer it into your head which may do you a great deal of good as it may help to render you a little serious as is befitting so serious a business as a fire but what is true in the case of a fire holds true also in matters of the spirit wherever a cause is to be promoted or an enterprise to be seen through or an idea to be served you may be sure that when he who really is the man to do it the right man he who in a higher sense has and ought to have command he who is in earnest and can make the matter the serious business it really is you may be sure that when he arrives at the spot so to say he will find there a nice company of easy-going addle-pated twaddlers who 
pretending to be engaged in serious business dabble in wishing to serve this cause to further that enterprise to promote that idea a company of addle pated fools who will of course consider one's unwillingness to make common cause with them parenthesis, which unwillingness precisely proves one's seriousness end parenthesis, will of course consider that a sure proof of the man's lack of seriousness i say when the right man arrives he will find this but i might also look at it in this fashion the very question as to whether he is the right man is most properly decided by his attitude to that crowd of fools if he thinks they may help him and that he will add to his strength by joining them then he is io ipso not the right man the right man will understand at once as did the fire marshal that the crowd must get out of the way in fact that their presence and puttering around is the most dangerous ally the fire could have only that in matters of the spirit it is not as in the case of the conflagration where the fire marshal needs but to say to the police rid me of these people thus in matters of the spirit and likewise in matters of religion history has frequently been compared to what the chemists call a process the figure is quite suggestive providing it is correctly understood for instance in the process of filtration water is run through a filter and by this process loses its impurities in a totally different sense history is a process the idea is given utterance and then enters into the process of history but unfortunately this process parenthesis how ridiculous a supposition end parenthesis consists not in purifying the idea which never is purer than at its inception oh no it consists in gradually and increasingly botching bungling and making a mess of the idea in using up the idea and indeed is not this the opposite of filtering adding the impure elements which it originally lacked until at last by the enthusiastic and mutually appreciative efforts of successive generations the idea has absolutely disappeared and the very opposite of the original idea is now called the idea which is then asserted to have arisen through a historic process by which the idea is purified and elevated when finally the right man arrives he who in the highest sense is called to the task for all we know chosen early and slowly educated for this business which is to throw a light on the matter to set fire to this jungle which is a refuge of all kinds of foolish talk and delusions and rascally tricks when he comes he will always find a nice company of addle pated fools and twaddlers who surely enough do think that perhaps things are wrong and that something must be done about it or who have taken the position and talk a good deal about it that it is preposterous to be self-important and talk about it now if he the right man is deceived but a single instant and thinks that it is this company who are to aid him then it is clear he is not the right man if he is deceived and has dealings with that company then providence will at once take its hand off him as not fit but the right man will see at a glance as the fire marshal does that the crowd who in the kindness of their hearts mean to help in extinguishing a conflagration by buckets and hand squirts the right man will see that the same crowd who here when there is a question not of extinguishing a fire but rather of setting something on fire will in the kindness of their hearts wish to help with a sulphur match sans fire or a wet spill he will see that this crowd must be got rid of that he must not have the least thing in common with this crowd that he will be obliged to use the coarsest possible language against them he who perhaps at other times is anything but coarse 
but the thing of supreme importance is to be rid of the crowd for the effect of the crowd is to hamstring the whole cause by robbing it of its seriousness while heartfelt sympathy is pretended of course the crowd will then rage against him against his incredible arrogance and so forth this ought not to count with him whether for or against in all truly serious business the law of either or prevails either i am the man whose serious business this is i am called to it and am willing to take a decisive risk or if this is not the case then the seriousness of the business demands that i do not meddle with it at all nothing is more detestable and mean and nothing discloses and affects a deeper demoralization than this lackadaisical wishing to enter somewhat into matters which demand an out 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 caesar out nihil footnote either or either caesar or nothing caesar bourgia's slogan and footnote this taking just a little part in something to be so wretchedly lukewarm to twaddle about the business and then by twaddling to usurp through a lie the attitude of being better than they who wish not to have anything whatever to do with the whole business to usurp through a lie the attitude of being better and thus to render doubly difficult the task of him whose business it really is End of what says the fire marshal by soren kierkegaard translated by lee milton hollander nineteen twenty three from the instant number six reading five august twenty third eighteen fifty five